Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. I'll call the clerk to table documents. Clark. President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. I understand there are no proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate, so I call Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. I move the motion uh, standing in my name, and I move that the question be now put. The question is that the question be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Cormann be now put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes, Senator Seawitt, teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 62, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators will now move to consideration of the motion moved by Senator Cormann. Those uh, supporting the resolution moved by Senator Cormann say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Cormann be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes, Senator Seawitt, teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 62, noes 9. The resolution is carried. The ayes have it. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment tax relief so working Australians keep more of their money bill 2019 for concurrence. Senator Cormann. Aye. Uh, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark. Aye. A bill for an act to amend the tax law, Income Tax Rates Act 1986 and for related purposes. Senator Cormann. Actually, yeah. uh, I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Cormann. I'll allow senators to resume their seats so we can proceed with the second reading debate. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this bill today. The Treasury Laws Amendment Bill seeks to legislate the government's income tax cuts announced earlier this year as part of the 2019-2020 budget. Labor's position on this bill has been informed by three key principles, as outlined by my colleague in the other place, Dr. Jim Chalmers. Firstly, that the economy needs a boost right now. Secondly, that every worker should get a tax cut this parliamentary term. And thirdly, that it's irresponsible to sign up now to $95 billion worth of expenditure that's not due for another five years without Good knowing morning. what the economy or the Commonwealth I'm budget well, will look like in 2024-25. Now, before going on and detailing Labor's position on this bill, it's worth looking at what's happening in the economy right now and why we believe that our position on this tax bill is in the national interest. There is no doubt the economy is struggling on this government's watch. The latest national accounts revealed the slowest economic growth in terms of annual growth since the GFC that occurred a decade ago. Those same national accounts show that Australia is now in the longest per capita recession since the 1982 recession. The national economy has fallen from the eighth fastest growing in the OECD in 2013 to the 20th position today. Wages, which we know have been growing at record levels for some time, are growing eight times slower than company profits. There is rising underemployment and youth un unemployment. Overall, <clears throat> there are 1.8 million Australians looking for work or looking for more work. That's 1.8 million people. We've seen five years of weak productivity growth, and productivity, as measured by GDP per hour worked, has fallen for four consecutive quarters. The RBA has acknowledged that household consumption is weak and has had to respond with two interest rate cuts in two months. The cash rate now at an unprecedented 1 per cent, when 3 per cent back in the heat of the GFC was apparently, according to this government, at, already at emergency levels. So there is no doubt that the economy is floundering, with the very real consequence that households across Australia are feeling it. Pensioners and superannuants, who rely on interest rates to help bolster their incomes, are feeling it too. And after six years, this third-term government can't continue the facade that they are good economic managers against this backdrop of facts. On Tuesday night, the Reserve Bank Governor unusually and publicly pleaded his case that monetary policy couldn't do all the hard work. This nothing-to-see-here government has to respond because right now they are the only people in Australia who think this economy is performing well. This is why Labor's position and the amendments we will move today are about providing a boost to the economy now. That's why Labor supports stages one and two of the government's plan. It's unfortunate that the government voted against our amendments to bring forward part of stage two in the other place because it simply confirmed that the government thinks that tax cuts in five years' time are more important than tax cuts that could start right now. But in this chamber, where the government doesn't have majority control, the Senate can take a responsible and constructive approach 
and support the position Labor is outlining today. Schedule 1 of the bill deals with stage 1 low and middle income tax offset changes, which supplement the changes announced by the government last year. For the 2018, 19, 19, 20, 21, 20, 21 and 21, 22 financial year, the bill seeks to increase the amount of low and middle income tax offset, or LEMITO. The base amount would increase from $200 per year to $255 per year, and the maximum amount increases from $530 to $1,080 per year. This increase will mean that taxpayers with taxable incomes of between $48,000 and $90,000 will be eligible for the maximum offset of $1,080. The Labor Party supports this increase to Lamito. This increase is very similar to Labor Party policy that was announced last year. The Treasurer said on Tuesday that people would start seeing this increase from next week if this bill is passed today. Well, we'll hold the Treasurer and the government to that, especially as they have already broken their pre-election promise that these tax cuts would be paid by July 1. Labor completely understands the need for getting these tax cuts into the hands of those who need it the most as soon as possible. The national economy is floundering. Working people have had to endure an extended and ongoing period of low wages growth. Prices are going up and many Australian families are hurting because of it. The increase to Lamito is needed. It should have been dealt with by July 1. But the sooner that money gets into the hands of eligible taxpayers, the better. So the Labor Party has no issue with this element of the bill, and as I said previously, these tax cuts will be provided to those who need it most. Stage two of this in this bill has two elements to it. Firstly, the increase to the low income tax offset that is in Schedule One of the bill, which increases the value of the LITO from 1 July 2022 from $645 to $700 and changes the associated taper rate for that offset. The LITO applies to taxable incomes of up to $66,667. This increase to the LITO, along with the increase to the top threshold of the 19 per cent income tax bracket, which I'll come to in a moment, is meant to continue the tax reduction provided by the LITO once it expires at the end of 21 22 Secondly, stage two of the government's bill seeks to increase the top threshold of the 19 per cent income tax bracket from 41,000, which was legislated last year, to 45,000 from 1 July 2022, in three years' time. The Senate may recall that in last year's changes, the top threshold for the 32.5 per cent tax bracket Thanks. was lifted from 90,000 to 120,000 taking effect on 1 July 2022. Labor wants to ensure that all Australian workers get a tax cut this term of parliament, which is why we will be moving amendments later in the debate, which seek to bring forward the lifting of the tax bracket from 90,000 to 120,000 this financial year. Our amendment, if supported today, would mean that every Australian worker would receive a tax cut in this term of parliament instead of having to wait three years until 22-23 to see any benefit from this proposed tax package being put forward by the government today. Now, let me turn now to stage three. The Labor Party does not think it's responsible to sign up to stage three tax cuts in this bill now. These tax cuts cost $95 billion over the medium term and are not intended to come into effect until 1 July 2024, five whole years away. Two weeks ago, we respectfully asked the government to consider separating the tax package so the parliament could pass the elements where there is agreement, namely stages one and two, and bring back stage three of the tax cuts at another time of their choosing for the parliament to debate. An approach like this would have allowed the tax cuts due this parliamentary term and every tax cut that is due this parliamentary term to pass quickly and with near unanimous support. A good outcome for the government, the parliament and, most importantly, the people we are elected to serve. Unfortunately, the government rejected this constructive approach outright and instead will have to do, make arrangements or deals or whatever you want to call them with the Centre Alliance and others to get the entire tax package through. 
I should also point out at this stage that the government promised not to do any of those arrangements or deals, which is exactly what they are doing now, all because they refused to work with Labor to get these tax cuts through. So why does Labor have significant and serious concerns about locking in stage three now? Well, primarily it's because we think it's irresponsible to sign up to $95 billion worth of expenditure from the budget now, five years before it's due. It appears that the stage three tax cuts are the government's highest priority as they are prepared to sacrifice badly needed tax cuts right now in order to protect tax cuts that occur outside the Ford estimates. I don't need to tell senators that $95 billion is a lot of money. $95 billion over six years, starting at a cost of $12.5 billion in 2024-25 and growing to $18.9 billion by 2930. For comparison, that $12.5 billion in 2024-25 is more than what the government will spend this financial year on government schooling, uh, which is $8.3 billion, on universities at $9.9 billion, or the childcare subsidy at $8.3 billion, just to give you an indication of how much uh, that expenditure actually is. And most importantly, we simply don't know whether this $95 billion tax cut is actually affordable. How is the government paying for it? The government hasn't explained how they will pay for it. They've avoided answering the question. And I don't think, and Labor doesn't think, that this parliament should blindly accept that it will, be, it will be able to, without locking in substantial reductions in other areas of government activity. What little information we do know about the government's future budget management approach can be found in the budget papers. We know that the government has an arbitrary tax cap of 23.9 per cent. We know that the government is projecting growing surpluses as a percentage of GDP over the medium term. We also know that the government is projecting reduced spending, dropping from 24.6 per cent of GDP this financial year to 23.6 per cent of GDP by the medium term. So whilst the government is asking us in this place to lock in $95 billion in extra expenditure in five years' time, they are also saying and we're going to cap revenue in increases, reduce spending and increase our surplus. Well, it just doesn't add up without an explanation of what services this government is going to cut. Senators are well within their rights to ask how the government intends to pull this off. Bigger surpluses, reduced spending and a cap on tax revenue. If they are asking us to support $95 billion in extra spending, what and how much government spending needs to be reduced to pay for this to reach their other fiscal goals? How realistic? Is this reducing government spending from 24.6 per cent of GDP this year to 23.6 per cent by the end of the medium term? While spending as a percentage of GDP has averaged 25 per cent over the last five years, what the government is talking about is that they intend to spend far lower than recent historical trends and they are seeking the parliament's support for that approach. How realistic is this when our ageing population is going to place more and more pressure on the budget rather than less? The Grattan Institute states that in order to get these projected, to these projected spending levels, real spending growth would need to average about 1.3 per cent per annum over the decade, or 1.8 per cent if the economy performs as strongly as the Treasury project, projects. Either way, this is substantially lower than any previous government has achieved. So does the government expect growth in health spending to fall? Maybe it's defence spending. Maybe it's spending on veterans' health. Maybe it's spending on education. Is the government really serious when it projects that health expenditure will only grow at 0.7 per cent per annum? 0.7 per cent for health growth. Does, is that really realistic, despite historical growth being much higher than that? Do the states agree with this approach? I bet you they'll have a view when they realise what this actually means for state and federal relations in the medium term. And whilst it's easy for some, it seems, to push these spending reductions off into the distance by saying, don't worry, it's five years away, everything will be okay. 
Labor can't take that view. It's irresponsible and it lets down millions of Australians who rely on government services to do so. We think the government should be upfront, at a minimum, about how it intends to pay for these tax cuts, and they should be upfront about what their projected spending reductions will actually mean. These are all spending reductions that are assumed in the budget in order to pay for these tax cuts, but we don't know what they are and we don't know what effect they'll have on essential services. The government wants the parliament to sign up to tax cuts that commence half a decade away when we simply don't know what the state of the budget will be, we don't know what the state of the economy will be, and we certainly don't know how these tax cuts, $19 billion of them when they're fully implemented, are actually going to be paid for. And as the leader of the Labor Party has pointed out, it's a triumph of hope over economic reality. In coming to our position on this bill, the Labor Party has tried to play a constructive role to help fix the Liberals' economic mess and provide tax cuts to all Australian workers at a time when that fiscal stimulus is so badly needed. We compromised on the tax package by changing our position and coming towards the government. But this arrogant government refuses to put the national economic interests ahead of its political one. Australians want their parliamentary representatives to stop the point scoring and political difference and, where possible, carve out common ground, to come together where we can and put the national interest and, in this case, our economic and budgetary interests ahead of anything else. Labor has done just that. We have compromised and we ask that the government do so too. Our amendments to the tax bill, which will be moved later in the debate, would, would uh, fast-track planned tax cuts now and also seek a discussion over increased infrastructure investment to boost the floundering economy, which is growing at its slowest rate in 10 years. We want to expedite investment in already planned infrastructure projects bring forward a part of stage two income tax, as I flagged earlier, so that up to $1,350 a year in tax cuts could be provided for workers earning above 90,000 three years ahead of schedule. Our proposal is the only one before the parliament that gives every Australian worker a tax cut this parliamentary term. The government's plan does not. In the committee stage, I'll be moving amendments on behalf of the Labor Party that do a couple of things. Bring forward the $90,000 to $120,000 threshold change to 2019-2020 and carve out the stage three changes from the bill with a consequential fix to a table in the Tax Act. I'm also move the second reading amendment that has been circulated in my name that does the same. But to the Senate today, we have an important job before us. We acknowledge that tax cuts are needed for, for um, workers in the economy. We want these tax cuts in stage one to flow as soon as possible. The government has already broken the one promise they made by not having that in place by July 1. We don't want to hold that up. We want to see that cash flow. But we do think the Senate has a role in putting pressure on the government and putting on the record, which I've done today, our concern about what locking in stage three actually means for the years ahead. Uh, and uh, this is the job of the Senate to scrutinise this. The job of the government is to answer where that money is coming from, how that tax cut will be paid for, and whether there's a commitment from this government to not slash services. Uh, key essential services to the Australian community in order to pay for it. A cynical person would say that the reason these tax cuts are timed is because they sit outside the forward estimates, so we can't actually see how the government is booking this, this um, uh, expenditure and what they're doing to pay for it. Uh, but putting aside that cynicism, the government should be able to inform the Senate today how this will be paid for, whether there is a commitment from the government not to cut services, uh, and the Senate should be asking these questions as well. Uh, we will be moving the amendments, uh, as I've foreshadowed, uh, later uh, in the day uh, to bring forward uh, what we think is a constructive and responsible, the most constructive and responsible approach that this parliament could show 
based on the uh, performance of the economy right now, and I hope that other senators uh, will support Labor's position. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator De Natale. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, members in this chamber might remember Joe Bielke petersons horrific vision uh, for Australia. At the heart of his vision uh, with his Joe for Canberra campaign was the notion of a flat tax. That's what Joe campaigned for. And back then he was ridiculed, he was laughed at, he was told that this does not represent the Australia that we believe in. And today, Joe's vision for Australia, flat taxation, dog eat dog, where if you've got a job and doing well, the government will look after you, and if you're down on your luck, well, tough luck. That is the vision that is emerging as the political consensus within this parliament today. Apart from the Greens' strident opposition in this parliament, that is what we are seeing as the emerging consensus position. These are tax cuts that are completely at odds with the notion of an egalitarian Australia. We know what they'll do. They'll rip billions of money out of our budget. They'll gut our schools, our hospitals. They'll stop us from looking after people on Newstart. They'll prevent us from spending the money on infrastructure to modernise our energy system and our transport system. They are going to turbocharge economic inequality in this country. Scott Morrison wants Australia to become Trump's America with their rampant inequality. He wants to create a permanent underclass of working poor, a privatised health system, massive student debt. That's what happens when you rip billions of dollars out of essential public services and hand it to the wealthiest Australians. This is a disgrace and is being supported by Jackie Lambie and Senator Alliance. They're all for it, Senator Dean Natale, trashing I ask by you Senator refer. Lambie and the senators from Centre Alliance. They are trashing 100 years of Australia's proudly progressive taxation system for their moment in the spotlight. And I say to Senator Alliance, who aren't in the chamber here today, don't you support funding for schools and hospitals? Don't you support pensions? Don't you support infrastructure? I mean, doing all of that in the name of reducing gas prices, some promise on the never-never. You fell for that? Senator Alliance like to position themselves as a party of the centre. Well, when you support an anti-union agenda, when you get behind tax cuts for big companies, as they did in the previous parliament, when you support greater media concentration, and when you lock in $158 billion in tax cuts that flow to people on high incomes, there's nothing centrist about that. That is the neoliberal hard-right agenda of the Liberal Party, and maybe you should consider where you sit in this chamber. Remarkable that this legislation has never even gone off for an inquiry. The House of Review will be moving today to send this legislation off for inquiry. Nick Xenophon must be turning in his solicitor's office right now at the thought that procedural fairness is being thwarted by his parliamentary team. One of the most significant pieces of economic reform in this country, and it has not even gone before a thorough Senate inquiry. If you're in Mayo, the seat currently held by Senator Alliance, just 2.1 per cent of that community earn over $180,000, and yet they will be the greatest beneficiaries of stage three of this tax cut. $30 billion flowing to the top 2 per cent of that electorate. I very rarely give credit to uh, Senator Hanson. Uh, we have uh, very few things in common, but even Senator Hanson sees that only 
1.8 per cent of regional Queenslanders earn above $180,000, and that the Prime Minister's electorate of Cook has as many people earning $180,000 as regional Queensland seats of Maranoa, of Dawson and Capricornia combined. And as for uh, Senator Lambie, if you live in Bass and Braddon and you're earning over $180,000, you're in the top 1 per cent, the top 1 per cent of people. And $30 billion from this package flows to only 1 per cent of people in those electorates, the electorates that she purports to represent. In exchange for giving millionaires tax cuts, schools, hospitals in Tasmania will be starved of funds. Support for veterans, money being ripped out of the budget that could support people again that Senator Lambie purports to represent. Every aspect of public investment on the chopping block because of this disastrous decision. And of course, Scott Morrison's playing the Senator opposition. Dean Natale, you'd refer the, to the Prime Minister, Prime Minister is playing the title. opposition like a fiddle. Uh, according to reports, you've got Labor's front, Labor front benches saying the party is, and I quote, politically dead if it blocks tax cuts. And they're urging the leader of the opposition, Anthony Albanese, to, and I quote, regain the faith of tradies by backing them. I mean, let's call a spade a spade here. Uh, most tradies don't earn $180,000 a year, and yet $30 billion is flowing to people on over $180,000 each year. Everyday workers aren't going to be the beneficiaries of stage three of these tax cuts, and this is the biggest proportion of funding in this package. The median income of working Australians is $58,000. A third of adults aren't actually in work. So when you put those two things together, according to the ABS, the typical Australian's income is actually $37,000. If you abandon all of your beliefs about working people, about fairness, about the opportunities for them, well, in my mind, you're already politically dead. What do you stand for? A hundred years of campaigning for progressive taxation and in a moment, in a moment, that will be undermined because of the decision of this parliament. 30 per cent of stage three goes to the wealthiest Australians. $95 billion ripped away from government revenue. Let's actually look at some of the things that we could be investing in today. Imagine that this parliament came together today, took the revenue that's being ripped out of our budget and said, we want to create a different Australia. Here are some of the things that we could be doing. Every Australian in this country could have Medicare-funded dental care at a cost of a third, less than a third of what is being proposed in these tax cuts—$44.9 billion. Going to the dentist in Australia could become just like going to the doctor. Bring out your Medicare card and you get dental treatment. We could raise Newstart by $75 a week. You want to stimulate the economy? Raise Newstart. You want to make sure that no one in Australia sleeps rough and can put food on the table? Raise Newstart. $55 billion, again, just over a third of the cost of this tax package. We could have free childcare for 80 per cent of Australians. Free childcare for 80 per cent of families in this country if we made a decision to do that at a cost of less than half of this package at $77.3 billion. We could lift all public school funding to meet the necessary resourcing standard, $30 billion, again making sure that our public schools get the support that they need. Thousands of jobs in restoring our environment and addressing our extinction crisis. Real jobs employing people, not to destroy the environment, but to care for it, to look after it, to nurture, nurture it, to rehabilitate it, at a cost of $20.3 billion under our proposal. Home care packages for older Australians, $23.4 billion. We could build half a million affordable homes 
and address the homelessness crisis in Australia. $84.4 billion, just over half of what's been proposed here today. There's so much more we could do. High speed rail along the East Coast. There are so many things, so many nation building projects. Modernise our energy system. Improve our public transport system. And this is the future that this parliament is turning their back on. To do what? To support the lie of trickle down economics. Because we know that wealth doesn't trickle down, we know it flows up, it rushes up. And we're going to concentrate more and more wealth into the hands of fewer and fewer people. Now, before the election, the Labor Party were resolute against most aspects of this tax package. The final wash up of this election is that one seat changed hands. One seat changed hands. And yet, we're behaving as though the Morrison government, well, a couple of seats changed hands. A couple of seats changed hands. Uh, we're behaving as though the Morrison government has a mandate uh, for these tax cuts. Uh, I say, uh, where is your mandate? What was close to people's minds wasn't your uh, agenda for tax cuts. It was the lie. <clears throat> it was the lie on death taxes. It was the confusion about retiree taxes and home taxes. It was uncertainty about what the future held uh, if there was a change of government. And I deeply hope that the Labor Party won't take out the wrong lessons from the election campaign. Because if people want to vote for a watered-down version of the Liberal Party, why wouldn't they vote for the real thing? If you want to turbocharge inequality in Australia, we know where you want to park your vote. Stand against these changes. We know what the Labor Party again said in the lead up to the election. Now Chris Bowen, at the time the shadow treasurer, made it very clear, made it very clear that the tax cuts were regressive. He said that the $95 billion was poorly targeted. He said that we don't know what the economy is going to be like in 2024. And he said that if Josh Frydenberg's being honest, it's irresponsible. Senator Di Natale, for if, the fourth time. If, if the, if the uh, uh, member for Kuyong is being um, uh, honest, uh, it's irresponsible. Although I will say, Senate, uh, Acting Deputy President, it was a quote from the uh, uh, then uh, Shadow Treasurer. So if you're going to make an adjudication, uh, you might want to cons consider your ruling again. Uh, these tax cuts uh, leave income earners short changed. This was the view of the then shadow treasurer. He, he, he says, and I quote, the Liberals are so out of touch they've given a much smaller tax cut to two million Australians earning less than $40,000. He's absolutely right. So vote against it. Vote against it. Stage two and three of the tax cuts, which begin in 2022 and 2024 respectively, uh, respectively are, and I quote again, fiscally reckless and irresponsible. Stages two and three of these tax cuts, and yet here we have the Labor Party supporting at least part of that package and potentially all of it. The now leader of the opposition at the time said, and again I quote, we think that stage three, the cost of some $95 billion down the track, is really a triumph of hope over economic reality. Jim Chalmers, his view was, and again I quote, it makes no sense to support the third tranche when it Senator comes— Senator Natale, just resume your seat for a moment, please. I've asked you many times to refer to members in the other place by their appropriate title. You Once again, you've failed to do so. Now, you want to admonish— Made it very clear. And again, I quote, it makes sorry, no sense— Sorry, Senator Dean Natale, I've asked you to refer to members by their appropriate title. Now, you've just repeated Jim Chalmers again and again and again. Well, just Mr Chalmers would do fine. Just use some courtesy and try not to try to obey the standing orders. Uh, are you, uh, 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 I'll seek to uh, have this ruling addressed in a moment, but um, uh, I do make the point uh, that uh, uh, we have on many occasions referred to uh, members of parliament by their full names. Uh, and uh, that has not been uh, that Natale, has not been ruled out Senator of order, and so I'll seek to deal with that at a future time. Now, Mr. Chalmers said, and I quote: 
Uh, it makes no sense to support the third tranche, which comes in five years away from now and overwhelmingly favours those who are least likely to spend it in the economy. He also went on to say, and I quote, what I don't accept is the tax cuts that they're proposing five years down the track, which overwhelmingly flow to people who are least likely to spend in the economy. It's obviously a con job for the government to pretend that they would have any impact on the slowing economy today. All absolutely correct. All absolutely correct. And we support, we absolutely support those statements, which is why we hope that the Labor Party will join us in making a clear and unequivocal statement that it will repeal stage three of these tax cuts into the next election. We must get an unambiguous and clear commitment that stage three of these tax cuts will be repealed. They are enriching the wealthiest in our society. We know our budget can't afford it, but we've heard comment after comment from members of the opposition who have said absolutely clearly that stage three of these tax cuts do not warrant support, and we must address it. They've seen the same costings as the rest of us. They've seen the Grattan Institute, the Australia Institute, research that shows that these tax cuts overwhelmingly benefit wealthy Australians, now, that men benefit twice as much as women, entrenching gender inequality even further. And again, I say don't take it just from the Greens. Take it from former Senator Doug Cameron, who said that Labor should back the first tranche of tax cuts, but anything further was, and I quote, a con job. He went on to say, we must not capitulate to News Corp and the big end of town by becoming liberal light. light. Well, we couldn't have said it any clearer ourselves. When I hear tax cuts, I hear cuts to hospitals, I hear cuts to education, I hear cuts to schools, I hear cuts to pension, I hear cuts to New Start. That's what tax cuts are a euphemism for. And of course there are alternatives. We'll move later today to make sure that people on low incomes do get some support. They'll get more cash in their pocket, but not by adjusting tax thresholds, not by flattening our tax system, but by ensuring that they get some support, but that we increase New Start by $75 a week, that we raise the funding for our public schools, that we introduce Medicare-funded dental care that we build half a million affordable homes. We will do all of those things because we do see the tax system as a powerful tool for addressing economic inequality in Australia. We cannot cave in to this trickle-down neoliberal agenda. We as a nation have fought hard to maintain a progressive taxation system as a means of addressing turbocharged economic inequality. It's getting worse. And a decision of this parliament to unwind the tax system in one of the most significant changes that has ever come before this place would be a huge mistake. So let me finish by saying the Greens unequivocally oppose this tax package. The argument that somehow stage three doesn't take effect for a number of years and therefore we need to pass it and have some chance of reversing it is a furphy and it's a nonsense. If this package does pass with the support of Senator Alliance and Senator Lambie, then we must commit to repealing it. There are alternatives. Those alternatives will make Australia a fairer, more decent society. And we must not, we must resist at every opportunity the path towards Trump's America, where our tax system is flattened, where economic inequality is worse, and where our essential public services are run down. Thank you, Senator Di Natale. Senator Watt. Sorry, Mr. Acting Deputy President, just getting my papers in order. The, um, I rise to uh, also speak in this debate, and essentially I'll be echoing 
the remarks of Senator Gallagher, who outlined the opposition's position on this matter. Uh, but I will add uh, some additional comments, particularly in relation to the apparent deals that have been reached by the government with some members of the crossbench over the last 24 hours. Uh, but to begin with, um, I also want to join Senator Gallagher in putting on record the opposition's actual position on this bill, as opposed to what various speakers, including Senator Di Natale, uh, just said. Um, and fundamentally, Labor's position is informed by a couple of things, and they are our concern for the state of the economy after six years of Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison government under the LNP, as we know them in Queensland, after six years of LNP government under three prime ministers, now into their third term, we have an incredibly weak Australian economy where we see interest rates set at a level below inflation. So it's actually not even a matter of if you're wanting to borrow money now, getting free money from banks. The economy is so weak under this government uh, that banks are effectively giving money away. Uh, and it's cheaper to borrow money than it is to just hang on to it. That's how weak this economy is under this third term LNP government. Uh, and those interest rates that we're now seeing under this government are in fact actually lower than what was available to borrowers during the height of the GFC, when I might remind you there was a federal Labor government in power, which successfully steered the Australian economy through the GFC in a way that was the envy of the Western world. But now, after six years of LNP government into their third term, into their third prime minister, this group of people who like to parade themselves around the country as the superior economic managers have left the economy in a state where interest rates are lower than they were at a time when the world economy sank into the worst economic conditions that it had seen since the Great Depression. So give yourselves a pat on the back. That's what good economic managers the LNP are. Well done. Well done. And it's Australians who are paying the price of this. It's Australians who are paying the price of this in the form of wage rises that are, again, the lowest we have ever seen on record in this country. Now, my recollection is that these records have been collected for 30 or 40 years. Never over that entire period of time, whether it be Liberal governments, whether it be Labor governments, whoever the Prime Minister was, never at any point over that period of time have we seen Australians' wages increasing at such a poor level, while, of course, over on the other hand, company profits continue to escalate. So we know that there are some people who are doing quite well in this economy under this Liberal national government, but they're not lower income earners, they're not middle income earners, they're not the quiet Australians that this government claims to represent and claims to have been elected by. They're the largest corporations in this country and the shareholders in those companies and the highly paid executives of those companies. That's who's benefiting under this Liberal national government, not the tradespeople working in Logan in Queensland, not the retail and shop assistants working in Townsville. Their wages are barely growing. And in fact, to make matters worse, this government is quite happy to stand by and see people like retail workers, people like hospitality workers, people like hairdressers actually have their wages cut because this government refuses to do anything about the penalty rate cuts that these types of uh, average working people, the kind of quiet Australians that this government claims to represent, are suffering. So for all Australian workers, wages are barely rising, are barely keeping up with inflation. It's no wonder that people are having tr trouble paying their bills, and it's no wonder that people are so desperately looking for some kind of tax relief from this government, because they simply can't get ahead. 
They seem they're having trouble paying their mortgages. They're having, having trouble paying, paying their energy bills. I mean, let's not even go there about what, what a failure this government has been on energy prices. Uh, and again, I think we're up to 13 policy energy policies from this government. I'm looking forward to. I'm not even going to worry about a policy number 14. I'll wait for policy number 23. We'll probably be there by the end of the year. Um, so it's no wonder that people are that, that lower and middle income earners in this country are screaming for tax relief because they're not getting any other support from this government. In fact, they're getting a range of policies that are seeing their wages either barely rise or if they work in retail, hospitality and hairdressing and industries like that, they're actually seeing their wages be cut. So that's the fantastic economy we're getting from the inverted commas superior economic managers that we have sitting opposite us uh, in this government. Now, uh, there have been a range of commentators and official institutions support aspects of this tax package. And as I will outline, Labor also supports some aspects of this tax package. The Reserve Bank of Australia, uh, you know, if not the most respected e economic institution in the country right up there, they are calling for tax cuts, uh, particularly for lower and middle income earners. Uh, to try to get this economy moving, because nothing else the government is doing is working. The, the RBA is also calling for this government to bring forward infrastructure projects urgently, and there'll be another day to have a proper debate about that. Um, but I think Australians, in very short order, are going to understand the pee and thimble trick that this government has gone ahead with when it comes to infrastructure projects. You know, we've all seen the headlines over the last couple of years about the X billion dollar infrastructure package that this government's going to release for Queensland or New South Wales or Victoria or Western Australia or Tasmania. What's never revealed is that most of those infrastructure projects are so far down the horizon, so far beyond the next four years, that they will have no economic impact whatsoever. Not one single person is going to be employed to build any of those roads or any of those broke bridges or any of those dams or any of those rail lines, uh, which actually aren't going to get funded by this government until well into the 2020s. So that's going to have no effect on lifting the economy anytime soon. And it's of course not going to have any effect on trying to fix the very real congestion problems that Australians are experiencing right now and need action now. But as I say, we'll have a proper debate about that another day. So, as I say, Labor does support some aspects of this government's tax package, and we recognise uh, that uh, the government was elected, uh, that we lost the election. Uh, we recognise that particularly tax cuts for lower and middle income earners was a key factor in the election debate. And that's why we have been humble enough to shift our position in relation to stages one and two of this tax package. We went to the election opposing the package. We've listened to the Australian people. We've actually tried to compromise with the government around stages one and two. Uh, but of course, this arrogant government, re-elected against all expectations, with a near Senate majority, uh, their hubris has got the better of them already so early into this term that they're actually not willing to talk with the opposition about a sensible compromise package that will deliver tax relief to lower and middle income earners in Australia, but won't drive the economy into a ditch, which is the risk that we face if the entire package, including stage three, goes ahead. So Labor has already put on the record that we are willing to support stage one of the tax cuts that this government is proposing. We recognise that those tax cuts will primarily benefit lower and middle income Australians. The very quiet Australians who this government has been punishing for six years through lower wages, through higher energy costs and through a whole range of other cost of living increases. We recognise they need a break. We recognise that lower income and middle income people are most likely to use their tax cuts to spend. They're not people who go and save thousands and thousands of dollars a year. They're just trying to make ends meet. And they will go out and spend that money in the shops, in the restaurants, in the local businesses, right up and down my home state of Queensland. And that will provide the very economic stimulus 
that the weak Australian economy presided over by this government so desperately needs. So we will support stage one. We've also more than compromised in relation to stage two of the tax cuts, uh, which again overwhelmingly benefit middle income Australians. You know, again, people who need a bit of a hand uh, to, to get ahead uh, and the very people who will go out there and spend those tax cuts and get local businesses going and get their local economies moving. And in fact, not only will we support stage two of these tax cuts, but we recognise that the economy needs a desperate injection of funds to get it moving. And that's why we've asked the government and we'll be putting forward amendments today to bring forward those stage two tax cuts. You know, if the economy is in such dire need of an injection that the Reserve Bank of Australia is out there calling for the government to do so, then let's actually make it happen. Let's not just stop at stage one. Let's get on with it and bring forward stage two tax cuts as well so that people can feel the benefit of that right now and get their local economies moving. And in fact, if the government is willing to compromise, and the crossbench for that matter, and support Labor's amendments to bring forward stage two of the tax cuts, then the effect of that will be that every single Australian worker will get a tax cut because those stage two tax cuts will be benefiting people who are earning more than $90,000 a year. So if you want to have an argument about who, which party is supporting tax relief for lower and middle income Australians, for all Australian workers, I'm happy to have that debate because the amendments that Labor is putting forward by seeking to bring forward stage two will have the effect of making sure that every single Australian worker will get a tax cut. If you're actually supporting tax cuts for middle income earners as well as low income earners, then the government will change position and will back Labor's amendments to bring forward stage two tax cuts. But of course, as Senator Gallagher has outlined, we do continue to have strong concerns about stage three of the tax cuts package that the government is being putting forward. And that's for a couple of major reasons. Um, and they, they really come down to the incredible economic irresponsibility which is being displayed by a government that likes to say that it's a superior economic manager. If you're a, seri if you're a superior economic manager, would you seriously be locking into the budget in 2019 tax cuts amounting to nearly $100 billion uh, that won't actually start being paid until 2024-25? Not, not one person in this building, not one person in this country knows what the economy is going to look like in 24-25. That's you know, five years down the track. If we'd believed what this government had been telling us for the last six years, we would have been seeing you know, people dancing in the streets by now, celebrating the economic joy that this government has been promising for six years. But for every promise this government has made over the last six years, that good times are just ahead and that people are going to be benefiting from their superior economic management, then we'd be seeing it by now and we wouldn't be needing to see the very tax cuts that this government is being putting forward. So how on earth can we have any confidence in what this government is saying the economy will look like in 2024-25 when the stage three tax cuts will actually take effect? Now, it's not just Labor saying this. We've had, again, uh, a range of economic commentators, including the Grattan Institute, appeal to the government to pass the stage one tax cuts now, but to defer the stage three tax cuts to a time down the track, closer to when they take effect, and when we have some idea about uh, what the economy is actually looking like. You have the, the Grattan Institute's uh, uh, information that they put out this week say, st states that the stage three tax cuts scheduled to come into effect in 2024-25 would cost the budget $85 billion over the subsequent six years. Uh, we do not know now whether these cuts are affordable or the right size and shape for the economy so far into the future. The economy is softening, the budget position is weakening and calls for the government to use fiscal policy to stimulate the economy are growing, says the Grattan Institute. So there is an argument for the stage one and two tax cuts to happen right now 
to get the economy moving, but do we seriously think that anyone out there in the Australian community is going, if this bill gets passed without our amendments, is going to say, you beauty, in 2024-25, I'm going to get a tax cut from the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison, probably by then, Canavan, Smith, Scar government, because you know, you'll probably move to the House of Reps and you'll be the next leaders. Um, who, we don't even know how many prime ministers we're going to have between now and 2024-25, let alone what the economy is going to be like. So do you seriously think that there's anyone sitting in Western Australia, where Senator Smith's from, from Rockhampton, where Senator Canavan's from, from Brisbane, where Senator Scar's from? Do you seriously think that there's anyone sitting in those towns today who is going to race down to the shops tomorrow and spend a whole bucket load of money buying a big new TV from Harvey Norman or whatever they're going to do to get the economy going because they know they're going to get a tax cut in, in five years' time? Really? I mean, if, if, if you know people like that, I, I'd like you to introduce them to me because they're obviously easily deceived. So the stage three tax cuts are totally economically responsible. They are also grossly unfair. And I might just pick out one aspect of this, uh, which is that, and again, this is particularly for Senator Canavan's benefit. I spent the last term reminding regional Queenslanders of how often we had seen uh, the nationals come down to, Qu come down to Canberra you know, talking the talk in regional Queensland about how much they cared about regional Queenslanders and coming down here, getting their tummies tickled by the Liberals and rolling over and supporting policy after policy after policy that ripped money out of regional Queensland and sent it straight into the north shore of Sydney. And here we go again. You really would think that the Nationals would have some gratitude to regional Queensland, which I accept voted for them in droves. We got a shellacking in regional Queensland. The Nationals did very well. Congratulations. You really would think that there'd be a little bit of gratitude from the Nationals to repay the favour to regional Queensland and not back in the stage three tax cuts, which overwhelmingly will be benefiting people in Sydney and Melbourne and not in Rockhampton, not in Mackay, not in Townsville, not in Gladstone, not in any of those countries. Of course there's people in Gladstone, Rockhampton, who earn more than $180,000, but you know as well as I do, Senator Canavan, that they are not in the majority, that they are a tiny minority of people and that the majority of people who earn that kind of money are sitting in inner city Brisbane, inner city Sydney and inner city Melbourne. They're not in Rockhampton, they're not in Gladstone, and here you are again supporting your Liberal overlords uh, to, to, to do the very things that benefit their constituents and not your own. Now, I might just spend my remaining time talking about the dodgy deals which apparently have been made overnight uh, with particularly Centre Alliance. Now, of course, we still don't know what the nature of those deals are. Senator Patrick was interviewed on Radio National this morning and he still doesn't seem to know exactly what the deals are, but he's prepared to sign up to this deal to ship all this money out of South Australia and the people who don't earn that kind of money in South Australia, and again, send it off to Melbourne, send it off to Sydney. He's prepared to send out, sell out his own state for a deal that he doesn't even know what it is. Uh, something about gas. You know, don't worry, we're going to do something about gas. I, I've got a nod and a wink from Senator Canavan. I've got a nod and a wink from Prime Minister Senator Cormann. They're going to sort it out. It's going to be good for gas prices. But he can't even tell you what the deal is, let alone tell the Australian people or the South Australian voters who elected him what the deal is. But apparently, what this deal is going to do is bring down gas prices. And I recognise that, again, under this government, we've seen nothing but energy price increases, whether it be electricity or gas. And I feel for people in South Australia, just as I feel for people in my home state, uh, about the gas prices and electricity prices that they're paying. So if there was actually some prospect that this deal would deliver, that would be, you know, you might think about that. But I can tell Senator Patrick and I can still tell every member of the government who has signed up to this deal that we are going to be watching what actually happened to gas prices. And I saw that in Senator Patrick's interview with ABC this morning, he was pressed and pressed and pressed about what it would mean for gas prices. And he said, I think probably a realistic measure is something of the order of about $7 per gigajoule for gas. Currently we're paying about $9. So we want to see that decrease Senator and we're going to be watching. Your time has expired. Senator Seward. 
Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I too rise today to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment tax relief so working Australians keep more of their money bill 2019. Or should I say the Treasury Laws Amendment destroying Australia's progressive tax system or, or, or giving to the already doing OK even more money? The gall of this government to pretend they care about low or middle income Australians when this bill does nothing for those on the lowest income, those struggling to survive on New Start or Youth Allowance. It does nothing for them. And the bulk of the money goes to, the, to those that are already doing okay, thank you very much. It will not help those on the very lowest income. Not only does this do nothing, but the government clearly intends to do nothing for those people. But also, on top of that, where does this money come from? It comes from, when you look at the budget papers, and I'll go into this in more detail a little bit later, it comes from not spending on services for the very people that are going to be the worst off under this proposal. So it's a double whammy. You're not increasing New Start, youth allowance and those other payments that really need an increase, but you're also cutting services that would in fact be helping those very people. This bill implements reductions in personal income tax rates over three stages. The proposed changes are on top of the tax cuts already legislated through the Treasury Laws Amendment Act Personal Income Tax Plan of 2018. Together, these tax cuts will cost the government approximately $158 billion over 10 years. This cut means a shrinking in spending. We can make no mistake about that. And that will impact on the people who can least afford to pay. Stage one of the tax cuts, commencing in 2018-19, increases the low and middle income tax offset, which is a non-refundable tax os offset. This stage will reduce government expenditure by about $14.9 billion or $15 billion over the decade. Tax two of the tax the stage two of the tax cuts, commencing in 2022-23, in further increases the lower tax um, offset and changes the top tax taxable income threshold. This stage will reduce government expenditure by uh, approximately $47.6 billion over the decade. And stage three of the tax cuts, commencing in 2024-25, further reduces the marginal tax rate from 32.5 per cent to 30 per cent. This means that taxpayers will have a taxable income that, that have a taxable income between $45,000 and $200,000 will pay a marginal tax rate of 30 per cent. People with taxable incomes of 200,000 stand to gain a maximum of 11,640 um, 11, each year from these changes. I'll just stop here very quickly and say those on New Start get about $15,000 a year. So those on highest on that income will be getting in tax reef in tax ref under this proposal to cap taxes will be getting almost as much as a person gets who is trying to survive on Newstart. That is simply outrageous. This stage will reduce government expenditure by a whopping $95.4 billion. Clearly, this money is disproportionately benefiting those on highest incomes. It's really clear where the government's priority is. My colleague, Senator Natale, the Greens leader, has already uh, uh, outlined that we will be moving amendments that in fact would deliver better outcomes for those on low and middle income um, and that relating to ta tax um, offsets. And my colleague, Peter Wish Wilson, will be, I know, talking about that further. Let's have a think about how we could better spend $158 billion. Start by rise, raising new start and youth allowance. The other day, I just came across some of the documents that I've been working on in 2012, and they related to the inquiry that we had about the adequacy of new start 
and other payments. We have known for a very, very, very long time that New Start and Youth Allowance were inadequate. In 2012, they were inadequate. In 2010, they were inadequate. And in 2019, they are disgustingly inadequate. People in this country are living in poverty. And what are we doing? Giving people on $200,000 a whole lot of money that's nearly the equivalent to the whole of a New Start payment. What is this country coming to when we think that is OK? And the crossbench is about to lock that in. They're about to lock that in by agreeing to what well, we don't know. So much for transparency in this country. We don't know what they're agreeing to because it's all a little bit airy fair and it's all about on a promise. I wouldn't trust this government as far as I could throw them when they don't care about those on the lowest income, because if they did, they would increase New Start. This fallacy that they keep promoting, that New Start's only a transitional payment and it's only to help people through while they're on a short term, uh, out of work for a short time. That is an absolute fallacy that has been demonstrated time and time again to be false. People, and particular certain cohorts, are stuck on New Start for a very long time time, a very long time. Single parents with children stuck on New Start. And we know the evidence is really clear about what the impact of poverty does to those that are living in poverty, that it's a barrier in fact to finding work, but it also has long-term income impacts on the children that are growing up in poverty. It has been demonstrated time and time again and called for that we need an increase in New Start. The Business Council, ACOS, I mean, there's, it's just a, 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 the list goes on and on about the number of organisations and people who see the wisdom in increasing New Start. And just a couple of weeks ago, we saw Philip Lowe, the governor of the Reserve Bank, say that an increase in New Start would be good for the economy. And you know why? Because when you're living below the poverty line, when you're living literally from, from payment to payment, any increase you get, you spend. You spend it in either meeting a bill, making sure that you're paying those bills and not in arrears, but you actually spend it on food on the table. You stimulate the economy. You buy those extra little things that you need for your kids. You make sure that you give them a little bit of extra money so they may be able to buy something once a week at the canteen, like all the other kids at school. It would stimulate the economy absolutely directly, and the Reserve Bank governor says so. Over the past 30 years, poverty has remained consistent in Australia, despite economic growth and low unemployment. But this government continues to do nothing to eliminate poverty or reduce income inequality, and this will make it worse. We don't have a poverty reduction plan. In fact, the plan is to actually increase poverty because we're not dealing with New Start. We don't even have an agreed national definition of, of poverty, let alone regular reporting by governments on any progress to address it. Today there are around three million people in Australia living below the poverty line. Over 700,000 children are living in poverty, which has increased by 2 per cent over the past decade. The reality is that we are living in a time where income inequality is rising alongside the cost of living. This is the worst time to be handing out tax cuts to the wealthy and, their big, um, and the other uh, tax cuts that, um, to uh, big business. People who are experiencing poverty at the highest rates in Australia as are the, uh, people who are experiencing it are those living on New Start and Youth Allowance. We have the second worst poverty rate amongst the unemployed people in the OECD. We only need to look at the statistics on food relief and housing stress to see the in that income support payments are inadequate. Charities across Australia are struggling to keep up with the demand for food relief. The proportion of food insecure Australians seeking food relief was up by 46 per cent in 2017, uh, from 46 per cent to 51 per cent in 2018. Children in Australia are, li are more likely to live in food insecure households than adults. 
I will reinforce the message that living in poverty is a barrier to employment, but it, provi it, it can also prove to provide lifelong impacts. This year's Anglicare rental affordability snapshot shows how people receiving New Start Youth Allowance are experiencing housing stress. It once again demonstrates that the, it once again demonstrated there are no affordable rentals for a single person on New Start or Youth Allowance in any capital city in this country. Yet the government stands there with its hands in its ears, its hands over its eyes, because it won't see and it won't hear what is happening to people that are struggling on income support in this country. We also know that poorer people have increased levels of psychological distress, which is associated with poor mental health um, and issues such as depression and anxiety. Nobody is getting a fair go when they're living in poverty on less than $40 a week. The government, as I've said, claims that Newstart is, a trans is only a short-term payment and justifies its, its refusal to increase the rate. This is simply not true. We know that 44 per cent of people receiving Newstart and Youth Allowance were on these payments for over two years and 15 per cent for over five years. It is clear that the perverse and punitive rules we have in place uh, on people who are receiving income support payments are keeping people in poverty and acting as a barrier to employment. Since 2014 and that dreadful budget we can all remember, more than $1.8 billion has been ripped from the community sector, those that are helping those that are the worst off. These ta tax cuts will undoubtedly result in more cuts to services and programs by generating less money for essential public services like social security, health and education. But let's look at the budget papers for 2019-20. When you take a close look at them, you'll see that there is less spending on families, children and communities over the next five years. If you look at the Department of Social Security budget statements on page 65, go to look at program 2.3, social and community services. Look at what's budgeted. Um, sorry, that's, uh, look at what's um, budgeted sorry, on page 63. I'll come to page 65 in a minute. If you look at 2018-19 um, estimated expenditure, um, there it was um, around 277 million dollars. If you then go to what is projected for 2022 and 23? You'll see that it's 259 million. That is a drop. That is a drop. When we know we'll have inflation, when we know that we've got an increasing population, when we know that the government is not doing anything to increase New Start. So, in other words, those people in New Start will still need these services. You are cutting services. That's where these cuts are coming from. Services. These are coming off the backs of the most disadvantaged in our community. Let's turn to something that most people in this chamber won't know about, and that is the equal remuneration order, which was about, if you think back over about five years ago, we actually made sure that there was an increase for those working in the community sector. And the government made sure that they put money into that. Well, that runs out next year. Runs out. $500 million runs out. But it's not being made up for in the money that is going to the community sector. In other words, they are, will have less money through this process, through the budget. There's already less money going there. On top of that, these organisations will have to make cuts if this government does not address the issue around the ERO, as it's commonly called. That is a double, another whammy, a double, it's a triple whammy now onto these services. Increased caseloads, reduced funding through the budget, reduced real funding through the budget because they will no longer be able to provide the same number of services if they are to actually pay their workers proper wages. This comes on the backs of the most disadvantaged in our community. 
It is simply outrageous. You are destroying our progressive tax system. Yep. You are destroying our community services and public services and universal delivery of services. Yep. When you look at health, the money in the budget does not properly address into the forwards, does not properly address the true cost of inflation in the health budget. So again, inevitably, that will come out of the pockets of the most disadvantaged. Because you're giving money to the wealthy, they'll be able to pay for it. The most disadvantaged will not be able to pay for it. That's the true cost of these budget tax cuts. These budget tax cuts will impact on the most disadvantaged on the community throughout our service delivery system. What else could we spend this money on? Let's look at aged care. We know we have a shortage in residential aged care, particularly in levels three and four. We know we need an increase there. You could provide a lot of beds with this amount of money. You could actually make sure that we're delivering the amounts of care. At the moment, we've got a Royal Commission going on to our inappropriate and ineffective aged care system. We know from the evidence—again, I know the government doesn't like that word, evidence—but we know from the evidence that we need to increase the level of care per resident in residential aged care. We know it needs to increase to at least four hours and 18 minutes. We could spend some of this money on that, looking after our elderly. We could afford to pay for dental care. This will have, these cuts will have devastating impacts on those on the lowest income. From a government who, at the same time professing to care for those on low and middle income, have also now signalled that they are going to have another goal at attacking our industrial relations system, further undermining workers' rights to actually campaign and take action to make sure they've got fair pay and fair conditions. They've already cut penalty rates, and who does that impact on? That impacts on the lowest paid. This money, that what the government should be doing, is increasing new start and youth allowance. If they want to stimulate the economy, we know from the Reserve Bank governor and from a long list of experts in this field that that would help stimulate the economy. That would help those on the truly lowest income. I'll be moving a second, I am moving a second reader amendment that says at the end of the motion, add, but the Senate notes that this bill does nothing to assist people receiving new start allowance or youth allowance and calls upon the government to introduce legislation to amend the Social Security Act 1991 to increase the maximum single rates of new start allowance and youth allowance by $150 per fortnight. That's what would really help those on the lowest income. That's what would really help stimulate our economy. These tax cuts are coming at the expense of our progressive tax system, at the expense of those on lowest income. It will cut services, essential services that people need, particularly as this government is refusing to address the issues around Newstart. We are urging the crossbench to reconsider their support for these tax cuts. They are bad for this country. They are bad for the people that they profess to care about. And we urge the ALP to vow to repeal these tax cuts. They genuinely care about the, the, most, the people on the lowest incomes. They will see the absolute flaws in this. That is a travesty that we are giving so much money through these cuts to the top end of town, to those that are on high incomes that don't need these cuts. The people that need a boost are those that are trying to survive on $15,000 a year. Go and try it. I did, and you can't do it. And That was in 2012, and things have gone up since then. 
We oppose these tax cuts. We stand for the most vulnerable people in this community. We stand for a fair Australia, and this, these tax cuts are not fair. So, Senator Seward, just for clarity, you have foreshadowed the amendment that you are seeking to put. Yes. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This is not my first speech, but as a servant to the Queensland, people of Queensland and Australia, I want to speak on behalf of hundreds of thousands of honest Australians and Queenslanders who voted for One Nation at the last election, and the vast majority of Australians who did not vote in their primary vote for the government. Now I listen to the people and then I speak for the people, because One Nation is of the people. So let me make it very clear. We believe that money should be in people's hands, not government's hands. So why not bring the tax cuts forward? And that's a question I want to consider. But tax is an issue that's dear to my heart. It drives behaviour, and many people seem to forget that. Tax creates or chokes the environment for small business, large companies, employees and consumers. That is clear. It's well known. And yet the government seems to be forgetting it. I've said many times in the Senate and in public that the taxation system in this country is our most destructive system in Australia. It is choking our country. When we change the tax system for the better, we will change behaviours and we will, we will actually have smaller deficits. And I'll touch on that later today. But for now, I want to introduce another concept, productive capacity. It's what our country will produce in the future. What is the capacity of us to produce and to produce effectively and efficiently? And there are students in the gallery from time to time in this chamber. And it is their productive capacity that I'm particularly concerned about, the future of Australia. And that's why we do not just tick and flick what the government puts out. We do what's best for our country. And I want to thank Senator Cormann for the two presentations he arranged from people from the Treasury, the staff of the Treasury. Great people. We got on very well and we appreciate their advice to us and their sharing of some information. Now it's tempting to grab hold of the tax cuts, tax offsets, sorry, they're not tax cuts, they're tax offsets, as a sugar hit and a promise of bigger tax cuts after another two elections, more than half a decade away. And yet high energy prices right now are highly regressive and hurting the poor the most. So much for the bleating from over here from the Greens. They are in favour. They have caused the higher energy prices that are highly regressive on the poor. In the, world's, in the world's greatest exporter of energy, this country, we have pensioners and other most vulnerable people cannot afford energy. And I can remember, Mr Acting Deputy President, as a high school student cycling past the Curry Curry smelter in Curry Curry in the Hunter Valley as it was under construction. That smelter shut down recently because of the destructiveness of the Liberal Labor policies on energy. Now we support tax cuts, yet we want to consider the risk in getting rid of $158 billion revenue stream and not replacing it. Why does the government lock itself and two future governments into a position half a decade out? And will the government guarantee no rise in GST. Tax offsets, not tax cuts, are only for people paying tax. Yet not all taxpayers, because they're really hand, handbacks or offsets that the ATO calculates. And they don't take care of people who don't pay any tax at all, such as pensioners. So what about pensioners being choked with rising energy prices and food prices due to drought and high water prices? What about farmers, food producers crippled with water prices? Until recently, Liberal Labor governments, and I say that deliberately, Liberal Labor governments, because it makes no real difference, when, and I'll show you in a minute, governments borrowing money for recurrent expenditure. That's like a family putting its grocery bill on the home loan. Why are Canberra public servants paid such huge salaries? What happened to our constitution's competitive federalism and the accountability that it brought? I'll tell you what's happened to it. It's been destroyed. Tax offsets, offsets 
are a sugar hit and can be taken away from the people through electricity prices overnight, well, within 12 months. Yet infrastructure charges, which is what my leader, Senator Pauline Hanson, and I have been advocating, cannot be taken away and increase the productive capacity of our country. If the economy will benefit so much from the government's supposed tax cuts, why are we waiting half a decade until 2024-25? Why not do it straight away? It's all about priorities, as I'll show you, because One Nation wants reality for the people of Australia. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'm going to discuss some problems and then some solutions. One Nation focuses on two primary things, management of our economy today and the vision for the future. Managing today requires two components, cost of living, focusing on that, economic management and security in terms of who we let into the country, for example. And number two, the vision for the country's future productive capacity. Good governance, Mr Acting Deputy President, involves stewardship, management, governorship, which is the long-term future, and trusteeship of the values of this country and our culture. So let's discuss some facts briefly. Mandate. The government says it has a mandate. The government got one-third of the votes, less than that in places. And certainly we have a mandate in the Senate to speak for the people who support our campaign on energy and infrastructure. And just a note to the Prime Minister. He does not tell the Senate what to do and how to do it. The Senate makes that very clear. It is under the Senate's grace that we debate issues. Because the Senate is the house of the people of the states and a house of review. The debt, as I look to the, to the uh, members of the government over here, the debt in this country has doubled under your rule. Prime Ministers Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison. Mr Morrison, by the way, was also the Treasurer. Prime Minister Morrison's Liberals got less votes than Mr Turnbull's Liberals. And regional Australia now is in recession. Businesses are shut. Go to anywhere from Cunnamulla to Cairns and you'll find shops boarded up, empty, vacant, dark, oppressive. And interest rates have just been cut to 1 per cent. Yet credit card interest rates have been raised one and a half to two per cent. So let's turn to the Governor General's uh, speech recently on behalf of his government. He said, and I quote, the government's role is to shape the environment so people can seize the opportunities. I agree completely. And he said, we are good people. Again, I agree. Yes. And in Australia, we have amazing, resourceful, practical, innovative people. We have abundant resources. Energy. We're the world's biggest exporter of energy. Plenty of water up north. We have a great climate. Our soil is a little bit thin compared to other agricultural countries. But so much boundless resources. And yet we're led by wombats. Let's consider the poor economic management under the Liberal Labor duopoly that's destroying Australia's productive capacity and potential and destroying our environment for investment in the future. History and the record of Liberal Labor building facades and selling them. That's the history in recent decades of our country. There's more interest in looking good than doing good. And I'll explain that in a minute too. But let's come to the primacy of energy. Energy, the number one lesson for the last 170 years since the start of the Industrial Revolution, is that ever-reducing prices of energy in real terms have led to enormous increases in human progress. That is clear. And yet under the Liberal Labor duopoly in the last 10 years, we've seen a doubling of energy prices, a reversing of the energy trend, and that will lead to the future for these kids being a decline in human progress. That's what we want, to re we want to reverse, that decline. Think about these things. Renewable energy target, brought in by the, by the Howard government, put on turbochargers by the, by the Rudd and Gillard governments, destroying our competitiveness in this country. Network costs as a result of gold plating because of the structure of those under the now national energy market, which is really a national energy racket. Retailers making money for jam, guaranteed returns. And the national energy market not only being a dictator of bureaucrats, 
but able to be gamed, and companies, including foreign-owned companies, now making off like bandits while pensioners freeze. And then we have privatisation and corporatisation. I was once in favour of government getting out of just about everything, but I've come to realise when it comes to monopolies like electricity and like water, we cannot afford to have those assets in the hands of foreign-owned multinationals that don't give a damn about our country. And so what we've seen is under the old sector, under the old regime of um, competitive federalism, each state was responsible for its own electricity prices and reliability. And the focus of the minister in charge was to drive down the price of energy while ensuring reliability. Now under privatisation and under corporatisation, the focus is on the boards governing those entities to drive up the price to maximise profits without adding any more value. And that is scandalous. That is now focusing energy deliverers on raising prices. And when we focus on raising prices, what do we get? Raising prices, higher prices. So we've gone from the cheapest energy in the world with a focus on declining prices to the highest electricity prices in the world with a focus on driving up the price of energy. That is simple, Mr Acting Deputy President, but no one talks about it. Think about this example, Kilcoy. We have Chinese people look at Chinese company wanting to buy land there and build the, the largest solar industrial complex in the southern hemisphere, perhaps the world. They want to add cadmium and lead to Brisbane's water supply, but it's not just Brisbane, it's Ipswich, it's possibly Toowoomba, it's the Gold Coast, it's, it's um, Logan. More than two, two and a half million people, lives threatened. We're turning productive land, high quality prime agricultural land, into industrial wasteland with low density energy production. And who did this? Liberal Labor did this. And who pays? The people pay. And then what we see is our coal going overseas to China to build wind turbines. And they can use our coal more cheaply than we can because of our ridiculous Liberal Labor regulations for the last 10, 15, 20 years. So they're at a competitive advantage already. They send their wind turbines to us, they send their solar panels to us, while they use our coal to generate electricity cheaply. And then we pay them subsidies to destroy our electricity network. We pay them subsidies. This would be like John Curtin as Prime Minister in 1942 when he saw the bombs falling in, J in Darwin from the Japanese bombers sending a cheque to the Japanese government saying, here, you might need a subsidy to help you destroy our economy. Now, the Chinese, I'm not criticising them for doing that, they're making a rational decision as a result of our government's stupidity. We're subsidising the destruction of our country. Then think of property rights. Thinking of people like Dan MacDonald, an honest, hard-working farmer, farmer Sharon Loos, Bruce Wagner and Boona. John Howard, who was agnostic on climate, he even said so seven years after he did the damage, stole, his government stole farmers' property rights to comply with the UN's Kyoto Protocol. And you're wondering why I'm angry? Because it happened all across Queensland and most of New South Wales, thanks to Bob Carr and Peter Beattie. But the initial, the initial agreement was with Rob Borbidge, the Premier of Queensland at the time in 1996 when John Howard floated this idea to comply with Kyoto and cut the guts out of our agricultural sector. And he did it deceitfully. His government did it deceitfully by avoiding the constitution so they wouldn't have to pay compensation. This is destroying the productive capacity of our country. And who did it? The Liberal Labor duopoly. And who pays? The people pay. Liberal Labor have identical or similar political positions on climate that are driving higher energy prices. And the onus is on them to provide the data and the facts justifying their policies, because they never have. Senator Ian MacDonald from the Liberals said in 2016 in this chamber that we have never had a debate on the climate science. Never, and he is correct. They have similar policies, Liberal and Labor, on gas, abandoning Australians and Australia. High immigration numbers, Liberal and Labor. Foreign ownership, go, go for it, Liberal and Labor working together against minor and medium parties, Liberal and Labor. Prime Minister Morrison suggested Labor and Greens ahead of one nation when it comes to preferencing. When are the Liberals and Labor Party going to merge? They're both chasing the same voters. Labor abandoned the workers. Liberals abandoned small business. The Nationals abandoned farmers in the bush. When are they going to merge? 
They're all chasing preferences from the Greens. Maybe they'll merge with the Greens who set the agenda. And at times they even suggest to preference the Greens first. That tells you about Liberal and Labor. Labor always preferences the Greens first. So who did this again? Liberal and Labor. And who's paying? The people. Every monopoly ever has been created by government. And that is including education, energy and centralisation of government. The tax offsets and cuts will be chewed up in higher energy prices and water prices in within 12 months. The poor need real jobs, hand-ups, not handouts. Tax rates and bracket creep mean nothing to people who have no job or lost their assets to capricious banks, as of many farmers. We have a complex tax system, needlessly complex tax system, that is made more complex because of the convoluted way that this government is now getting tax breaks to lower and middle income, which we applaud, but not necessarily the, the way they're doing it, while ensuring a surplus and overall longer term bracket creep. Think of these considerations. Progressivity. Theoretically, contrary to what the Greens say, the government has ma maintained that. We compliment them. Bracket creep. It's cyclical. They're not doing anything about bracket creep, just putting it off for another day. Consumption boost. Potentially, but the people in the Treasury can't really say where it will be spent. Will it be spent on imported goods and help the Chinese and the Americans or Australian goods? The budget effect. It is affordable, so they say. They keep the, the budget in, uh, in uh, surplus. Then there's a political balance and a narrative. They need a surplus, even if it's tiny and fragile. And then they, they want horizontal equity, so that the same tax is paid, even if different income sources. And get this. They want to maintain a 24 per cent tax take. In this beautiful country, the aim used to be 10 per cent. It's gone up two and a half times under Liberal and Labor. It's an already complex tax system made more complex by offsets. And yet, out of this mess, eventually comes a better, simpler tax system. Half a decade from now, after two more elections, and who knows what will happen in between. People need transparency in the tax system because that's what drives behaviour. With offsets, they don't get that. People in this country feel confused, directionless, hopeless. And it's five years before they can get some real relief for middle income earners. These tax cuts and tax offsets are yet another political distraction hiding the reality of economic mismanagement. The productive capacity of our country is being destroyed. Foreign multinationals pay no company tax. The weakest people are the PAYE people, which are the vast majority of Australians, frantically too busy surviving and complaining to take action. Farmers abandoned, workers abandoned, PAYE people abandoned. And yet there's a possible structural change going on in the economy right now, according to the Treasury. And now we have competitive welfareism across the states rather than competitive, competitive, um, competitiveness. So here are some solutions. If the tax cuts are so good, so beneficial, bring them all forward and get the benefits now, straight away. Increased economic behaviour, increased economic activity and possibly a higher tax take. And we've seen modelling just recently, and we'll be back on this one, from the University of Queensland and the CIS on that. They can do both, tax offsets and invest in coal-fired power and water security to drive down people's costs, removing the artificial burdens on energy. They can tax foreign multinationals who currently pay no company tax, and they can do that to dramatically improve the surplus. How about this for an idea for the government? The three billion dollars currently paid out of should be paid, uh, that's currently paid on subsidies could be paid out of consolidated revenue. Subsidies to energy producers, because Mrs. Brown currently, the pensioner down the road, currently pays for the subsidies to multinational electricity producers, and the state government of Queensland. Higher electricity prices are highly regressive. It's a hidden greens tax. So instead of the, instead of the pensioners paying for this, instead of all of us paying for it, these wacky green, greens uh, uh, programs that are picked up by Liberal and Labor, why not have? coming out of consolidated revenue, paid for by increased revenue from multinationals. Conclusions from me, Mr Acting Deputy President. Economic mismanagement is destroying Australia's productive capacity and potential. 
and yet we have an enormous potential if we get back to basics. We need to invest in productive capacity, coal-fired power, water infrastructure. We need proper tax reform and tax rates locked in. One Nation is about positive policy for managing Australia, reducing cost of living through proper economic management, enhancing security and having a vision for future building. We need a creative, productive investment for the future. We need proper, responsible economic Senator management. Roberts, resume your seat. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy expired. President. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, throughout this debate, it is only the Labor Party that has been advocating that all working Australians receive a tax cut. A tax cut now because both our economy and many households are struggling. Letting this bill through in its current form, uh, unamended, fails in our duty to all Australians. We know that Australians are struggling under mortgage stress, flat wages growth, rising cost of living, power prices. But what this bill does before us today does not prioritise the needs of Australians properly. It's quite reasonable to bring forward the second stage of the tax cuts because more money in the pockets of more Australians now gives our economy the stimulus it so desperately needs. Letting the, the, this tax bill go through in its current form does a disservice not only to the people of my great state of WA, who, for whom have put their trust in me after the recent election. It does a service to the whole of Australia. This bill, as Labor proposes, should be split, allowing the first and second stages to go to the intended middle and lower income earners. That gives the much needed boost to the economy that we need. But instead, you are so ideologically driven towards wanting to do these down the path in the future tax cuts for high income earners that you're not prepared to bring forward those stage 2 tax cuts in the interests of the economy now the first and second stages would allow a much needed boost for an economy that we know is already in trouble you are irrational when you say that the third uh, round of tax cuts planned for 2024 um, when you have no idea of the economic climate that we will be dealing with in that time. We should be waiting to see what the economic conditions are uh, before we revisit such an idea. Your projected surplus projected there will be a $9 billion surplus in 2022-23. That's including the $16.4 billion worth of planned tax cuts for that year. But what we know is that the Reserve Bank's forecast for the next few years, which was released only in June, looks much bleaker than the March budget. The March budget predicted a 2.75 rate of growth in wages. The Reserve Bank's forecast, a mere two months later, predicts only 2.5 per cent. All signs keep pointing to not legislating these $35 billion worth of tax cuts that are five years into the future, a future that we can't possibly predict now. At this moment, more than anything, we shouldn't be making grandiose plans without knowing what kind of environment we need to work with in the future. The economy has been growing, thanks to this government, much too slowly in recent years. The rate of growth in Commonwealth spending after inflation is estimated to fall from an average of 2.6 per cent per year from 2013 to 18 to 1.3 per cent in 2019-22. This is not good enough when it comes to our public goods and services in our nation. So instead of looking down the track, why not work quickly now to improve income growth and spending on goods and services across the nation by bringing our stage two forward? If we got them going this year, it would mean we're able to directly help lower and middle Australia now. 
For that modest, modest cost of $10 billion, we'd be able to directly lighten the load of struggling families who might not feel able to comfortably spend on a new vacuum cleaner, getting the car serviced, um, all of the things that should be injected into our economy now with increased consumption and spending. People would be putting more money into the economy. But allowing the second stage and the first stage through going to the intended middle and lower income earners gives that uh, boost to our sluggish economy that you over there in your heart of hearts desperately know we need. You can't paper over the state of the economy as much as you might like to. The economy has slowed to a pace not seen since the last uh, since the global financial crisis a decade ago. The Reserve Bank has brought interest rates to a level lower than we saw during the global financial crisis. And we know that the Reserve Bank has real concerns about the continuation of sustained growth in the economy. They have also said that their monetary policy is not enough. So we have an opportunity in this bill before us today to do something more. Interest rates through the Reserve Bank are lower than we saw during the global financial crisis, and we must do something about the concerns in our economy. The 1 per cent rate of interest is an indictment on the economic mismanagement we have from the Liberals. It's 1 per cent. What are you doing in the meantime? You refuse to change the deeming rate for pensioners from 3.5 per cent, where you deem that that's the income that they will uh, earn from their savings. No, it's 1 per cent. 1 per cent is the official interest rate now. So you want to give these tax cuts to higher income earners down the track, but you refuse even to change the deeming rate for pensioners now. You are void of economic policy, which is clearly something that the Reserve Bank sees. We have stagnant wages growth, weak economic growth and mortgage stress. Mortgage stress that's clearly being experienced in my home state of Western Australia, Mor where mortgage defaults are the highest in the country. What you can and should be doing with these tax cuts is injecting more cash directly into middle income and lower income households who are more likely to spend it and boost the economy. Another good thing to be doing is direct investment into infrastructure and services, a critical thing to get our economy back on track, making sure that our dentists, cafes, local shops are thriving and vibrant. The boost that our economy needs is not going to be achieved through stage three of these tax cuts which are down the track. Stage three is aimed highly at high income earners who have clearly been shown to save more of their income, save or invest at least a third of their income. What's more, they're down the track and we don't know if we can afford them. As the Reserve Bank said uh, early this week, consumption growth has been subdued, weighed down by a protracted period of low income growth and declining housing prices. So the government, in its nothing to see here, does not even have a wages policy, a wages policy that you did not have one to take to the election and you don't have one now. Your last policy was, in fact, to cut penalty rates to some 700,000 working Australians. You seem to think that penalty rates are a luxury for workers, but they're not. They put food on the table and fuel in the car and indeed also stimulate the economy. By the time your penalty rate cuts are fully implemented, many workers, um, some workers, will be some $26,000 worse off. Workers will lose up to $2.9 billion. So you give with tax cuts on one hand, but you're taking with the other. What kind of policy is that? You have not pro properly costed the third round of cuts, 
where we require some $95 billion over five years. Where, where, my friends on the other side of this chamber through you, Mr President, is that money going to come from? Is it the education system, which has suffered a $14 billion cut not only from this government um, but from our current PM? Is it the healthcare system, where Medicare rebates have been frozen for the last five years and $2.6 billion in cuts to public hospitals? Is it the pensions? Is it the government's lack of preparedness for Australia's ageing population? An ageing population that still where the government also still needs to deal with the consequences of the Aged Care Royal Commission? Is it the government's lack of preparedness for Australia's population which states that real growth in health spending will have to fall by some 0.7 per cent? Health, aged care, disability services alone, these are expected to cost $21 billion a year more in a decade's time. We already don't have this revenue. In 2017, people aged 65 years and older make up some 15 per cent of the population. In 2073, some three years after the proposed introduction of these tax cuts, the lion's share of which is going to go to 5 per cent of the population, we will also have 18 per cent of 65 and over year olds seeking retirement, seeking access to public health and aged care services. How are you going to have enough taxpaying Australians to pay? for an ageing population under these circumstances. So, as I said before, the tax cuts are skewed towards, uh, in the third stage, uh, the smallest and wealthiest tax bracket, giving those earning $180,000 to $200,000 around a 4.54 per cent of disposable income while in the first stage of tax cuts, which affects those earning $45,000 to $90,000 a year, they stand to gain only 2.16 per cent of their disposable income back. Why are you giving the highest tax cuts to those who are least likely to spend it? How is that fair on all Australians? Those in the top 5 per cent of the tax bracket who, in 2024, if they're earning $200,000, will be getting an extra $224 a week in tax cuts. And as Senator Seawert pointed out, you know, that's about the same as what uh, Newstart uh, is today. Newstart payments are stagnant. They've been at $245 a week, which is less than the value of the minimum full-time wage, which hasn't, also, which hasn't been increased when inflation has been taken into account for some 25 years. That's where Newstart is today. So, Senators, on the other side of this place, through you, Mr President, I call on you to see the dangerous economic times we're in. At the same time, see our capacity to support those most vulnerable in our society who will suffer if we don't see the light on these issues. Those who don't earn enough to be taxed, arguably the most in need, are left completely in the dark with what you're doing with these tax cuts. Households earning $30,000 or less are 30 per cent of our population. And the implementation of your plan will widen this gap even more greatly. Half of the tax cuts uh, to the highest tax bracket won't boost our economy. It doesn't create jobs. We're on track in the long term to damage essential services to our country and widen the gap between the haves and haves not in our nation. We're in a dangerous economic climate and you seem to be behaving as a government that won't see sense. I cannot, cannot stress, uh, colleagues, today through you, Mr President, 
the importance of the job we have to do in this place today. It's a good thing to act now through these tax cuts to stimulate the economy. We do have the lowest growth in 10 years. That has a real and tangible impact on hardworking Australians and their families. It is about supporting working people to put food on the table, fuel in the car. That's our job. We should be here to stimulate the economy by giving more money back to hardworking Australians and in tax cuts in this parliament. But what we should not be doing is locking in now stage three tax cuts that this nation may not be able to afford, may not be able to afford in terms of our revenue and may not be able to afford in terms of the substantial impact on the services which Australians rely on us to provide. I implore on you to work with us. We've compromised. We changed our position to say we'd support stage two. You don't need to you know, sell out to the crossbench on whatever um, deals they might be doing. Please, you can actually act responsibly now and get stage one and two through stages one and two through by ruling out what's unsustainable today, what's unsustainable tomorrow in terms of those long-term tax cuts. So please, let's work together to give um, all Australians, a hard-working Australians, a tax cut in this term of parliament, stimulate the economy that so desperately needs it. Let's stop playing politics. And let's give the economy the boost that it needs without setting up our economy and Australians for a fall in the future. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment tax relief so working Australians can keep more of their money bill. Um, also known as the we bribed you, we scared you, we won, and now we're going to give our rich mates a tax cut bill. So, this is actually the biggest scam going—$158 billion of taxpayer money, where most of it is going to go to the top 20 per cent of income earners, and at the same time reducing penalty rates, increasing the amount that people have to pay their hex debt back sooner, and continuing to underfund the services that all Australians rely on. We've got a massive problem with homelessness in this country. We've got women and children who are turned away from frontline services when they are fleeing domestic violence because the beds are full and this government won't kick in enough money to build more beds. And yet somehow, somehow they've found the money to give the top 20 per cent a massive tax cut. And they claim this is for economic stimulus. Well, firstly, it's not for five years. And secondly, we know that the rich aren't going to spend this money. They don't need it. They've already got enough. If you want economic stimulus and you actually want to help people, well, then let's give a low income tax offset to people that don't have enough money in their bank account to meet their basic needs. Let's increase New Start. It hasn't happened for 25 years and it is well below the poverty line. If you really want to help people ease their daily costs of living, why not provide free childcare? We know it's great for the education of young ones. We know it frees up parents to return to the workforce. Uh, we know that that's a job-creating measure and an investment in the, the nous and the brains of our whole country. Why not invest in free childcare? Why not actually fix the housing crisis. There are 12,500 Queenslanders, including children, that don't have a roof over their heads. And all you're offering is a minuscule tax cut. Well, what's that going to do when they still don't have a home? And I'm disappointed to see that many of the crossbench are now supporting this, and I'm expecting that Labor will roll over like they always do and support this, despite some you know, fairly mediocre but half-decent speeches that they've just given. What an absolute crock. This, as I said, is the biggest scam going. You guys just scared the electorate about you know, the ghost of Bill Shorten and uh, a made-up crap about death taxes, and now you're just using $158 billion of, of taxpayer money to give massive tax cuts to your rich mates. I mean, well done. You've pulled it off. Credit to you, but um, Australia is actually going to be suffering from this. In Queensland, 
It's not the top 20 per cent that would get this tax cut. There's only 16 per cent of Queenslanders that would benefit from this stage three tax cut on the Never Never. And in regional Queensland, it's 1.6 per cent. So what an absolute crock when we have people right around my state and this country that are crying out for free childcare, for affordable TAFE and free uni, for a roof over their heads, for clean energy projects that can keep power bills down and tackle climate change. What a crock that they're barely going to see any of this tax cut. People want investment in services. That's what will ease their daily cost of living pressures. Instead, you're delivering tax cuts to your rich mates. Well, Good on you for managing to pull this off. I think it's an absolutely revolting outcome for this country. And I'm very saddened that the Greens um, and possibly One Nation are the only folk that are actually going to be opposing this when we get to the vote. So we'll be moving an amendment to more than double that low income tax offset because we think that those folk do need money in their pockets and they will spend it because they cannot actually afford their basic living expenses at the moment. You want economic stimulus, that's the way to do it. Rather than increasing the tax tax brackets, which will flow through to everyone and see rich people get even more of a perk that they do not need, that is not affordable when the economy is looking as precarious as it is, let's use those measures to actually help people to provide that stimulus to create jobs and, hey, why not actually help people in their daily lives? If you want to fix a housing problem, don't just get the state Tasmanian Liberals a free pass on their own budget balls up actually invest in affordable housing. Now you're going to cry poor because you've just wasted $158 billion, 95 of which goes to the top 20 per cent. What a crock. I look forward to this, oh, we can't afford to fix homelessness, oh, we can't afford to make sure women and children actually can get a bed when they're fleeing violence. We'd rather see them go back to possible death. Because we've had 26 women killed already this year, and we know that services have to turn people away because they don't get enough funding. And the Commonwealth has a role to play in that. That funding flows from the Commonwealth to the states and down to those frontline services, except it's not flowing because you guys are spending it on your rich mates instead. Well, shame on you. We'll be voting against this and we'll be moving amendments to increase the low income tax offset. And I call on the Labor Party to please reconsider your absolute spinelessness by becoming liberal light and waving this through this chamber. We may not have the numbers to stop this, but bloody well try. That's what we're here for. We're actually meant to be representing people, protecting their interests, and you guys are meant to be in opposition. Well, we're happy to do it if you're not going to, and we intend to do that today, but we hope to have some company. Order. Before I come to you, Senator Corn, I'm just going to ask senators, on our first day back, going into formal business and with debate. Can we please keep the use of parliamentary language in mind, um, at least for a little while? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I seek leave to make a brief statement in relation to the Statement of Ministerial Standards. Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. Uh, I thank the Senate. The Statement of Ministerial Standards is an important framework which uh, provides transparency and ensures public trust in our system. Uh, the Prime Minister has written to the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, uh, Dr uh, Parkinson seeking his guidance on the application of the relevant statement of ministerial standards to former ministers uh, in all previous governments, including specifically on matters in relation to recent statements by two former ministers uh, in our government. As part of this, he has sought advice on actions that can be taken to ensure compliance with the Code. Uh, additionally, as part of this advice, he has asked the Secretary about the application of the provisions of the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme Act 2018 to the activities of former ministers and elected representatives, uh, and uh, uh, will provide further advice to the Senate in due course. Senator, uh, there being no other thing, I will move to um, business of the Senate, motion number one. Oh, notices of motion, sorry. We're all a bit rusty. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none. Um, I shall now proceed to the. Uh, is there a report of the selection of the bills committee? Senator Smith. Mr. President, I present the second report of 2019 of the selection of bills committee and seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that the report be adopted. Question is the motion moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
contrary, no. The eyes have, the eyes have it. I shall now proceed to Senate, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I call Senator Urquhart. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for two senators. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Stirl uh, for personal reasons for the 3rd of July, and for Senator Polly for the 2nd to the 4th of July the 22nd of July to the 25th of July and the 29th of July to the 1st of August for personal reasons. The question is the motion Thank moved you. by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion to enable the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security to meet during the sitting of the Senate today. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security be authorised to hold a private meeting otherwise than in accordance with Standing Order 33-1 during the sitting of the Senate today from midday. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Committee memberships. If there's no other. On Tuesday, 2nd of July, I informed the Senate that there were two nominations for one position in relation to a number of committees and that ballots would be need, need to be held to determine which senator was to be appointed to each committee. I can now inform the Senate that I have been duly notified that an agreement has been reached between the parties and ballots will no longer be necessary. I have received further letters requesting changes in the membership of committees and I call the minister, Senator Dunningham. Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Leave is, leave is granted. Senator Dunningham. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, unless there's anything else, and come to business of the Senate matter number one in the name of Senator Patrick. Mr. President, um, this is uh, business of notice number one. Business of the Senate number one. Yes. Business. Of the, uh, okay. Uh, noting uh, Senator Cormann's statement uh, in relation to uh, the, the um, ministerial standards, um, I seek leave to postpone this motion until the next sitting day. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Patrick. I'll move now to. I'll because we don't have a hard marker at 12.45, unless anyone objects, I plan to proceed through motions in a way that facilitates the business of the chamber. Um, so I'll now move to government business motion number two in the name of Senator Rustin. Senator Dunning. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that government business notice motion number two relating to the allocation of departments and agencies to committees be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion standing in my name. Senator Wall. Oh, <laughs> the name of Senator Rustin. I move an am amendment as circulated in my name. Leave is granted to move that. I will, um, the, the amendment is ex ex accepted. Yeah. Um, one second. So I was just checking the middle procedure. The question is that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is the motion moved by Senator Dunningham as amended by Senator Wong in the Senate be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can I move to government business motion number three? Senator Dunningham. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that government notice of motion number three relating to the days of meeting for the remainder of 2019 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion standing in my name. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can I move to government business number four? Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I ask that government business notice of motion number four relating to the 2019-2020 supplementary budget estimates hearings be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunning. Uh, I move the motion standing in my name. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, government business number five, Senator Dunning. 
Thanks, Mr. President. I ask the Government Business Notice of Motion No. 5, adopting the recommendation in the Procedure Committee's first report of 2019 relating to the suspensions of standing orders during formal business, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion standing in my name. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can we move to Government Business No. 6? Dealing with. Senator Dunham. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that government business notices of motion numbers six, eight, and nine uh, be taken together as formal. Is there any objection to this motion, this motion being taken as formal? Se no, Senator Dunham. I move that the following bills be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the Health Insurance Act 1973, and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the Road Safety, uh, sorry, Road Vehicle Standards Act 2018, and for related purposes, and a bill for an act to amend the law relating to civil aviation, and for related purposes. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham. I present the, uh, the bills and move uh, that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together, and be now read a first time. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark. Health Insurance Amendment, Bonded Medical Programs Reform Bill 2019, Road Vehicle Standards Legislation Amendment Bill 2019, Civil Aviation Amendment Bill 2019. Senator Dunningham. Uh, I table the explanatory memoranda relating to the bills and move that these bills now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to 9 September 2019. Senator Dunningham. Thanks, Mr. President. I move that uh, the bills be listed on the notice paper as separate orders of the day. Thank you. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can I move to Government Business Motion Number Seven? Senator Reynolds. I ask that government business uh, mo notice of motion number seven be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to provide for the recognition of veterans and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Australian Veterans Recognition, Putting Veterans and Their Families First, Bill 2019. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 9 September 2019. Now dealing with matters number, government business matters number 10 and 11. Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that government business notices of motion numbers 10 and 11 be taken together as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Dunningham. I move that the following bills be introduced, a bill for an act to amend the National Disability Insurance Scheme Act 2013 and for related purposes, and a bill for an act to amend the law relating to rental affordability and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Minister. I present the bills and move uh, that these bills be, uh, may proceed without formalities and may be taken together and now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment Worker Screening Database Bill 2019. National Rental Affordability Scheme Amendment Bill 2019. Minister. I table the explanatory memoranda relating to the bills and move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. Oh, sorry, myself. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to 9 September 2019. Now I call the Minister. 
I move that uh, the bills be listed on the notice paper as separate orders of the day. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll now move to general business and move to motion number one. First cap off the rank for the parliament, Senator Patrick. Mr President, I ask the general business notice of motion number one standing in my name for today relating to the restoration of bills to the notice paper be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. Mr President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can I move to government business, uh, general business motion number three now in the name of Senator Billick? Uh, Senators Billick and Stirl. Senator Urquhart. Apologies, Mr President. I thought you were going in numerical order. Okay. Um, Mr President, I ask a general business notice of motion number three, standing in the names of Senator Billick and Senator Stirl for today relating to World Hemochromatosis Week, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Bernardi, um, general business matter number four. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number four standing in my name for today relating to the restoration of, of the nuclear fuel cycle facilitation bill 2017 to the notice paper be taken as a formal motion. Is there motion. any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Bernardi. Mr. President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Griff, matter number five in your name. Uh, Mr President, I ask that general business notice of motion number five, standing my name for today, proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Griff. I move that the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to amend the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare Act 1987 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. Ayes have it. Senator Griff. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Griff. Oh, the clerk. clerk. We can act to amend the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare Act 1987 and for related purposes. Senator Griff. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Griff. I table the explanatory memorandum and seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Griff. Can we move to your next matter, number six? I ask that uh, <coughs> general business notice of motion number six, standing in my name for today relating to the restoration of the telecommunications legislation amendment unsolicited communications bill 2019 to the notice paper be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Griff. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi, can we move to your matter number seven, please? Uh, Mr President, I ask the general business notice of motion number eight, standing in my name for today, proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Oh, sorry, are we dealing with number seven? Um, I, think you're in a, I think you're dealing with number eight, Senator Faruqi. I will continue that and I'll go back to seven. I'll, if everyone's happy, I did call for seven, just to clarify. So we're dealing with general business matter number eight. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Faruqi. Mr President, I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Export Control Act 1982 to prohibit the export of live animals for slaughter and for related purposes. Is there, the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Um, I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. The bill for the Export Control Act 1982 to prohibit the export of live animals for slaughter and for related purposes. Senator Faruqi. Mr President, I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. 
President, I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Senator Fruki, could we now deal with your matter, motion number seven? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion number seven, standing in my name for today, relating to the Royal National Park in New South Wales, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Faruqi. Uh, Mr. President, I move the motion. Question is that mo Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. The proposal to include Royal National Park on Australia's World Heritage tentative list would be best directed to the New South Wales Government. Consistent with the decisions of the meeting of environment ministers in December 2015, the New South Wales Government is responsible for conducting the necessary work to demonstrate that a credible case for World Heritage List inscription can be mounted before Royal National Park could be considered for Australia's World Heritage tentative list. If such a case can be made by the New South Wales Government, Royal National Park could be considered for Australia's tentative list, along with recommendations for other places made by any other state or territory. The question is, motion, general business matter number seven, in the name of... Oh, sorry, I didn't see you, Senator Faruqi. Uh, Mr President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, Mr President, on the doorstep of Sydney lies Australia's oldest national park and the second oldest in the world. The Royal National Park, or the Nasho as locals call it, is an environmental and cultural jewel, and more than four and a half million people visit it every single year. The National Park deserves to be nominated for World Heritage, and it has been six years since both the New South Wales Government and the Federal Government committed to working together to make this happen. The community is deeply frustrated at the slow pace and want to know what is going on. And in that time, we've actually had a plethora of environment ministers, both at federal and at state levels. So just get your act together and let's give the Nasho the protection it deserves. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I move to matter number 10 in the name of Senator Wish Wilson? Uh, President, I ask that business notice of motion number 10, standing my name for today, relating to commercial whaling. Uh, before asking that it be taken as a formal motion, I seek leave to amend that. Is leave granted? I'm not sure. It has it's been, it has been circulated, I understand. I might, if. Um, all right, I'll, I'll, at, the request, at the request of. I'll come back to you if I can. I'll deal with the next matter. I'll let the um, senators read it. Could we go to matter number 12 then, in the name of Senator Faruqi? Uh, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 12, standing in my name for today, relating to the restoration of the Australian Research Council Amendment, ensuring research independence bill 2018 to the notice paper be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now, are we OK to go back to number 10? Um, Senator Wish Wilson, you've sought leave to amend your motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Wish Wilson. Um, I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, Mr. President, I move the motion as amended. Question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Dunham. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. The Australian government is disappointed that Japan has resumed uh, commercial whaling following its withdrawal from the International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling and its decision-making body, the International Whaling Commission. Australia has publicly urged Japan to, ret uh, to return to the convention and commission as a matter of priority. The government welcomes Japan's decision to stop whaling in the Southern Ocean and commitment to continue to cooperate with the commission. The government's position on whaling has not changed. We remain resolutely opposed to all forms of commercial and so-called scientific whaling. Japan is well aware of our position. The question is the motion as amended by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Can I move to matter number 13 now? Senator, in the name of Senators Griff and Patrick. Senator Patrick. <coughs> Mr President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 13, standing in my name and the name of Senator Griff for today, proposing 
The introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. Mr President, I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to alter the constitution to expressly protect freedom of expression and freedom of the press. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to alter the constitution to expressly protect freedom of expression, including freedom of the press. Senator Patrick. Mr President, I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Patrick. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Could we move to your next matter, number 14, please? Senator Patrick. Mr President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 14 standing in my name for today, proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. Mr President, I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to alter the constitution to make laws for the use and management of water resources that extend beyond the limits of a state and to require laws relating to water resources to not have an overall detrimental effect on the environment. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator, Senator well, Patrick. And I present the bill and move that this bill now, uh, may now proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to alter the constitution to make laws for the use and management of water resources that extend beyond the limits of a state and to require laws relating to water resources to not have an overall detrimental effect on the environment. Senator Patrick. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Patrick. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in the Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Can we move to matter number 16 in the names of Senators Rice and Waters? Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President. First of all, I ask that Senator Green's name be added to this motion. Senator Green. Green. So Thank added. you. So, Mr. President, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 16, standing in my name and the names of Senator Waters and Senator Green, for today relating to Australian women in sport, be taken as a formal motion. Question: uh, Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rice. Mr. President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Uh, the government congratulates the recent achievements of Australian women across a range of international sports. As a government, we are investing significant resources into supporting the rapid growth in women's sport across Australia. Recently, the Morrison government announced an investment of $150 million to support the development of female change rooms at sporting grounds and swimming facilities. This will drastically improve the state of women's sporting facilities across the country. In addition, our government is backing the bid to host the FIFA Women's World Cup in 2023, and we've made investments to boost women's participation in women's tennis and netball. And finally, we are providing support for women through the Women's Leaders in Sport program to develop opportunities to reach their leadership potential across the sports sector. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can we move Senator Dinatali to matter number 17 in your name, please? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 17, standing in my name for today, relating to the restoration of bills to the notice paper, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dinatali. Mr. President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could we move now to matter number 21 in the name of Senator Keneally? Mr. Speaker. Mr. President, excuse me. Uh, Mr. President, I ask that the general business notice of motion number. Oh, sorry, Mr. President. Before asking that, sorry, Mr. President, which motion? Twenty-one. Are we on? Twenty-one. Sorry. Apologies. Thank you. Before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the chamber that Senator Griff will also sponsor the motion. 
I ask the General Business and Notice of Motion No. 21, standing in my name and the name of Senator Griff for today, proposing for an order for the production of documents concerning the Department of Home Affairs and Paladin contracts be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Keneally. Mr. President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, Well, if you'd like to ask me, Senator Wong, I, I, I said at the start, um, if the Senate wants me to run through these things numerically, I'm happy to. But I've previously been asked to try and do matters. If I could finish, I'll call you, Senator Wong, to do matters without divisions first, and then we go. Well, I go on advice I get from whips. It doesn't always. And if, if, if people want to correct that advice, I'm more than happy to do it in in, in the order that I've outlined, Senator Wong. Uh, I think the difficulty I'm having, Mr. President, is that it is a different approach to the one you've taken previously, where we were told the numerical order is the way in which you wish to deal with today. it. And, and there are a number of matters where there is no, there may not be a division, which you have skipped past. Now, if we're going to go through the whole thing, Senator Cormann and I can sit here um, waiting to get to the relevant motions that we are waiting for. Uh, but no, and I'm happy to do that, Senator Bernardi. But I don't quite understand why we're at an okay. OPD discussion when there are motions earlier, which um, uh, don't well, need to be I'll dealt with. But, but, but if, uh, it's in your hands, Mr. President. At the start of the session, Senator Wong, we normally do things numerically on Thursdays because of the hard marker. At the start of this session, I announced I would not do that today because there was no hard marker at 12:45, because otherwise everyone spends an hour in the chamber. If any point someone would like to come to me and say we've skipped my motion, why, or could we do it earlier? I've previously indicated I'm more than happy to. If people are indicating they would like to go back to an earlier motion, please just bring it to my attention and I'll do my best, particularly if it's party leaders or whips making the request. Um, so, well, I was now moving to matter number 22 because these. Sorry? What motion would you like to deal with? Um, 11. I will now go numerically. All right, I'll now go numerically. So we'll go back to business of the Senate notice of motion number two in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Business of the Senate notice motion number two is in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson. Mr. President, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number two standing in my name for today proposing a reference to the Economics Legislation Committee relating to the provisions of the Treasury Laws Amendment Tax Relief so working Australians keep more of their money bill 2019 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, President, I move the motion in my name and I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, President. Um, I don't think anybody would dispute that the Senate is this country's House of Review. The Senate is this country's House of Review, and our job is to thoroughly scrutinise legislation. I don't think anybody else would dispute in this place that this is uh, the signature piece of legislation that no doubt will be brought before this 46th parliament that involves very significant economic reform in this country. Regardless of what you think about the pros and cons of this tax package, this needs to go to inquiry. The last time we had an inquiry on this package, was well over a year ago, and I also don't think there's anyone, even Senator Cormann in here, who would dispute that our economy is sailing into some very strong headwinds at the moment. The situation has totally changed. This Senate needs to do its job, send this off to committee, thoroughly scrutinise this legislation, call the experts, put the facts on the table, and let everyone in here make an informed decision Order, rather than Senator a political Wish -Wilson, decision. Your minute has expired. Senator Cormann. Make a brief statement. Leave is granted for uh, the one government minute. will oppose uh, this uh, motion. It's time for the Senate uh, to get on uh, with uh, this uh, legislation to respect the verdict of the Australian people. Uh, obviously, uh, in, in the context of wanting to build a stronger uh, and more resilient economy, uh, lower income taxes for all hardworking Australians are a very important part of that, and that is why and that is why we're calling on the Senate to get on with it and get this dealt with. The question is the business of the Senate motion number two in the name of Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Order. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
be a long day. Lock the doors. The question is, business of the Senate, motion number two, in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt, teller for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 48. The matter is resolved in the negative. We will now move to general business notice of motion number two in the name of Senator Patrick. Senator Patrick. Mr President, I ask the general business notice of motion number two standing in my name for today, proposing an order for production of documents by the Commissioner of Taxation be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. Mr. President, I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. President, uh, we believe that the public You're seeking release. Leave to make oh, a short statement. Pardon, I'm seeking leave to make a short One statement. One minute, Senator. Thank Dunham. you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, we believe that the public release of the information requested within uh, this motion would potentially prejudice future legal proceedings, being a fair uh, trial of criminal charges by jury. Question, Senator Patrick. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Mr Boyle is before the courts dealing with matters relating to uh, uh, recordings uh, and uh, taking documents home. This order of production is to, is to examine the conduct of the ATO, not of Mr Boyle. Uh, it's a really important issue that we make sure we protect whistleblowers. Uh, I'm not satisfied from the information that I have that the, the ATO has done its job properly, and uh, it is incumbent upon the Senate, noting this is a whistleblower protection issue, to, uh, to conduct oversight in relation to this matter. The question is Senator Cormann. Uh, just to assist the chamber, there's been some conversation across the table. It might assist the chamber. Uh, if uh, Senator Patrick might be, prefer be prepared to defer this motion and we might have some further conversations. Uh, so I'm in the hands of the chamber. Senator Patrick, you are able to seek leave to defer this until a later, I'm going to use the correct words, Mr Clark, to a later hour? Next day of sitting or a later hour? Next. Uh, it's been suggested that you seek leave to defer this matter until the next day of sitting it, but it's your call, Senator Patrick. Out, out of courtesy, I will uh, seek leave to defer this issue uh, until the next day of sitting. Yeah. 
Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Seward, your matter number nine. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number nine, standing in my name for today, relating to new start and youth allowance, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Seward, number nine. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Dunham. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave granted. It is for one minute. Senator Dunham. Thanks, Mr. President. The proportion of Australians receiving working age income support payments has fallen to its lowest level in 30 years at 14.3 per cent. New Start was not designed to be long-term income on an ongoing basis. Everyone who receives New Start is provided with some form of additional assistance from the welfare system. Senator Gallagher. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Uh, Labor thinks New Start is too low. It's so low that it's preventing people from getting work. They can't afford the clothes, the transport or essentials. And it's so low that it's causing real hardship for many, many Australians. We've been saying that for a long time now. And of course, we went to the last election with a clear commitment to review the rate, a review to make sure New Start was adequate to support people into work and keep them out of poverty. Just like Labor reviewed the rate of the pension when we were last in government and did delivered a significant increase to payments. But we didn't win the election, and the responsibility for taking action over the next three years rests squarely with the government. It's time the Liberals and Nationals stopped demonising people on social security. In the last term of parliament, they tried to cut New Start by scrapping the energy supplement. And that is the sorry record of this government when it comes to looking after the most vulnerable. Question. Senator Seward. I to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Well, here we go. The government trotting out, as I foresaw and mentioned in the chamber earlier today, using the same old trite, it's only a transitional payment. 44 per cent of people on Newstart are on there for longer than two years, 15 per cent longer than five years. That is an old trope you keep using. That is ridiculous. At least come up with new lines for why you're not going to increase Newstart, i.e. we just don't care. In fact, we don't care that so much that we're going to give $95 billion to the wealthy people in this country rather than increasing Newstart. And as for, as for the opposition, have some guts. Have some guts. Say we actually need to raise Newstart. Don't call it for review. Just support an increase in Newstart so people aren't living in poverty. The question is the motion number nine moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Four minutes, and then we'll call for one minute net from this point forward. I'll announce it to the chamber. Are the whips happy if I call this for one minute? The whips are happy. Make it a one-minute bell. The doors. Question is that motion number nine in the name of Senator C would be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator C would teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 13, noes 40. The matter is resolved in the negative. Now move to matter 11 in the name of Senators Di Natale and Hanson Young. Senator, I'll just let people get around in front of you, Senator Di Natale. Senator Di Senator Natale. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion standing in my name in the name of Senator Sarah Hanson Young for today relating to Hong Kong be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion? There is an objection to this motion being taken as formal. Uh, Mr. President, I uh, seek leave to make a one-minute statement in is leave, granted, leave is granted for one minute. Well, uh, Mr. President, the Greens have put forward this motion to, sh to show solidarity with those people in Hong Kong who are protesting to defend their democratic rights and freedoms, the right to freedom of speech, to freedom of the press and freedom of assembly. They rightly fear the reintroduction of a bill that would allow extraditions to mainland China. And who would blame them? They want to see it withdrawn. On June 12, on just one day, the police in Hong Kong used 150 tear gas canisters on protesters. The Greens support their calls for the withdrawal of the bill, for an investigation into police actions and for the release of imprisoned protesters. We urge the coalition government, who say they stand up for the principles of democracy uh, and who want to talk about freedom, well, stand up for it. Defend Hong Kong's democratic rights. Senator Wong. All right, Senator Dunningham. And, uh, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition. Um, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr President. There is intense public interest in international in, and international community concern at events in Hong Kong. Australia supports the right of people to protest peacefully and to exercise their freedom of speech. And we urge all sides to show restraint and avoid violence. Australia has a substantial stake in Hong Kong's success and values Hong Kong's unique advantages and freedoms under one country, two systems, the rule of law and its ind independent judiciary. The government has welcomed the announcement by the Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam to suspend legislative consideration of the planned changes to Hong Kong's extradition framework. Senator Wong. Thank you. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. I thank the Senate. Uh, uh, the opposition will uh, recognise the government's right to deny formality and consistent with long-standing arrangements in this place, which have previously been uh, outlined. However, in relation to Hong Kong, I want to place on the record, consistent with my public statements previously, that the Australian Labor Party recognises and supports Hong Kong's unique advantages and freedoms under one country, two systems. Hong Kong is an important part of the international financial system, and many Australians have personal and business connections there. Along with many in the international community, the people of Hong Kong are hoping it will retain its unique advantages and freedoms under one country, two systems, including particularly the rule of law and an independent judiciary. As a long-standing consistent advocate for human rights, the Australian Labor Party believes that these arrangements must continue to be upheld. We will now move to matter number 15 in the name of Senator Waters. Mr President, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 15, standing in my name for today, relating to violence against women and the 26 women that have already been killed by violence this year, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. What statement? Leave is granted for one minute. The Morrison government has taken action against the scourge of violence against Australian women. The government is making the single biggest ever investment of $328 million to the next national action plan to reduce violence against women and children, which is focused on prevention, frontline services and emergency accommodation. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can we move to matter number 18 in the name of Sen Senator Hanson Young? Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Before I move my motion, I'd just like to add the name of Senator Farrell to the motion. That's acceptable. So added. Senator. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 18, standing in my name and the name of Senator Farrell, relating to the terrible decision in South Australia of the privatisation of our trains and trams, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. While the matter at hand is solely a state government responsibility, I would note that the South Australian Marshall Liberal Government has been explicitly clear about the fact that their announcement about the future operation of their tram and train services is not privatisation. It's an outsourcing measure. 
and the state government will retain control of services, including setting fares. I would also note that at present all other jurisdictions, all other jurisdictions outsource the provision of tram services. The Marshall government, like the Morrison government, is focused on delivering better infrastructure and services for all Australians. Senator Wong. Oh, Senator Hanson. Um, you seek leave to make a short statement, I, I gather? I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. One Nation opposes the privatisation of uh, taxpayers' assets. And in this case, when the, um, the, the motion here is relating to the South Australian Liberal government, it is not the place of this Senate to discuss whether they should be privatisation in a state government. <coughs> and uh, therefore, I will be abstaining from this vote. Senator Wong, were you seeking the call? Senator Wong. Well, um, I, uh, obviously the opposition is supporting the motion, but I, I, I did wonder if uh, Senator Dunham might explain the difference between privatising and outsourcing. Uh, Senator, <laughs> I, 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 we, we will move to put the motion. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Keneally, can we come to your matter number 19 now, please? Mr President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 19, standing in my name for today, relating to the establishment of a joint select committee, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Keneally. Mr President, I move the motion and seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. In a democracy balancing the public's right to know and protecting national security— Order, order in the rear corner. Sorry, stop the clock for Senator Keneally. I'll let you start again. In the rear corner. I know it's the first day back, but Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. In a democracy, balancing the public's right to know and protecting national security is a key responsibility of the government. Over the past six years, a culture of secrecy has pervaded in this government. The culture of secrecy is now undermining the Australians', Australians right to know and by right to know and freedom of the press. This government have responded to the AFP raids in June with complete silence and now wish to dictate the terms of a limited and restricted inquiry into their own mismanagement and apathy. If the government refuses to support this motion, they should stand up and explain their silence over the last three weeks and why they have failed in their guardianship of one of our most fundamental democratic rights. Senator Cormann. Much, uh, Mr. President, uh, the government. Uh, I seek leave to make a brief statement. Leave was granted for one minute. Uh, the government uh, will be opposing uh, this motion. The government is committed to ensuring our democracy strikes the right balance between a free press and keeping Australians safe. Two fundamental tenets of our democracy. That is why the Prime Minister has already written to the Leader of the Opposition, outlining an inquiry into law enforcement and intelligence powers on the freedom of the press. The government considers it is appropriate that the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security conduct that inquiry. The PJCIS is well placed to conduct this inquiry, given its responsibility for and experience in handling issues concerning national security uh, information um, and, uh, and the legislation. So, uh, Mr. President, uh, we call on all senators to join the government in opposing this motion. Senator McKim. Make a one-minute statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, President. Well, an inquiry into this matter by the Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence and Security is nowhere near good enough. No. It is a closed shop, secret. owned and run in secret behind closed doors by the major political parties in this place. The Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence and Security is actually part of the reason why we've ended up in the mess that we are in, where the AFP is raiding media organisations in this country with a chilling effect on reporting and the core duty of the media to hold power to account. This inquiry has got to be done openly, it's got to be done transparently, it's got to be done in the full view of the Australian people so they can have confidence we're getting to the bottom of the significant malaise in this country where rights are being continually eroded by scaring Australians and trying to make them understand that, in fact, their rights need to be given away and eroded. This inquiry needs to be done openly and we will not support it being done by JSCIS. Senator Hanson. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. 
Um, I can understand wanting accountability on an issue, but this appears to me, this, this uh, notice of motion is basically a stitch up because you want accountability. At no time has One Nation been approached to be part of the committee whatsoever. So you've actually done a stitch up here by putting in who you want on that committee that I don't believe it's going to be fair and balanced. So therefore, I will not be supporting this. Senator Patrick. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Mr President, the media is such an important element of our democracy. They, they couple uh, the, the citizens to our government. They inform the citizen, uh, citizenry. And uh, we've had some uh, tremendous, tremendous events or uh, very significant events taking place uh, a month ago uh, that most people are quite disturbed about. Uh, we understand that national security is important, but national security is a means to an end, and that end is to protect democracy. And uh, without a free press, there is no democracy. The question is: the motion moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. Question is motion number 19, the name of Senator Keneally be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 34, noes 34. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Can we move to matter? No, I ask senators to stay in the chamber for a likely imminent division. Can I ask senators to um, Senator Watt to come to matter number 20 in his name? I'll only ring the bells for one minute. For Senator Watt. Yeah, before. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would like to make a short statement. Should I do that now? Uh, seek move the leave motion, or move the motion first? Yep. Um, Mr. President, I ask that General Business knows of motion number 20, standing in my name for today, relating to the establishment of a select committee, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Watt. Mr. President, I move the motion. And you'd like to seek leave to make a short uh, statement? No, I'm okay now. Okay. Senator Dunningham. Mr. President, I seek leave, seek leave to make a short statement. Thank leave you. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Uh, the government opposes the formation of this uh, committee proposed to be led by Labor Green Alliance. The Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia is already an adequate forum to explore these issues and is expected to be resumed for this parliament. The duplication is only additional work for the committee staff. The question is that the motion number 20 in the name of Senator Watt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Okay, can we come to matter number 22 in the name of Senator Keneally? I'll give you a moment to get back to your seat. Mr President, I ask the General Business Notice of Motion number 22, standing in my name for today, proposing an order of production of documents concerning a report by the Independent Health Advice Panel be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Keneally. Mr. President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can we come to matter number 23 in the name of Senators Macdonald and McGrath? Senator Macdonald, I'll let you get back to your seat. Senator Macdonald. Leave to add a name, um, Senator Amanda Stoker, to this motion. So added. Senator Macdonald. I ask that general business notice of motion number 23 relating to the Carmichael Mine project be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Macdonald. I move the motion standing in my name in the names of Senator McGrath and Senator Stoker. Senator Dunningham. 
Mr President, I seek leave to make a short leave statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. The government supports this motion and continues to support the opening of the Galilee Basin and the thousands of jobs it will deliver for central and northern Queensland. Senator Waters. Senator, the Greens will not be supporting You're this motion. Leave to make a short I am sorry. My apologies. I'm seeking leave to leave make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, President. The Greens will not be supporting this motion because the Carmichael mine is not the way to deliver jobs for regional Queensland. What it will deliver is more support to a tax-dodging multinational coal company who have said they want to automate this project from pit to port. So more robots, and if there are any workers, then they'll be suffering from black lung disease, which is back in Queensland, as you well know, and starting to kill coal mining workers. Not to mention the fact that half of the reef has already been killed from climate change, which is driven and turbocharged by coal. We can have jobs in the regions, we can have prosperity, we can keep the lights on, and we can save the planet if we actually fund renewable energy projects rather than coal projects. And it's disappointing to see this old drum being banged by a party that purports to represent farmers who are having their livelihoods and their water trashed by fossil fuels. Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, Mr President, I am appalled that the Greens would take this uh, opportunity to deride the coal miners of Queensland and New South Wales and indeed the world. Black lung is a function of poor management, not a function of coal. And so we need to make sure that the truth is being told in this chamber because black lung, lung will only be eradicated again if the truth is told and the science is, is followed. Question is motion number 23 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 23 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 56, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Carr, could we come to your matters, number 24 and then 25? Senator Carr. Thank you, Mr President. I ask the General Business Notice of Motion number 24, standing in my name for today, relating to the Australian Academy of Science, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Carr. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Carr, could we come to motion number 25, please? Thank you, Mr President. I ask the General Business Notice of Motion number 25 standing in my name for today relating to the Australian Academy for the Humanities be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Carr. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now could we deal with matter number 26? Se Senator Gallagher. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion Number 26. Oh, I have to move it first. I move um, General Business Notice of Motion Number 26, standing in Senator Wong's name today. Uh, I'll first ask: Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll take it, Senator Gallagher, that you've moved the motion, and I'm you're now going to seek right. to amend it. Sorry. Yes. Go for your life. Thank you. I seek to leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion Number 26, standing in Senator Wong's name for today, proposing an order for the production of documents concerning the Prime Minister's statement of ministerial standards before asking that it be taken as formal. We've done the others. So um, <laughs> the the amendment. Uh, you're given leave now to move to amend the motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I amend the motion by omitting paragraph 1D. And I ask that the amended motion be taken as a formal motion. So, is there any objection to the amended motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Gallagher, I'll take it that you've moved the motion earlier. Thank you. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Pratt, could we come to your matter number 27, please? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the General Business Notice of Motion number 27, standing in my name for today, relating to energy prices, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Pratt. Mr. President, I move the motion. The question is, uh, Senator Dunningham, you said you can leave? Yes, I'm seeking leave. Leave is granted motions. for one minute. Thank you very much. Uh, the government has taken action to ensure Australians have affordable gas. Uh, we were the first government to establish a gas export control framework. The Prime Minister has renewed the agreement with the East Coast LNG exporters to ensure gas for the domestic market. Both AEMO and the ACCC found these actions reduced gas prices and assured supply. Since early 2017, the spot price of gas in eastern Australia has fallen 20 per cent. The only way to ensure long-term supply is to develop new gas reserves. It was the federal Labor government that allowed gas export projects in Gladstone to go ahead. Labor's then energy spokesperson, Mark Butler, Mr Mark Butler, admitted everyone knew there was going to be an impact on prices, and yet they did nothing. Senator Waters. Thanks, Mr President. I did stand before. I hope I haven't missed the window. I seek leave to move amendments this general business notice of motion number 27. They've been circulated in the anything chamber. Can, anything can be done by leave. Um, is Senator Waters granted leave to um, move to amend the motion? This is Senator Watts energy prices motion. Okay, so I'm going to take it that leave is granted for you to move the amendment. Thank you, President. I move the amendments um, as circulated in my okay. name in the chamber. All right, so I'm going to now put Senator Waters' amendment to the motion. Those in favour of Senator Waters' amendment to the motion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is, the amendment moved by Senator Waters to the motion moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to? The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point to Senator Seawitt Teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart Teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes, nine, noes, 55. The matter is resolved in the negative. We now move to considering the motion as moved by Senator Pratt. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. The division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
lock the doors. I'm going to give the whips a moment. The question is that the motion number 27 in the name of Senator Pratt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 41. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, with your leave, I've been asked to deal with motion number 30 next, in the name of Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 30, standing, <coughs> excuse me, standing in my name for today, um, relating to the uh, potential breach of the ministerial standards by Ministers uh, Taylor and Frydenberg be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Gallagher. I seek leave to move an amendment to general business notice of motion number 30, standing in the name of Senator Waters mm -hmm. relating to the attendance of a minister. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I'm, thank you, Mr President. I move that the motion be amended by omitting in paragraph 1D 12:20 p.m. on the 22nd of July 2019, and substituting 12 p.m. on the 23rd of July 20, oh, sorry, 2019, 2019. Um, and this just um, recognises that general business notice of motion um, sets up a time for the minister to attend the Senate on another matter at the same time as is proposed by this motion. So this amendment seeks to simply change the time for the explanation but to the following day at the start of business. So the question is that uh, that amendment to the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. So now we move to the, the amended motion now in the name of Senator Waters. Uh, those in support of that motion say aye. aye. The contrary no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. I'm looking at the whips. Yep.
Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters as amended be agreed to. Number 30. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes and Senator Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 36, noes 32. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Dodson, can we move to your matter number 28? There are two matters remaining, Senators. <coughs> Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, President. I, uh, I ask that the uh, motion General Business Notice of Motion Number 28, standing in my name for today, relating to pensioners' deeming rates, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dodson. I uh, move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to, Senator Dunham. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Uh, there is an appropriate process through which uh, changes to deeming rates are considered, and this process is currently underway. The question is the motion moved by Senator Dodson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters, could we come to your matter number 29? Thank you, President. I withdraw general business notice of motion number 29, standing in my name for today, relating to restoration of bills to the notice paper. Thank you, Senator Waters. Clark, is leave required for that at this point? No, it's not. Okay. That concludes the discovery of formal business. Thank you, Senators. We will return to business, and I believe I should call on the clerk. Government business order of the day relating to the Treasury Laws Amendment tax relief so working Australians keep more of their money bill 2019, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Waters, were you in continuation or no. have you concluded? You no, have I concluded. Wasn't All right, well, I will, before I call Senator Carr, I'll ask senators to take seats or clear a path for Senator Carr to resume his seat. Senator Carr. Oh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The Reserve Bank has called for a stimulus package uh, from this government to counter what many fear is a looming economic slowdown. Some have claimed that these tax bills will act as a stimulus. Uh, I think it's difficult to see. It's the bulk of these measures, and the great bulk, particularly the costing in excess of $90 billion will not come in for another six years. Little attention, however, has been paid to, to the causes of the slowdown in the global economy. 
I intend to go further by speaking about what has been missing from the nation's conversation on, for some time. And I refer here to the trade war that has been raging between our principal strategic ally, the United States, and our principal trading partner in the People's Republic of China. There appears to be a kind of temporary truce, or it's said there is. But the same thing was said in Argentina around the previous G20 meeting. What we really know is in fact that the President of the United States has in fact launched his re-election campaign. What we see here is a circumstance where the United States party political interests are being pursued, which is a very different thing from the national interests of Australia. We don't have any indication, given the conversations that followed the recent G20 meeting, that there's any permanent resolution of the major differences between Washington and Beijing. And rightly, this is a dispute that affects us much more sharply than these question around these particular tax cuts and essentially what won't be, uh, which we'll, we will not see uh, the benefits of for uh, six years. What we know is that both President Trump and President Xi have made it clear that they don't feel bound by the rules of the international trading system. They don't uh, see that the international trading system built up by Bretton Woods is any more applicable. So it's obviously an end of an era and the beginning of much less certainty about the future. It's strange that in a trade-dependent country like Australia, there has been so little attention or public debate about the consequence of that measure. And it's quite clear that we as a nation are deeply embroiled in that trade war. When we look at the fine print of the conversations that have followed out of Osaka, we know that the Australian farmers may well be the victim of so-called concessions that Americans have been seeking. We know from the comments made by various trade officials that the Chinese have agreed to increase the imports of American agricultural products. We've also heard, and repeatedly heard, that the Americans are upset about the tariff exemptions of our steel and aluminium. And because of the tariff exemptions that have been granted for those companies, this is a matter of some particular significance. We know that Australian companies are now being asked to moderate their sales to appease American anxieties. We know that there are renewed threats to impose tariffs on Australian production. We also know that Australian education exports to China are suffering. The Department of Home Affairs notified <coughs> universities in April that the number of visa applications for Chinese students was no longer increasing. Now, Vice Chancellors have told me on a number of occasions, expressed the view that they hope the government knows what it's doing. Australian tourist figures also point to that industry being a casualty of the tensions. It's reported in Chinese overseas travel intentions by the UBS Investment Bank found that there was a sharp drop in the number of people planning to visit Australia. Official data shows that China's imports of Australian coking coal in May is down from 40, by 49.3 per cent. 
on the previous month. And in February, there were eight ships carrying Australian thermal coal worth 120 million kept offshore of Chinese ports. We now know that Australian uh, it takes uh, three times as long to get to customs and unloading clearances for Australian coal than it did previously. Many believe that this is retaliation for Australia's exclusion of the Chinese telecommunications companies Huawei for their supply of equipment for the 5G mobile network. Now, Huawei is the world's what, number one telecommunications supplier and number two telephone manufacturer. It's become a potent symbol of everything that is at stake in this trade war, a symbol of China's pride in its advancing manufacturing capabilities, a symbol of the US fears about emerging Chinese technological and economic dominance. Huawei has become an object of deep suspicion in some Western intelligence agencies, a suspicion that's led to the ban which was imposed by the Turnbull government in terms of the 5G network in this country. Now, President Trump on several times has however, suggested that Huawei's access to US markets is in fact a security threat. The US Commerce Department has placed Huawei on the so-called entity list of firms US companies cannot do business without official permission, which of course amounts to a prohibition on the export of US technology to Huawei. This is a huge threat to Huawei's business, for no technology firm is entirely self-sufficient. The supply chain used by Huawei and its Western competitors are highly specialised but globally connected. The restrictions placed on Huawei threaten the business of those firms too, of course. President Trump has said at the G20 that Huawei, however, <coughs> would be able to resume dealing with some US companies, but it would remain on the entities list. Right. President Trump also said that he indicated that he would be willing to make concessions on Huawei in I'm pursuit sorry, of the Senator trade deal. Sorry, Senator Carr. I, um, I think we have a point of order. Senator Wish Wilson. Yeah, point of order, uh, Acting Deputy President. I, I have enormous respect for Senator Carr, and I, so I don't ask this lightly, but a point of order is on whether this bill we're debating at the moment is a Treasury Laws Amendment, the tax tax cuts plan, or am I missing Sen something? Senator Wishwilson, there is no point of order. The second, second readings are very far and wide furthermore, and ranging, and if, so and Senator the car, And if the Senator had actually listened, the whole point of this was to deal with the fact that this is a bill to go over six years to deal with the future of this country's economic position when more fundamental questions, if you had been listening, Senator, would have appreciated the fundamental problem, the fundamental problem about dealing with a global downturn rather than trying to play these games on such a measure as a six-year delay in a tax measure was much more serious question for us to deal with. And instead of uh, playing what I might say semantic uh, procedural points, I would suggest you might pay a little more attention to what's actually said. So I might also draw your attention to uh, the, the inconsistency between saying that one of our major, major electronics company is on one hand a security threat, on the other hand the concessions can be made if the right trade deal can be made in the interest of the United States, irrespective of the consequences for everyone else, is a matter that does require attention. And so what we have is of course the dual messages that are being presented to us. What we have is the American president saying that it's possible for Huawei would be included a trade deal, and it was said a vital deal, and I could imagine Huawei being possibly included in some form as, some, as part of that trade deal, he told CB, CNBS in May of this year. He also said that Huawei is something that is very dangerous. You have to look at the way in which it's been done as a, from a security standpoint, from a military standpoint, it's very dangerous. Now, the claims that are being made about these issues of the American trade interests and the security interests are quite incompatible. They make no sense at all. Mr Trump, of course, would know that it can't be credible to promise stop for the Chinese to stop spying any more than it's credible for the United States to promise that they won't do the same. 
The President's remarks make sense only if they're interpreted in an entirely different way. If this security threat was a bluff, it's an attempt to put pressure on the Chinese to relent in what is an escalating trade war. And it's important to understand what that consequence would be. What we now have is a situation where the Chinese are developing independent operating systems for their technologies, and we know that the consequence of that may well be profound. This is because the goods that are being produced by American companies may well be excluded. So what we saw last weekend at uh, Osaka that Mr Trump's announcement of a partial relaxation on these issues suggests to me that if we are to talk about a global tech trade war, we need to not get that confused with the bluff and bluster that's being presented as, in, as party political advantage by the United States, particularly when it has such enormous consequences for our national interests. What we have, of course, is a world-based, a, a, a rules-based international order which has traditionally been guaranteed by the United States. That's now being abandoned. What we now have to face is that the fact that Australia has to develop a much more independent position on these matters. And what we also have to face the fact that when we're talking about the long-term interests of this country, there has to be a serious public debate about what those options include. We have to have a much deeper understanding of the implications of this dispute between the, this antagonism between our principal strategic ally and our principal trading partner. Because there's something that far too many people in this country have shied away from. In the election campaign, this issue surfaced only once. There's some colourful language uh, brought forward by the former Prime Minister Paul Keating. The language he used to describe our intelligence chief, I think um, Mr Keating himself has now said, was a bit unfortunate. But the deeper point he made, I think, was absolutely correct. What is the consequence of us permanently alienating the Chinese? What happens in a trade war between China and Australia and how much in terms of the international economic position, what is the consequences for the living standards of the people of this country? And I think that's something that we need to consider and have a proper discussion about. Our position is not to be subservient to any country whether it be the People's Republic of China or the United States. Certainly it's not our position to be subservient to the demands of the United States presidency, who is seeking re-election and acting in a manner consistent with a, poli a politician seeking re-election rather than developing the strategic interests of his own country. Now, I'm not arguing that we have a case here for allowing, for suggesting that we don't, that we don't pursue the banning in terms of Huawei. What I am saying is that we're entitled to know what the reasons are. We're entitled to know what the consequences are in terms of that engagement. If we're going to argue a case, which I see too often in this country, that we can't deal with any particular Chinese company because the senior members of that uh, company are members of the Chinese Communist Party, or that they've had some former military connection, then I think we have to have a deeper understanding of the way in which the economy and <coughs> government works. 
I am not calling for the ban on Huawei to be withdrawn. I am calling for it to be properly explained. This is a matter that ought to be subject of proper national debate. There's a delicate line for Australia to walk between our two global economic superpowers in terms of the United States and the People's Republic of China. The views taken in this region are not the views taken in Europe. That has to be explained. The views taken by the United States President at one forum are not the views taken <coughs> at all forums. That has to be explained. We have to have an understanding of the consequences of ignoring the Chinese understanding of their historic memory. The memory of the humiliation imposed by Western powers, particularly in regard to trading matters, the trading concessions from the 19th century. Chinese leaders, we have to understand, are determined not to repeat that humiliation of that period. And their demands in regard to lifting people out of poverty have to be appreciated and understand the motivations behind the development of the Belt and Road Initiative and the Made in China 2025 initiatives. If President Trump's rhetoric about there's any guide, Made in China 2025, is more about keeping American interest at the forefront in that regard than it is about understanding Chinese attitudes <clears throat> about the economic development of their country. That's not to say the United States have its own made in the USA policy for some time. Our question is, if we are talking about the long-term interests of this country, what do we say about made in Australia? The recognition that the United States has many trade restrictive policies which actually prevent Australians from participating fully in a rules-based global order. I take, for instance, the Jones Act, which mm. requires ships procured by the US Navy must be built in the United States. And the situation we've had with Austal. which of course has had to establish its own enterprises in the United States. And the extraordinary capacity that that's led to, I might say. It's a pity we weren't able to use them much more effectively here. The economic policies of the previous empires, and I think here about the way in which the British and the Dutch have behaved, appear to be to be drawn upon by what President Trump's doing. Policies include high tariffs, particularly on manufactured goods, sort of mercantilism, uh, constraining trade choices for various colonies and <coughs> associated entities, seeking to monopolise access to certain markets, forbidding trade to be carried out on foreign ships. These are characteristics we're seeing re-emerging in the current international debate. These variations, of course, with modern technology mean that the dispute we're seeing, which has, I say, profound consequences for the future development of this country, are exactly what's emerging in the US-China trade dispute. Because in, in 2019, we don't ban goods being carried on foreign ships, as the British Imperial Navigation Acts used to. You do try to ban exchanges in the cyber economy, exchanges between your own tech firms and tech firms of your rivals. Except in 2019, in an independent global economy, it's much harder to do that in the past. So in 2019, consequences of miscalculations, however, can be <coughs> catastrophic. It's what our principal ally might want us to do and what our best interest requires are not the same thing. And so a debate on the taxation bill that looks forward six years needs to be seen in the context of what's actually going on in the world at the moment. Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Wish Wilson. 
Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. This bill we're debating in the Senate today is very likely to be the most significant piece of legislation that we see in this 46th Parliament. And the bill and the legislation poses a very important question. What is this parliament and every senator within this parliament, what is their vision for the future of Australia? Now, I've said in here often that budget times are a time for a government to show the Australian people very clearly what their vision for the nation is, what their priorities are. And when we legislate budgets, we need to know a very clear understanding of the priorities of the Australian people, the people who elected us here, and of course our individual beliefs in the future of the nation. And this poses a $158 billion question. Now, a parliament does much to shape a country when it decides how to tax and spend how to raise the money and where to allocate it, based on those important priorities. And we know that everything we do in here is a mixture of politics and policy. Sometimes we certainly don't get the balance right. And one thing I did agree with from the Governor-General's speech just a couple of days ago in this chamber was that politics should be a contest of ideas. And I don't think there's any senator in here that disagrees that politics is a contest of ideas. We should have robust and healthy debate, especially on a piece of legislation that is going to spend $158 billion of taxpayers' money, on a piece of legislation that is looking to completely restructure the Australian tax system the biggest reform in this country for nearly 40 years. We should have robust debate. And if politics is a contest of ideas, I can say to you, from the time I've spent in this chamber this morning, there doesn't seem to be much of a contest. <clears throat> there does not seem to be much of a contest. Your vote is your voice in this place. And if you believe in something fundamentally, if you believe in something philosophically, it's a privilege to be in this job. And your job, in my humble opinion, is to come in here and speak truth to that belief, to that philosophy, to what you believe in, and to vote accordingly. I know that my party has been consistent for the last 18 months since this government decided that the only economic idea they had was to give tax cuts to Australians, tax cuts that overwhelmingly benefited wealthy Australians. I know my party has been entirely consistent. I ask all senators in here to be totally clear about what the future holds for the Australian people if we legislate these tax cuts today. Within the context of our economy, what's happening in the Australian economy at the moment is extraordinary. Without any exaggeration, the economic environment in which we're making this decision is unheralded within the life of the Federation of Australia. And let, let me explain why these are truly exceptional times. Interest rates are at record lows. Just two days, days ago, the Reserve Bank cut the cash rate to 1 per cent. And they're talking of going even lower. The yield on 10-year bonds is now down to 1.25 per cent. You'd have to go back a long, long way, even in other countries, to see interest rates this low. 
And while many mortgage holders, I understand, are, are pleased with that, by anyone's measure, it is not the sign. It is not the sign of a healthy economy. Far from it. Wages growth is also, if not the lowest it has been since the Second World War, very close to it. Despite continuing heroic projections by Treasury, and I've been there in all the estimates over recent years and asked questions and heard the government's assumptions, people's wages simply aren't growing. And any relationship between productivity growth and low wages has long since vanished. Inflation is at the lowest level it has been using the currently accepted measure of measuring inflation. And productivity growth, we're all aware, is also languishing. Now, this is a global phenomenon. And it irks me that this government and this parliament, if it passes these tax cuts, has failed to properly respond to the message of the global financial crisis and has failed to overthrow the shackles of neoliberalism. Now, and what's this government's response to the most exceptional of economic circumstances? Which in any sane world, any sane world would signal and flag that troubled times, stormy seas are ahead. What we have here today is a tax plan, cooked up weeks before an election, weeks before an election, on the merest whiff of a surplus, on some very rubbery, very dodgy assumptions that most of this country's experienced economic commentators were very quick to point out, that will hamstring future governments and which overwhelmingly will benefit the richest Australians. It will provide an impost on any future government be it Labor or Liberal or any combination, it will provide shackles. Now, Grattan recently commented on the highly unusual step of seeking to lock in a series of income tax cuts over the next year, six years and beyond. We all know why this budget is highly unusual, Acting Deputy President. This was an election budget. What was also highly unusual was the government releasing a budget and then a week later calling an election. This was designed to lock in as many votes for the Liberal Party and National Party as possible, not just at this election but into the future. This was an election budget. And for those who believe this government has a mandate for this combined chambers of this parliament to pass this legislation, think again. The government doesn't have a mandate in the Senate. The Australian people made it very clear with how they voted that this government did not get a majority in the upper house of the Australian parliament in the Australian Senate. The government does not have a mandate in the Australian Senate for this legislation. But you wouldn't know that. You wouldn't know that based on the flaccid response we've seen today from the crossbench and from the Labor Party in support of these tax cuts. You would think there's some kind of imperative to get these tax cuts passed this week. I'll tell you what the imperative is. It's a political imperative. The government wants a win in the first week of the 46th parliament. That's it spending $158 billion. Why are we rolling over and having our tummy tickled in this place? Why did the Senate refuse to send this off, to do its job, to scrutinise the legislation and, if need be, amend or reject this legislation and send it back to the other place? It is not our job to support the political imperative of the Liberal National Party in the Australian Senate. It is not our job. Our job as senators, what we were elected to do, is to scrutinise 
to improve, to amend or reject. We're not even having the chance to do that. We're not even having the chance to do that. What's most dangerous about this legislation, apart from the fact that it locks us in, it locks future governments in to find $158 billion, is the impact it will have on government spending on essential services. Every economist and economic report I have read has pointed out the dire consequences of maintaining budget surpluses and taking $158 billion out of the budget to give to high income earners in this country. Every economist worth their salt has pointed this out. The Grattan Institute has said they expect on their model that government expenditure growth will be the lowest it has been since the 1970s once we pass these tax cuts. What that means in easy translation is cuts to schools, <coughs> cuts to hospitals, cuts to the social safety net. And believe me, if you think I'm making this up, have a look at this mob's record in the last five years. Remember the zombie budget cuts? Well, at, at, least, at least that Prime Minister got it in the neck. They will do it again. They will have no choice. In fact, I strongly suspect that according to the neoliberal model that we know the LNP operates on, this is a deliberate design. A deliberate design to bleed the carcass so there is no choice in future but to cut government expenditure on the most vulnerable people in this country. Are we going to, as a chamber, allow the short-term, self-interested, dangerous political imperative of this government to go unscrutinised? The Greens will do what we can today to be the opposition in the Australian Parliament. We will continue to fight for our principles and for what the people of Australia elected us to do. The furphy that somehow these tax cuts are going to stimulate a, an economy running out of puff, very close to going underwater, needs to be thoroughly debunked. Now, I don't have any dispute that low income rebates, in other words, rebates to low income earners in this country, will have an impact on economic growth, acting Deputy President. We know that low-income Australians have a higher marginal propensity to consume, which means they will spend money that is given to them by the government, especially if they're at the very poor end of the spectrum and on Newstart, which my colleague Senator Seawitt made such an impassioned plea to raise. But we know from all our models that money going to the richest people in this country, acting deputy president, Higher income earners have a lower marginal propensity to consume. They tend to save what they're given, and that means spending more on investment properties, more on other investments, and so on and so forth. And that will not stimulate the economy. And it is black and white that 50 per cent of the benefit of these tax cuts will go to the wealthiest 20 per cent of Tasmanians. And I want to say this point to my colleague, Senator Lambie from Tasmania, who seems to be flagging she will support these tax cuts because she believes they're good for Tasmania. In the Prime Minister's <coughs> electorate alone, there are more high-income earners on over $180,000 who, as I said, stand the most to benefit from these tax cuts. There are more high-income earners alone just in the Prime Minister's electorate than there are in the entire state of Tasmania. If we know that these tax cuts are going to benefit the wealthy and it's questionable they're going to have a stimulatory effect on the economy, <coughs> why is Senator Lambie supporting a plan, a vision for this country 
that is not going to deliver for her home state of Tasmania. If Senator Lambie wanted to stand up for Tasmanians and for Tasmanian battlers, she would join the Greens and campaign on a raise to Newstart. She would join the Greens and campaign on taking that $150 billion of public money and investing in long-term infrastructure, which will create jobs, will increase productivity and will invest in the future of our children and the future of our nation. That's what we should be spending $150 billion on. But you know what? There is no debate in this polity, in this country, in the media around this debate and in this chamber on how we should spend $150 billion to the betterment of our nation. There is no debate. And I've got to say, I am still at a loss for words, as you can tell, on why, why we are just waving this through, why we are rolling over. Now, I understand the Labor battle tank has taken a couple of direct hits in recent times and that it's, it's battered and it's tattered. But we need an opposition in this 46th parliament to this government and their dangerous ideological agenda. The Greens are happy to be the opposition in this building, but we can't beat this government on our own. And it seems as though that battle tank is stuck in reverse at the moment, and Labor supporters all around this country can hear the grinding of those gears, and it's not a sound they want to hear. They want to see the Labor Party stand up for its principles. Your vote is your voice in this Senate. And this afternoon or this evening, when it, however long we're here, the Labor Party will have a chance to vote down the third stage of this tax cuts. And if that fails, if the bill's not split and that fails, they can vote down these dangerous tax cuts packages and we can go in this parliament and put forward Order. alternatives Senator for the Australian time. People. Uh, it's 2 p.m. Questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Can the minister guarantee that the government's deal with Central Alliance will deliver domestic gas prices of $7 per gigajoule or less, as demanded by Senator Patrick? The Min leader of the government, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. What I can guarantee is that, as a result of the decision of uh, Central Alliance senators and Senator Lambie and Senator Bernardi, of course. Millions of hard-working Australians will get to keep more of their own money. They get to keep more of their order, own order, money. Senator Cormann, of course, order. Fantastic. Twelve seconds in, and our first point of order, Senator Wong. I asked about gas prices. Um, and gas prices. And the, 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 will the, the minister question... guarantee that the prime minister's deal with Central Alliance will deliver domestic gas prices of seven dollars per gigajoule or less? As demanded by Senator Patrick. Um, I, I will How many times has Order. Katie beaten you? Order. I, I, I will allow. The question was specific. It also referred to a deal. I will allow the minister more than 12 seconds to get to the specifics of the question. I believe he's being directly relevant at the moment. Senator Cormann. Uh, Mr. President, it's good to be back. Uh, good to be back. <laughs> now, as I was saying, as I was saying. Uh, as a result of uh, the decision by uh, Senators uh, Griff and Patrick and Lambie and Bernardi to support the government's plan for lower income taxes for all working Australians, millions of Australians will get to keep more of their own money. And that is going to be good for them and it's going to be good for the economy, it's going to be good for jobs and it's of course what the Australian people voted for. Now, it is of course well understood that the government has got a long-standing commitment a long-standing policy commitment to bring down the price of electricity, including by boosting the supply of gas into the domestic market. And Senator Canavan has done an outstanding job, together with uh, Minister Taylor, uh, in, in helping to bring that about. And I think that Senator Canavan would be able to tell you that gas prices today uh, across the East Coast uh, market are actually uh, substantially lower than they were at their peak. Uh, and of course, uh, our policy measures, our policy measures, our policy measures so far have, have had a significant impact. But of course, we want to do more. We want to do more. And let me tell you, like while the Labour Party, you know what the Labour Party was doing while, while Senator Patrick and Senator Griff were talking to us about public policy, while Senator Lambie was advocating uh, public policy positions with us. You know what the Labour Party was doing? They were drafting an amendment to change the title of the bill. They were drafting. 
That is the substantial policy work of the Australian Labor Party after the 2019 election, after the Australian people firmly rejected your high-taxing agenda, your politics of envy, because they know it would make Australia weaker and would make Australians poorer. Uh, here you are. Your, your, most substantial, your most substantial contribution to the policy debate is to come up with an amendment to change the title of the bill. Order. That is just ridiculous. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you. I note no guarantee. Uh, Senator Patrick has also indicated that the arrangement would require, and I quote, a range of measures including limits on future gas exports and greater transparency on existing deals, end quote, including, and I quote, a gas reservation policy. Can the minister outline how the gas reservation will apply to current and prospective projects and what impact it will have on gas prices? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, what I can confirm for Senator Wong is that today the Senate will have the opportunity uh, to uh, keep faith with the verdict of the Australian people at the last election, and that is by passing income tax relief for all working Australians. Senator in Wong, on a point Second. of order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. I we we had the entire primary question where he did not answer the question on gas prices. Are you going to allow him, Mr. Senator, President, to avoid it again? Senator Cormann, this was Thank a you. very specific uh, supplementary question that only referred to gas prices or gas policy. I'd ask you, I remind you of the question. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, it's a matter of public record that uh, the government has got a long standing policy commitment to bring down the price of electricity, including by boosting uh, the supply of gas into the domestic market. It's also a matter of public record that the government has been engaged in positive and constructive conversations with relevant crossbench senators. Those crossbench senators who wanted to pursue uh, issues with us, raise issues with us. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have, we Senator have... Cormann, Senator Wong, on a point of order. The point of order is direct relevance. I asked about the gas reservation policy. The government has agreed. Um, and Senator, Senator Wong, the minister is also, the, the, the minister's also entitled to address the preamble to the question that was slightly more general in nature, quoting Senator Patrick, and I consider him to be directly relevant to that part of the question at this stage. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, as I, as I, as I was saying, Mr. President, uh, we have got a long-standing track record and a very comprehensive agenda to bring down the cost of electricity, including by boosting supply of gas into the domestic market. We have, we have of course, discussed that agenda uh, with relevant crossbench senators who were interested in engaging with us constructively and positively, while the Labor Party was drafting amendments to change the title of the income Order, tax uh, Senator reduction Coleman, bill. Senator time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How will the government meet Senator Patrick's demand to deliver domestic gas prices of $7 per gigajoule or less? Can the minister guarantee the price cut will flow through to consumers? And if so, can the minister indicate what price reduction consumers will see? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Firstly, I let uh, Senator Patrick talk for himself. What I will say on behalf of the government, what I will say on behalf of the government, that we have a long-standing commitment to bring down electricity prices, including uh, through sensible reform, including through sensible reforms uh, to policy settings to ensure we can boost the uh, supply of gas into the domestic uh, electricity market. And that's that's something that. Uh, is a matter of uh, record, and indeed, uh, Senator uh, Canavan is always, always exploring uh, new policy options to ensure that we can bring uh, electricity prices down further. Uh, he, he is always looking for ways. He is always looking for ways to do more. And indeed, it's been uh, really good to actually engage with some constructive and positive uh, senators who are keen to uh, who are keen to work with the government to deliver better policy outcomes for the nation. Instead of instead of the uh, you know politics, the political tactics of the Labour Party. Instead of the political tactics of the Labour Party, uh, which is uh, to move an amendment to change the title of the bill. I mean, I wonder how long that would have taken them to take that through court. Order. Okay. Senator Cormann, time for the answer has expired. Order. Order. Senator Stoker. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills and Small and Family Business. How do the results of the Australian labour force figures for the month of May demonstrate how the Morrison government is getting on with the job of delivering for the Australian people? The Minister, Senator Cash. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Mr. President, and again, I thank Senator Stoker for her question. But in particular, can I congratulate Senator Stoker for the great work order, she did on the ground on in left. the uh, election to deliver so many seats to the LNP? Order. And how I say that compares with the efforts that Senator Watt made during the election. I believe every seat that Senator Watt visited, Senator Watt, you actually lost. A lot of people owe their 
lack of being here Order. to Senator Watt. But, Mr President, we are a job-creating government. We have put in place since 2013 the right policy framework so that employers out there, the Australian economy, can create jobs. In fact, since we were elected in 2013, Senator Stoker, the economy has now created 1.4 million jobs, Mr President. And as you know, we said we'd create a million jobs when we were first elected in 2013, within five years. Because of the policies we put in place, we delivered that commitment ahead of schedule. And Mr President, in relation to the 1.4 million jobs, over 60 per cent of those jobs they have been full-time jobs. Mr President, the unemployment rate in Australia as at May was 5.2 per cent. When Labor last left office a while ago now, it was 5.7 per cent. And Mr President, the economy continues to create jobs because of the policies that the coalition government have put in place. In May of this year, we actually saw employment in Australia reach an all-time high of almost 12 million 900,000 Australians in work. We also saw, Mr President, though, confidence in the jobs market being the highest ever, with 66 per cent as the participation rate. It is because of the policies of the coalition Order. government. Senator Cash, that time for the quick answer has expired. Senator Stoker, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for that excellent news. Are there any policy risks that the Minister is aware of that could jeopardise these record figures? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr President, I think the attitude of those in the chamber today on the other side says it all. They, even though the Australian people voted overwhelmingly on the 18th of May, as the Leader of the Government in the Senate has stated, to endorse the tax plan that we took to the election, those on the other side continue to oppose it. They remain the greatest risks to jobs in this country. They took to the election a plan to tax Australians a further $387 billion. Imagine the effect on jobs, Mr President, if that plan had been allowed to go through. But it isn't. It won't, because the Australian people voted against those opposite, the Labor Party's plan for higher taxes, and they endorsed the Coalition's plan in full all three stages of our policy to give Australians back more of their own money. Senator Stoker, a final supplementary question. What action is the Morrison government taking to continue to grow our economy and ensure that more Australians are given the opportunity to find a job? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, we have made a commitment to the Australian people that under the Morrison government over the next five years we will put in place the policies, we will build on the policies we already have in place to ensure that the economy can deliver a further 1.25 million jobs. That builds on the one million job commitment that we made in 2013. And we'll do that, Mr President, by ensuring that, and we will, returning the budget to surplus, something those on the other side haven't done for, I think, Senator Cormann, 20 years two decades, will also Mr. President, deliver a record infrastructure spend of in excess of $100 billion. Why? Because we understand that when you invest in infrastructure, you allow the economy to create jobs. And in my portfolio of small and family business, Mr. President, we extended the instant asset write-off so that an additional 22,000 businesses are now covered. Order. Again, Senator we're Cash, all about time getting— time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The government wants to spend $95 billion over the medium term to give tax cuts in 2024, five years away. The Grattan Institute states that in order to get spending levels required to fund the tax cuts, and I quote, real spending growth would need to average around 1.3 per cent per annum over the decade or 1.8 per cent if the economy performs as strongly as Treasury projects. Either way, this is substantially lower than any previous government has achieved. Minister, what spending will the government cut in order to fund its tax cuts? 
Leader of the Government, Senator Th thank Corbyn. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, that claim by the Grattan Institute is wrong. Uh, it was, of course, it featured during the campaign. It was comprehensively discredited during the campaign. Comprehensively discredited by the during the campaign. In fact, in fact, it was comprehensively discredited by nothing else than the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook, which made very clear, which made very clear that the uh, medium-term projections showing a surplus all the way through, and the medium-term projections which fa factor in a record funding for hospitals and schools and infrastructure and all of the other essential services that that is said that our the cost of the tax cuts is factored in to that forward trajectory based on a no policy change scenario a no policy scenario a no policy change scenario means there are no assumptions of future cuts, as you call it, no assumptions of future savings uh, enshrined in our budget bottom line whatsoever. I mean, this was comprehensively discredited. And I might, just say, I might just say the only thing that was missing from Senator Gallagher's question there, as she was talking about uh, $95 billion uh, from 2024-25, was the sneering pre-election reference to the top end of town, the top end of town. Because, of course, what the Labour Party did during the election, I wonder why that is. I wonder why you've dropped that. I wonder why you've dropped that. Because, you know, the, fund, the core foundation of your attack on our plan to deliver income tax relief for all working Australians is your attempt to perpetuate the politics of envy, class warfare, turning Australian against Australian. And you know what, you know what happened? The low-income Australians, hard-working, low-income Australians, working-class Australians, mortgage belt suburbs, voted strongly in favour of our plan because they know that it delivers better opportunity for them. And the modern Labour Party would do well to actually reflect why it is that their working class base turned against them. Because if you want to continue to run on a high taxing agenda and the politics of envy, when Australians are fundamentally aspirational, go right ahead. Go right ahead and let's, let's have this battle all the way to the next election. Go Order. to the next election Senator campaigning Corbyn, for higher taxes again. The answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, uh, a supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, real growth in health expenditure over the decade to 2016-17 was 4.5 per cent. Given that in order to pay for the $95 billion in tax cuts, the government must restrain health expenditure to just over 0.7 per cent per annum, what health spending will the government cut in order to fund its tax cuts in five years' time? Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Repeating a lie doesn't make it come true. Uh, our budget actually has substantial increases every year in funding for hospitals, for schools, for infrastructure, for all of the other essential services Australians rely on. And you know what? We have been able to accommodate uh, income tax relief for uh, hard-working Australians, hard Australians in a way that is fiscally responsible. And I mean, this question, you know why this question surprises me? Because in the, in the election, Labor said, oh, we want to have $387 billion in higher taxes because that is what the country needs, that's what the economy needs. Now they're saying we should have more tax cuts sooner. More tax cuts sooner. So, I mean, how is that going to add up? You actually, you want to bring, you want to bring tax cuts forward. Like, I mean, as if anyone believes that you actually believe in tax cuts. But how, how are you going to, how are you going to balance the budget with that? How are you going to pay for hospitals and schools when you do all of that? I mean, your, your position has got no credibility. You're all over the place. You've got more positions on tax than uh, in the Kama Sutra, quite frankly. I mean, this is, like, I mean, if, if we, if we stay here for Order. another week, Senator Please Cormann, stay. time for Please the answer. Stay. Order. 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 I'll... Senator, Senator Gallagher, final supplementary question. Thank you. We didn't need the visuals of that. But um, <laughs> my supplementary question is um, analysis undertaken by the Australian Financial Review reveals that spending will need to be cut by $40 billion a year by 2030 to pay for the tax cuts. So how will the government allocate the $40 billion a year in tax cuts required? Uh, th Senator th thank you very much, Mr President. So what we're getting now is uh, like reference to an article about the Grattan Institute study that was already widely discredited. I mean, you know, th this analysis is wrong. It is false. Uh, I mean, I will, I will send you a copy of the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook, which comprehensively uh, rejects this furphy, completely and comprehensively discredits this furphy. And, but in any event, like, so here you are. You're now saying that we should have more tax cuts sooner. More tax cuts sooner. So how is that going to work? I mean, you know, how are you going to make these numbers add up? I mean, here, the Labor Party is all over the place. Quite frankly, you should have long cut your losses. You should have long accepted the verdict of the Australian people. 
Australians voted for income tax relief yeah. for all working Australians, and they voted against the high, Labor's high taxing agenda, against Labor's high taxing agenda and the politics of envy. And you know what? And here they say, oh, there's more elections coming. Be our guest. You know what? You can go to the next election. No, you can go to the next election. Go your hardest, campaigning for higher taxes again. Be our guest. Go to the Australian Order. people. Tell families. Yet again, Wong, the Labor Party is the party for Wong, higher taxes. Senator Cormann, time for the answers expired. Senator Wong. Order. Order. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister. Minister, 717 jurisdictions across 16 countries have made a declaration that we are living in a climate emergency. The UK Parliament, indeed the UK Parliament led by a Conservative government, supported the declaration of a climate emergency and showed global leadership. So, Minister, how does your government justify having such pathetic pollution reduction targets, indeed only 16 per cent? When you take into account carryover credits, how do you how do you justify having targets that are completely inconsistent with keeping warming below 1.5 degrees, as set out in the Paris Agreement? The leader of the government, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. And I, I can't answer this question without noting uh, again and thanking the Greens again for having joined with the Liberal National Party senators in voting down. Uh, the carbon pollution reduction scheme uh, that, uh, the, that Senator Wong uh, sought to uh, introduce. And, and, and you know, I'm still, I, I mean, those of us on this side of the chamber continue to be grateful for your efforts to help us properly balance uh, environmental protection with economic responsibility. And that is, that is, of course, the way we approach these things. We are committed to effective action on climate change. When we came into government, we were running behind in terms of meeting our emissions reduction target signed on to in Kyoto. We're now running ahead of meeting that commitment. And we have a plan to meet our emissions reduction targets agreed to in Paris, but we will not take reckless and irresponsible decisions that would harm Australian families for no environmental benefit. Sending economic activity and jobs overseas, where for the same level of economic output emissions will be higher, does not help to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. That is just imposing, uh, gratuitously imposing a sacrifice on Australians to make ourselves feel better when we're actually making when we're actually hurting them for no purpose whatsoever. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. The UK have driven down pollution by 38 per cent since 1990. Ours has increased by 24 per cent over the same period. So here we are, a country of 25 million, contributing more to the breakdown of our climate than the UK population of 66 million. So, Minister, when you're looking at uh, the source of increasing emissions, let's take uh, the gas sector in particular. What are your plans to reduce pollution from the gas sector? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, you know what? Australia actually helps to reduce uh, emissions in the world by uh, exporting uh, clean energy, by exporting cleaner coal, by exporting gas, uh, by displacing, of course, uh, you know, much more environmentally unfriendly energy sources in other parts parts of the world. And, you know, we are a growing population and a growing economy. And in a growing population, a growing economy, and with lots of capacity to help the world uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions in a way that's actually good for our economy. I mean, that's actually, I mean, we are being a good uh, global citizen by, by contributing our gas, by contributing our cleaner coal, by contributing all of these energy sources that will help reduce emissions all around the world at the same time as generating jobs here in Australia. How fantastic is that? And the Greens really uh, should uh, remember uh, Senator, the former Senator Bob Brown, who of course was a big advocate uh, of coal, uh, and I know that uh, if, uh, if, uh, you know, if you're interested, I'm sure that Senator Colbeck is happy uh, to bring that front page out of the Hobart, Hobart Mercury out uh, to remind you again. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. Minister, Minister, in the short months between the last parliament and this one, 18 heat records have been broken in Canada. The worst drought in India's history is threatening the entire cities. In Mozambique, months of rain fell in a few short hours, dislocating 1.8 million people. The World Meteorological Organisation said it was a wake-up call to the world. Minister, when will your government wake up to the climate emergency that is before us? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, our government is committed to effective action on climate change. We have uh, very 
uh, effective, uh, we've got a very uh, comprehensive and effective measures in place to ensure we meet our emissions reduction targets uh, signed on to uh, in Paris. Uh, and you know, we will, we will not impose economic harm on Australia uh, in order to push up emissions uh, in other parts of the world. We're not, gonna, we're not going to harm the Australian economy uh, in order to uh, you know, actually increase emissions all around the world. You, know, that you, can, you can go to the next election again proposing to harm the Australian economy in a way that doesn't make any difference to the environment. That is a matter for you. On our side of uh, uh, Parliament, unashamedly and une unequivocally, we will never ever do that. Senator Keneally. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. When the Reserve Bank cut the cash rate to 3.25 per cent, former Treasurer Hockey said, and I quote, the Reserve Bank are cutting interest rates not because the Australian economy is doing well, but because the Australian economy is deteriorating. We are one cut away from emergency levels of a cash rate. Given the Reserve Bank this week cut the cash rate to a record low of 1 per cent, how does the Treasurer describe the current cash rate? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I mean, it, it's no secret. It is absolutely no secret that the Australian economy is facing global economic headwinds and is dealing with some downside risks in the domestic economy. It's absolutely no secret at all, which is, of course, why Labor's agenda of higher taxes and the politics of envy was precisely the wrong way to go, because it would have made our economy weaker. Uh, it would have put jobs at risk. It would have left all families worse off. And, you know, I mean, in a way, in a way we've actually won that policy argument, because the Labor Party, having argued for $387 billion in higher taxes in the campaign, are now saying we should have more tax cuts sooner because that's the right thing to do by the economy. So, I mean, on one hand, you're saying we need more taxes for the economy, and we can't legislate tax cuts in the future because uh, that's bad for the economy. And now you're saying we need more tax cuts sooner, even though the budget can't afford that. Uh, so, ah, stimulus, stimulus, Senator, Senator Wong says, stimulus, Senator Wong. So, well, let, let me tell you what. We have, a, we have a plan to build a stronger economy. It is a plan that we took to the last order, election. Order, Senator Cormann. Senator Gallagher on a point of order. A uh, point of order. Thank you, Mr President. The question was very direct. It asks how the Treasurer describes the current cash rate. We haven't got to that point yet. Well, you reminded the Minister of the question, uh, and I call Senator Cormann to continue. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, in Australia, monetary policy and fiscal policy is absolutely heading in the same direction. Of course we are focused. Our budget is a pro-growth budget. Our budget, over the last two financial Order. years, we have put forward $302 billion worth of income tax relief for hard-working families. Hard work, $302 billion worth of income tax relief. A $100 billion infrastructure investment pipeline. And indeed, and indeed, and indeed, of course, uh, you know, the Labor Party is arguing in favour of higher taxes, which really their current proposition, uh, maybe that might be position five or seven, I don't quite know the page, but uh, the current position is to have, to have lower taxes because that helps the economy. But they're arguing at the same time that we should have higher taxes in case there is trouble in the economy down the track. I mean, the Labor Party position on tax and on, po on economic policy makes no sense at all. I think you need to go on a retreat and seriously think about it and see what your consensus order, position actually is. Senator, order. Senator, order on my right and left. Order. I'll call Senator Keneally when I can hear her. Senator Keneally. Thank you. I ask a supplementary question. Former Treasurer Hockey also said, and I quote, we have had the extraordinary situation where the Reserve Bank has cut interest rates to record lows and consumer confidence falls. And why? Because consumers have been spooked. Well, why wouldn't they be? Given the Reserve Bank has cut the cash rate to 1 per cent, is it any wonder consumers are spooked and consumer confidence is falling? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. It, it is true that uh, on the back of uh, a lot of media reporting, which turned out to be quite misguided, uh, that a lot of Australians were concerned about the possibility of a, a Labor government, uh, which would have had a very negative effect on the economy. They were concerned about the retiree tax and the housing tax, higher taxes on investment and you know, all of the other higher taxes that Labor were pursuing, which is why, of course, they voted for our uh, agenda of lower income taxes for all working Australians, all working Australians. And that is, you know, we, are, we are getting on with the job, we're getting on with delivering what we promised we would deliver to the Australian people to build a stronger economy and secure Australia's future. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Mr Hockey also said, and I quote, if anyone thinks that the Reserve Bank acted today because the economy is doing really well, 
they'd be deluding themselves. Will the minister admit the economy is facing a crisis, or is he deluding himself? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. As I say, our government has got a clear plan to build a stronger economy. It's a plan that was endorsed by the Australian people. It's, and, and you know what? I mean, you know, the Labor Party can continue to uh, you know, persist with the argument they run before the election. We will continue to get on with the job of implementing the plan that the Australian people voted for. Order. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Mackenzie as the Minister for Agriculture. Minister, the Howard government deregulated the dairy industry in the late 1990s. Since then, we have seen Queensland alone go from 1,500 dairy farmers down to approximately 385 and milk production drop from 12 million litres to 9 million litres per year. Yet at the same time, the population has grown from 19 million to 25 million. Deregulation has destroyed a fair farm gate price for milk, with many farms getting less for their milk than cost of production, and farms are now in the hands of foreign ownership exporting milk to their country. Minister, what does the government have planned to ensure the viability of Australian dairy farms so that they receive a fair price for their milk, allowing them to continue in the industry? Senator Mackenzie, the Minister of Agriculture. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Hanson, for your question. Uh, the dairy industry is experiencing difficulties right across the country, not just in your home state of Queensland. I represent Victoria, and we indeed are a great dairying state as well. And that is why our government has taken strong measures to support an industry which underpins so many regional economies around the country. Uh, right now, dairy is our third largest rural industry with $4.3 billion farm gate production. And as you've said, uh, with nearly 6,000 dairy farmers, but as you've said, there has been a decrease in literage uh, over recent times, and often that is actually as a result of uh, the drought, in particularly in northern Victoria and southern uh, New South Wales, where farmers—I'm sorry, Senator Stirl, farmers are actually having to destock during the drought. That is actually a reality, and that means there is lower literage uh, going through the system. And that is why, going to the election, uh, we sought to assist the dairy industry by giving $10 million to assist dairy farmers to upgrade or invest in energy efficient equipment. One of the issues for the viability and profitability of the dairy industry is the increase of input costs. One of those is electricity. A lot of dairy farmers are irrigators. It is a perishable product, so it must maintain refrigeration. High energy costs actually impact dairy farmers' profitability because it increases the impost. That's why we're putting money towards reducing their energy costs. We're also uh, funding additional funding to the ACCC to actually establish a dairy specialist in the unit of agriculture within the ACCC to ensure we get the competition policy settings right for the dairy industry. We've also committed to implementing uh, a dairy code, which I know particularly the Queensland dairy farming industry is keen to see uh, occur. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. As I stated, a lot of dairy farms now are in foreign ownership, exporting their milk to other countries. What does the government intend to do to avoid the selling up of dairy farms and the control of the industry to foreign interests? Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, we want to see more dairy farmers exporting milk to a whole lot of different foreign countries. It actually underpins so much of our regional communities, our food processing jobs, our yogurt, our milk powder, not just fresh milk and UHT, that go to markets right across the world. So we actually want to increase market access for fabulous clean, green dairy products produced here in Australia. So I don't see the exporting of our product a bad thing and opening of new markets. I think it actually leads to an increase of jobs in regional community and gives our dairy farmers more options of where to actually send their products. And when you have more options, you can have more choice and therefore you can claim a higher price. In terms of foreign ownership, 
of dairy farms and agricultural land more, more broadly, the National Party and indeed the coalition government, when we first came to power many years ago, implemented change to the FERB arrangements to actually ensure uh, that we have oversight on foreign Order. ownership Senator of agricultural McKenzie. land. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Um, you made a comment about um, dairy farms actually the exporting of milk. What I'm, I understand now is that milk is going to be imported from New Zealand. Now, what, why is it left up to the supermarkets to, to collect a levy so that our dairy farmers receive closer to the farm gate value for their milk rather than regulating the industry again that worked previously in the past to ensure that the farmers get a fair price for their milk? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, you know, I think that is 101, fighting for farmers, not just dairy farmers, but producers right across the country and all different commodity groups to get a fair price for their hard work and efforts producing clean, green food. Uh, when you talk about deregulating and regulating the dairy industry, it was indeed the dairy farmers themselves that took that decision uh, to deregulate the dairy industry across Australia. And we've been working through how that has shaken out uh, over the last couple of decades. And yes, there have been issues. Uh, with market power being used by supermarkets in how uh, they actually purchase product and the reward that they give our farmers. And that is why uh, we have committed to the development of a dairy code uh, in conjunction with dairy farmers to ensure that they can have more assurance around uh, a fair price for product. Uh, department officials, my department officials, have visited all eight dairy regions, listening to dairy industry about the development of the code, Order. which will be announced Senator in the coming. I'm time has expired. Senator Payne. Um, Mr. President, I know it's uh, unusual in the uh, course of question time, but I seek leave to make a very brief statement to the leave, Senate. Leave was granted. Granted, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, uh, following from the Prime Minister's comment, uh, comments in the House of Representatives, uh, I'm very pleased to advise the Senate that uh, young Australian Mr. Alex Sigley has today been released from detention in North Korea. He is safe yeah. and he is well. Swedish authorities advised the Australian government that they met with senior officials from the DPRK yesterday and raised the issue of Alex's disappearance on Australia's behalf. Earlier this morning, we were advised that the DPRK had released Alec from detention. He has now safely left the country. Mr President, on behalf of the Australian government, may I express our deepest gratitude to Swedish authorities for their prompt and invaluable assistance in securing Alex's uh, prompt release. The outcome does demonstrate the value of careful, behind-the-scenes, discreet work of officials in resolving complex and sensitive consular cases such as this in close partnership with other governments. I won't be making further comment on this matter out of respect for uh, Alex's privacy and that of his family, but I can say, Mr President, that uh, his father has been advised. Uh, he is enormously relieved and grateful and has asked me to convey um, that the family has asked uh, that we convey the thanks to everyone who has helped and expressed support for them over the past several days. Thank you, Mr yeah. President. I thank the yeah. Senate. Senator Wong. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Senate. I, I, on behalf of the opposition, can I welcome this announcement? Can I share in the Foreign Minister's uh, thanks to the Swedish authorities for their invaluable work in securing uh, Mr. Sickley's release? Uh, I also want to acknowledge the work of all Australian officers, particularly from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, for their work. Uh, as uh, I thank the Minister for her cooperation, the approach the opposition takes on these sensitive co um, consular matters, as you will have seen from public statements, is a bipartisan and cooperative approach. And we're very pleased for Mr. Sickley and his family that this matter has been resolved satisfactorily. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia. Minister, the resources sector is vital to jobs and prosperity in our home state of Queensland. How is the government getting on with the job of delivering for the Australian people through resources sector policy? Senator Kennedy. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator McGrath for his question and recognise his long-standing support for our great well-being resources sector. Mr. President, we on this side of the chamber know how much the mining sector delivers to our country uh, in terms of jobs, in terms of wealth, in terms of prosperity, and that's why we have no shame, Mr. President, and are never ashamed to defend and support right. that sector that's and right. want to see it grow and back those projects. And Mr. President, this week the figures from my department show that the resources sector has smashed another record that this financial year 
the resources sector will export the value of $285 billion worth of products on behalf of our nation, smashes the record that was set last financial year at $275 billion. It, the, the, these figures show Mr. President, that over 10 years, every year, the resources sector will be exporting a larger volume of resources uh, for 10 years straight. Every year, a new record being set. The resources sector in this country are delivering more records than the Beatles, Mr. President. They continue to deliver year on year on year for our country, and that's why we support them. We didn't need, Mr. President, we didn't need uh, uh, the Australian people to give us a spanking at the election. <laughs> to remind us about how important the mining sector is. I notice now there's a number of people, there's more people here in this parliament uh, since we were here last time supporting the resources sector, That's supporting right. coal mining. And that is fantastic, Mr President. I, am so, uh, well, so I welcome so much the result of that election. Isn't it amazing, though, that there's taken, uh, uh, taken 15 million odd Australians to have their say for the Australian Labor Party to realise that maybe, just maybe, maybe, the mining sector might be important to our country's wealth, prosperity and people's livelihoods. We don't need uh, to have that result, Mr. President, because we live in these regions. We work in these regions. We talk to people who wear orange, yellow and pink fluoro colours. We know what their lives mean, and that's why we support and back them, Mr. President. That's why we support the opening up of the Galilee Basin. That's why we support the opening of the Browse Basin in Western Australia. That's why we support the continuing development of resource markets right around the world. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. What can governments do to make sure mining and resources continue to generate wealth and jobs for Australians in the future? Senator Canavan. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, one concerning thing around the figures that were released this week is that that record-breaking run I mentioned uh, is about to plateau and uh, would likely, in the next three to five years, possibly start declining. So we won't be exporting more volumes every year, year on year. Because, Mr. President, we have been relying on the significant investments that were made over the last decade during the mining boom, and of course, unless new investments are made year on year, eventually uh, you start to decline in terms of the production. So we have had a production boom, an investment boom, followed by a production boom. What we need to do is now support new investments in resources. We need to make sure that we don't have nine-year delays on projects like the Queensland government has presided over on the Adani Carmichael coal mine. Good that that's going on now, but the Queensland government is now ranked, Mr. President, in the Fraser Institute rankings on uncertainty of environmental regulation. They are ranked 49th out of 83 jurisdictions in the world. They're behind Russia, PNG, and Congo. That's why we're leading a charge in COAG to do benchmarking on environmental regulation around the mining sector to make sure we facilitate investments in Order. mining, not put more Senator hurdles Kennedy. in front of them. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. What would be the consequences of failing to take advantage of Australia's natural resources? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, Mr. President, the consequences would be felt by people. They'd be felt by people who largely live in smaller towns and country areas of, of our nation. Uh, not only in those towns, though, uh, uh, Brisbane and Perth are the biggest mining towns in our nation, uh, where hundreds of thousands of people rely on the sector for their jobs. But you know, I, I, I very much uh, keep in front of my mind people like Kel Appleton, a publican at Claremont. Uh, who has said that the opening up the Galilee in central Queensland is, and he's, he's quoting him, he says, it's our chance to have the things city people take for granted, things like a strong, stable income and hope for your children. Uh, all the words of Ann Baker, who's a, who's a proud member of the Labor Party, the mayor of the Isaac Shire, who I caught up with recently, she says, she wrote a few months ago, that the Galilee Basin would help fund schools, hospitals and public services, not only across our state but also across this country. And with that in mind, she added that can all levels of government afford for the Galilee Basin not to open? Mr. President, these are the people that are at the front of our minds and we seek to support the resource sector so they can have a better future for their children and we can make our country a stronger place. Before I come to the next question, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber and gallery of a parliamentary delegation from Fiji led by the honourable Ayers Syed Kayum. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to the Senate. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Minister Birmingham, representing the Minister for Education. Minister, in the last three years, your government has slashed the repayment threshold for study loans by nearly 20 per cent, in effect cutting the pay of low-income workers. Just this week, the government slugged another 136,000 Australians by cutting the threshold by another $6,000. How does the government justify giving tax cuts to millionaires while they punish low-income workers for studying? The Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Birmingham. Well, I thank, thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Senator for her question. 
Uh, of course, uh, I'd make the point in her question uh, that, firstly, uh, Senator, uh, you need to appreciate, of course, that students who leave university uh, and get jobs or leave other forms of study that they leave with the student debt and get jobs uh, are students who then go on and pay taxes. And those students will benefit from there being lower taxes. And they'll have those benefits long after they've repaid their student loans. And those benefits will help them through their lives uh, to be able uh, to buy their homes, to establish themselves, uh, to save for their retirement, to support their families, to pursue all of those sorts of things that you expect graduates to seek to do. In relation to the HELP scheme itself, to our student loan scheme, that, Mr President, as this chamber, I think, should know and should acknowledge is one of the most generous schemes Absolutely. in the world. It's one of the most generous schemes in the world that allows Australians to go to university yeah. for an undergraduate degree and face no upfront fees whatsoever, to take on a loan that has no real interest rate whatsoever, no additional fees whatsoever attached to it, and then to only pay that back at reasonable income levels. What this government did, yes, uh, the senator is right, is lower the starting threshold, but we also implemented a newer, lower first repayment rate too. Uh, and so there is a new 1 per cent repayment rate uh, that, from memory, uh, uh, Mr. President, it's a little while since I knew all of these statistics <laughs> off by heart, uh, but from memory equates to around $8 a week uh, in terms of repayment uh, of student loans for those who first reach that threshold. We did also make sure that for graduates earning higher incomes, they repay their loans faster by putting in place higher repayment rates at higher incomes, because that's the way you sustain the most generous student loan scheme in the world. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, every single person the government has targeted by these unfair changes to study loans is a low-income worker who already faces low wages, growing underemployment and the increasing cost of living. So how can you claim, how can the government claim to support low-income earners when you've just slugged 136,000 of, of them with additional unfair forced repayments? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. Uh, obviously, the perils, of course, and there are many new senators in the chamber, the perils when you uh, have your supplementary question already written and you don't change it or vary it when you hear the answer. Uh, I'll repeat again for the senator's interest. I repeat again for the senator's interest that one of our reforms was to put in place higher repayment yeah. thresholds yeah. and higher repayment rates at high income thresholds. So, in fact, one of our reforms is there is now a 10 per cent repayment rate for those earning more than $134,573. So, those who leave study and get jobs that are well paid will absolutely be repaying their loans back much faster than they would have in the past. And that is good news in terms of the sustainability of our student loan scheme, which has billions of dollars uh, of debt that the government carries on behalf of students, but we want to make sure that we can continue to offer on incredibly generous terms. And yes, in terms of lower incomes, there is that new 1 per cent threshold that kicks in at $45,881. Order. Senator Birmingham. Per. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Minister, isn't this yet just another blatant cash grab yep. by the government from those who can least afford it? Will you just admit that your government doesn't give a damn about students or low-income workers and that the only people that you care about is your millionaire mates? Senator Birmingham. <laughs> well, Order. Mr President, it may uh, come as no surprise to the chamber. I'm not going to admit any of the things that Senator Faruqi has invited me to admit. Uh, I will acknowledge, however, that uh, the Australian Greens don't give a damn about how it is you manage money at all. Uh, that the Australian Greens don't give a damn about whether or not uh, the debt book is sustainable for our student loan scheme or anything else, because they think that money just grows on trees. The Australian Greens seem to think that money just go, grows on trees. trees. What our government will do, Mr President, has done is make sure that we can, as a country, continue to afford to provide the most generous access to university and to study options without upfront fees for those students, and we preserve and maintain that by making sure that we have a student loan scheme where the bulk of those funds are repaid so that it is sustainable for generations into the future. That's who we're looking after. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. 
My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. I refer to breaking reports from The Australian that Centre Alliance has received a written guarantee outlining the Morrison government's gas policy. Does the written guarantee provide a guarantee that the price of gas will be reduced to $7 a gigajoule, as promised this morning by Senator Patrick? If so, will the minister be up front with the Senate and undertake to table a copy of the written guarantee in this place? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I think it's always prudent not to believe everything you read in the newspaper. It's, not always, not always, it's always prudent not to believe everything that you read in the newspaper. Um, as I, I would, I would oh, sorry, refer, you, sorry I would, thank you. I would, I would refer you to uh, my consistent statements uh, in recent weeks, uh, when I've always made the point, and then, of course, we are prepared to engage constructively with those uh, non-government senators who want to engage with us in relation to policy issues of concern to them and their constituents. And it's a matter of public record that we've sat down. Senator Canavan and I, we sat down in Perth uh, with uh, Senator Patrick, and we went in some detail uh, explaining the uh, policy positions that we've adopted in the past to help uh, bring down the uh, price Senator of gas. Coleman, in the Senator Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt. On relevance, Mr. President, we've let. Senator Cormann gave for some time, but he hasn't addressed uh, this statement from Senator Patrick that there is a written guarantee. That's what we want to know about, and that's what we want him to table. I'm listening very carefully to the minister. I cannot instruct him how to answer a question or to the, or, or to the content of it, as long as it is being directly relevant to a question or its terms. I believe at this stage Mr. Uh, Senator Cormann is being directly relevant. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, it's a matter of public record uh, that uh, we have uh, engaged constructively uh, with uh, Centre Line Senators uh, in relation to the government's long standing commitment uh, to bring down the price of electricity and to continue to bring down uh, the price of gas uh, into, the, into the domestic market. Uh, you know, I, I can't even, I'm not even Order. allowed to answer the question. Uh, today is a day for the Senate to deal with income tax cuts. Uh, of course, the government will continue to work with all senators prepared to engage with us constructively on other policy matters. And as the government has made relevant decisions, the relevant announcements will be made. Senator Watt, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll make this supplementary question very simple for Senator Cormann. Is there a written guarantee that gas prices will fall, as has been promised by Senator Patrick? Senator Cormann. Well, again, I let Senator Patrick talk for himself. The, on, the, only, guarantee that the, government, the only guarantee the government is providing is that we will, we will deliver income tax relief for millions of Australians. We will deliver income tax relief for millions of Australians, and we will continue to work in good faith and constructively uh, to order. pursue the government's Senator long Cormann, Senator Watt, on a point of order. Mr. Mr. President, again, Senator Cormann is not answering the question which is very simple. Is there a written guarantee? It's a yes or no question. Uh, I can't instruct the minister how to answer the question. The question, however, was about gas rather than other elements of policy. Um, so you've reminded the minister of the question. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as I've indicated uh, to the Senate, uh, the government is very grateful uh, that Senators uh, Patrick, uh, Lambie, Griff and Bernardi are supporting our plan for lower income taxes for all working Australians, as endorsed by the Australian people at the last election. And we will continue to work in good faith and constructively uh, with uh, non-government senators who want to engage with us around measures to bring down the cost of electricity and to boost domestic supplies of gas into our domestic market. Senator Watt, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. We can only assume that the answer is no, based on Senator Cormann's previous answers. But Senator Cormann has ruled out doing any special deals in order to legislate the government's tax package. Given it's clear the minister has in fact done special deals, isn't it clear that his word is worth just as much as his guaranteed support for former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I can confirm that there are no special deals. There are absolutely no special deals. What we are doing, and as I've, what we have said, what we have said consistently, what we have said consistently, is that we would work with non-government senators in relation to public policy, public policy issues, public policy issues, public policy issues, and we are seeking, we are seeking to secure alignment. We are seeking to secure alignment with non-government senators 
around important public policy priorities. And indeed, the government has got a long-standing policy priority to uh, deliver lower electricity prices, lower gas prices. And we will, and we will, continue, we will continue to work with uh, senators in relation to these matters. But these decisions have to stand on their own merit. They've got to be taken on their own merit. And they will continue to be taken on their own merit. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Minister, how is the government getting on with delivering for the Australian people by helping Australian businesses benefit from trade, tourism and investment opportunities with our G20 partners? And how does this help to create a stronger economy that guarantees the essential services that Australians rely on? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Fawcett for, uh, for his question, and I know his very deep uh, interest and indeed knowledge, of course, in, uh, in all matters of trade, foreign policy, and, uh, and defence. And I'm pleased to inform Senator Fawcett and the Senate uh, that Prime Minister Morrison, uh, in re at the recent G20 meetings of leaders in uh, Osaka in Japan, delivered strong messages to the G20 about uh, the importance of maintaining and modernising a consistent, rules-based framework to facilitate trade and investment flow uh, between Australia and other nations, but indeed right across the globe. And this is critically important because one in five Australian jobs are trade-related. Indeed, 2.2 million Australian jobs depend upon our trade relationships and trade activities as a nation. Uh, and trade growth has been a engine, an engine behind the type of jobs growth that Australia has seen that Senator Cash was speaking about at the commencement of question time. Indeed, one quarter of Australia's economic growth over the last five years is estimated to be attributable to our growth in trade and export activity. Uh, trading companies pay higher wages, an estimated 11.5 per cent higher wages amongst those companies and businesses who export. Household incomes are an estimated $8,000 $400 higher due to the type of trade liberalisation and opening up of markets that Australia has undertaken. And other nations are great beneficiaries of more open market environments, and we have seen that with hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty through our region in the Indo-Pacific and particularly in Asia as a result of more open markets. And Australia is committed, whether it is with large trading partners like China or indeed smaller but no less important trading partners like our friends from Fiji who are in the chamber at present, to make sure that we continue to advance, as the Prime Minister did at the G20, the agenda for open trading arrangements. Order. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Will the Minister inform the Senate about the key outcomes for Australia that were advanced through the meetings that were conducted at the G20 summit? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, first and foremost, uh, the Prime Minister worked hard uh, with colleagues and particularly with the support and on behalf of uh, the Government of New Zealand uh, to make sure that the G20 commitment for global action on preventing terrorist and violent extremist content online uh, was delivered uh, with a clear message sent to internet companies to lift their efforts to ensure their platforms are not exploited, uh, to make sure that there is tough action taken as we have done in our domestic laws in Australia uh, to ensure that Australians and those around the world are protected uh, from viewing and seeing the types of horrific events that occurred in Christchurch. But we also saw in relation to the trade front uh, strong work in relation to the Osaka track uh, that was launched by Japan, which complements the e-commerce negotiations we're pursuing and leading uh, through the World Trade Organisation to modernise trade rules and to ensure they reflect uh, modern trading arrangements, as well as direct pursuit uh, of trade negotiations with the European Union, uh, with our ASEP Order. counterparts and Senator with our other Birmingham. major trading Senator partners. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Minister, how will our broader international efforts to grow Australian trade create more jobs and a stronger economy without raising taxes? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, opening up our trade markets, as our government has consistently done over the last six years with our trade agreements struck with China, Japan, the Republic of Korea, the TPP and continuing to build on other partnerships, is paying and delivering dividends for Australia. Just yesterday, the Australian Bureau of Statistics released data that showed that Australia had recorded a record trade surplus for the month of May this year of some $5.7 billion. 
that record trade surplus is fuelled by record levels of exports from Australia. And indeed, the five largest monthly trade surpluses ever recorded in Australian history have all been delivered in 2019. This is a demonstration that, as a country, we are yielding benefits of growing exports into markets, particularly where we have trade agreements in place, and that growth in exports is fuelling business growth, jobs growth, fuelling the opportunity for us to see revenue growth, which ultimately allows us to balance a budget and pay for tax cuts and tax relief Order. for hard-working Senator Australians. Birmingham. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Former Minister for Defence Christopher Pine announced he had taken a position with EY, stating that he was, and I quote, looking forward to providing strategic advice to Ernst & Young as the firm looks forward to expanding its footprint in the defence industry. In response, the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham, warned that, and I quote, everybody should adhere to that code of conduct, and that includes Christopher. I note the statement made by Minister Cormann to the Senate earlier today. When did the Prime Minister invite his secretary, write to his secretary asking him to investigate Mr Pline's employment with Ernst & Young? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, as uh, Senator uh, Kitchen uh, uh, quite rightly uh, outlines, the Prime Minister has written uh, to um, Dr. Parkinson, uh, in the terms as I've advised the Chamber uh, earlier, I'll get the precise. Uh, in fact, he's written to him on the 3rd of July. Senator Kitching, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Abetz has said that, and I quote, people do expect a standard from the ministers and then former ministers to ensure that which, that which they have learned and gleaned from their ministerial roles are not exported into other roles from which they can potentially gain financially. Has the Prime Minister or his office discussed Mr Pine's employment with EY with Mr Pine? If so, when and with whom did the discussion take place? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I'm aware of a public statement that uh, former Minister Pine uh, issued uh, in relation to some of these other matters. I take them on notice. Uh, but as I've indicated to the Senate, uh, the Prime Minister has written to Dr Parkinson uh, seeking advice on these matters uh, as appropriate. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, as I've indicated to the Chamber, we'll provide an update on these matters in due course. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Liberal member for Barkin, Tony pa Passon, has said that, and I quote, what I do know is the fact we're talking about is indicative that it just doesn't pass the pub test. While the Prime Minister's secretary is investigating Mr Pine's employment with Ernst & Young, what arrangements are in place to ensure Mr Pine does not take advantage of information obtained due to his former ministerial responsibilities? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, there is absolutely no indication that uh, the former Minister Pine uh, is or has or is acting uh, in breach of the statement of ministerial standards, but the Prime Minister uh, has uh, sought advice in relation to these matters, as I've indicated to the Chamber. Uh, and, uh, order. No, Senator Cormann. Senator Kitching on a point of order. My question was not whether there had been or had been a breach. My question was in relation to what arrangements are in place to ensure that there uh, isn't yeah, one. I cannot instruct the Minister how to answer the question. He's been speaking for 18 seconds. I consider him directly relevant, but I'm listening. Senator Cormann. Uh, well, as I've indicated to the Chamber, the Prime Minister sought advice from Dr Parkinson and uh, you know, we'll pro I'll provide an update at the appropriate time. And uh, with that, uh, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Uh, Senator Wong. I seek leave to move a motion uh, requiring a minister to table the document. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. To contingent notice, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion requiring a minister to table a document. The document in question is the document which sets out the deal with Centre Alliance uh, on gas prices about which questions have been asked in this chamber today. And let us be very clear, let us be very clear, both in the House of Representatives when Mr Taylor was asked questions and today and today in the Senate, uh, when the Leader of the Government in the Senate was asked questions, there was an utter, an utter refusal by the Government 
to give any details of this special deal, this special deal with Centre Alliance. Uh, and that is a deal that, Ms. that Senator Patrick has been very clear and upfront with the newspapers that he has achieved in return for his vote on the tax cuts. And I just would remind the government that Mr. Senator, S Senator Patrick has said to newspapers that his party has received a written guarantee outlining the Morrison government's gas policy which the key, key minor party demanded in exchange for its support for the $158 billion worth personal income tax cuts package. Uh, the draft gas policy signed by the government was given to Central Alliance senators last night ahead of a crucial vote in the Senate today on tax cuts. Well, I think the Australian people and this Senate are entitled to see a copy of a gas policy which is supposed to deliver, as Senator Patrick asserts, $7 per gigajoule, which is supposed to deliver uh, lower prices to consumers, uh, which is supposed to deliver uh, uh, gas prices uh, in South Australia that are lower uh, and which the government is, is keeping secret. Well, I think the, the Australian people and this chamber are entitled to see the detail of this secret deal. Senator Patrick is out there spruiking it to the newspapers. Minister Taylor and Minister Cormann in the House of Representatives and the Senate, respectively, uh, are dancing around the answers and refusing to provide answers on this question. Now, I also want to make this point to Centre Alliance and to Senator Patrick. Senator Rex Patrick, Senator Griff, uh, I hope you come in here and, consistent with your party platform around transparency and accountability, vote for this suspension of standing orders so as to enable the document to be tabled. Because uh, Centre Alliance's uh, public platform is they believe in transparent and accountable government. I think it's pretty reasonable for a party that believes in transparent and, and accountable government to require a government to tell the Australian people what their policy is. I think that's pretty reasonable. That's pretty transparent, pretty accountable. And the second point I'd make, and this is a point about the ethics of it, Centre Alliance has made clear, and they're entitled to do this, they've done an, made an agreement with the government to vote for the tax package. Uh, we don't agree with stage three. We've explained why. We, we agree with stages one and two, but not stage three, and we've explained our position. But if the Centre Alliance party has traded their votes for a policy, I think it is incumbent upon them to outline what that policy right. is. It is incumbent upon them to outline what this policy is. So I look forward to Senator Patrick and Senator Griff coming in here and voting with the Australian Labor Party and I hope other parties in this place to require the government to table the document that Central Alliance is talking to the media about. I mean, this is the extraordinary thing. The document that Senator Cormann doesn't want to acknowledge the existence of, that he doesn't want to ask questions about, that he has ducked and weaved on throughout the entirety of question time today. Well, Senator Patrick has been out there chatting to the media. So it's fine. We've got the media saying, oh, this is what's in the document, but the Senate can't see it. The Senate can't see it and the Australian people can't see it. We just get Senator Patrick spruiking his deal. Well, if it's such a great deal, if it's such a great deal, I'm sure Senator Patrick, Senator Griff will vote for this motion to ensure uh, that the government actually tables the document. That is government policy. That is government policy, because what has occurred, what has occurred is a deal has been done about government policy, and you ought to front up to the Senate, Senator Cormann, and tell people what the policy actually is. You ought to front up to the Senate and tell them what you're doing in order to get these votes. Uh, you're the one that said no special deals. You're the one that said no special deals. Well, you've given a special deal. Now, that's fine. It's up to you if you want to do that. But I think it is incumbent upon the government and Centre Alliance to provide to this Senate and via the Senate the Australian people the details of the gas policy, the gas policy changes that you have agreed in order to get their votes. Now, this document is out there. This document has been signed by, gov by government. This document is being spruiked by, the, by, by Senator Patrick as the thing he got for his vote. Well, table the document. Front up and table the document. It's the right thing to do. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Firstly, uh, Senator Patrick has advised me that the uh, story uh, that is written by Rosie Lewis is incorrect, and no doubt he will explain uh, himself. No doubt he will explain that to the chamber at the appropriate time. Furthermore, I mean, th there is there is absolutely there's absolutely nothing. 
There's no stone that the Labour Party would leave unturned in order to prevent Australians from getting a tax cut. There is no stone that the Labour Party will leave unturned to prevent working Australians getting, keeping more of their own money in their pocket. You know what? Senator Lyons and Senator Lambie have made a decision to support good policy, policy which was endorsed by the Australian people, policy which is important to strengthen our economy and policy, of course, which the Senate should support. I would just refer Senator Wong to uh, what I've said consistently uh, on the record for some time, and I, I refer you in particular to a Sky interview on the 14th of June, and, and it's, it, sums up, it sums up our approach. We will continue to engage in good faith uh, and constructively with all non-government senators. A range of issues have been raised, ranging from a desire uh, to uh, lower energy prices, which we share and we are pursuing, and various other issues. It is very important for your viewers to understand our government is absolutely committed to lower energy prices. We have a very ambitious agenda already to bring down energy prices, including by boosting supply of gas into the domestic market. Of course, we are prepared to engage with non-government senators in relation to these matters. In the end, you have to make judgments on these matters on their own merit. Now, that is, that is the important point. So we are here today pursuing a policy uh, to reduce income taxes for all working Australians, and that is a policy that we commend uh, to the Senate on its own merits, because it's an important economic policy, it's, an, it's economically necessary, fiscally responsible, and is what the Australian people voted for. Furthermore, though, we have a long-standing commitment to bring electricity prices down. We have a long-standing track record of uh, pursuing policy measures to drive down the cost of electricity, drive down the cost of gas, to boost the supply of gas into the domestic market, in particular on the, on the um, East Coast. That is, that is not a secret. Of course, we have been engaging uh, with uh, Centre Alliance in relation to these matters, and we have committed to continue to work with them in good faith, and as, as positions have been finalised and as processes uh, have been put in place, of course we will announce all of these matters, as is appropriate, but here's the important point. We are working with all senators who are prepared uh, to work with us on finding consensus and alignment with the government's policy agenda. We already have a long-standing <laughs> policy agenda to drive down energy prices. That is well and truly understood. It's well and truly on the public record. And when we're in a position to make further announcements about further policy initiatives uh, in the future, of course, we will do that at the appropriate time. But this is, this is nothing but the Labour Party trying to uh, prevent the, the Parliament, trying to prevent the Senate uh, from dealing uh, with um, important legislation to deliver income tax relief to all working Australians. I think that everyone can see through what this is about. Uh, I think the Senate should just, should just get on with it, should deal with the uh, legislation that's in front of us, deal with the amendments, uh, and uh, make sure that by the end of next week, work, millions of working Australians, millions of working Australians uh, can get, keep more of their own money in their own pockets. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, well, this story about what kind of a deal has been done between the government and Centre Alliance just continues unravelling by the minute. Uh, the latest comments that we've just heard from Senator Cormann are that Senator Patrick has now retracted his claims that he has a written guarantee from the government. So, Senator Gorman, Senator, exactly. Senator Cormann has clearly been on the phone or had his people on the phone heavying Senator Patrick, saying, oh, you better get out there, Rex, and retract that story, because you remember the hush-hush, we've got no written guarantee. So if, if Senator Cormann is now to be believed, and in fact there isn't a written guarantee from the government about gas prices, are we to believe that Senator Alliance actually hasn't got any kind of a deal in order for supporting these tax cuts? They either have a deal or they don't. It's either in writing or it's not, but from what we're hearing from Senator Cormann, there is no written guarantee, there is no deal. So what is Senator Alliance actually doing here? We can't ask them because they've been hiding for the entirety of question time, too ashamed to come to this chamber as their hopeless deal is being exposed. Uh, and now we learn that it appears, according to Senator Cormann, that there's no deal whatsoever. So I, I have to say, I am thoroughly confused about what Senator Alliance are up to and what they are going to get out of this deal for the Australian people. I mean, one of the reasons I'm confused is that I heard Senator Patrick on 
a.m. this morning, being interviewed by Sabra Lane, and he was dodging and weaving about her questions about what effect this would actually have on gas prices. But she finally managed to pin him down when she asked, so people on the East Coast, including South Australia, can expect that their prices will be $4 cheaper in 12 months or so? Senator Patrick, I think probably a realistic measure is something of the order of about $7 per gigajoule. Currently, we're paying about $9 per gigajoule. So Senator Patrick has been in the media this morning making a promise that gas prices on the East Coast are going to fall by $2 per gigajoule, which means that households using their gas appliances in South Australia, in Queensland, in North New South Wales, Victoria, other states and territories on the, on the East Coast will get a gas price reduction. But now we're starting to find out that, in fact, there's no such deal. So, I mean, what, can someone just tell us what Centre Alliance is actually getting out of this? They're about to sign up to, they're signing up to tax cuts from this government, which are going to remove $158 billion in revenue from the federal budget over the next few years. They're, they're, they're about to give away $158 billion of public money that is needed to fund all sorts of other services in their home state of South Australia. And while I would disagree with them doing a deal that might do something about gas prices, now we're finding out that they actually don't even have a deal. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing Senator Alliance over the course of the day try to explain to us and to the South Australians who voted for them what on earth they have managed to get out of the government in return for rolling over and backing in $158 billion of tax cuts. I mean, the article that we're referring to is crystal clear that uh, it was published around question time. Centre Alliance, Centre Alliance has received a written guarantee outlining the Morrison government's gas policy, which the key minor party demanded in exchange for its support for the tax cuts. A copy of the draft gas policy, which has been signed by the government, was given to Centre Alliance senators last night ahead of a crucial vote in the Senate today. I mean, that's not something you make up. There's clearly a draft gas policy. Senator Canavan's here. He can probably illuminate us about this. He was probably involved in drafting this gas policy. He's also party to this deal, and he's, he's, by, by forming this deal, he is also promising people in his home state of Queensland that their gas prices are going to fall, $9 a gigajoule down to $7 a gigajoule. So I look forward to all those people in Rockhampton thanking Senator Canavan for the gas price reductions that he's promised them. And oh, here's Senator Patrick. Now he can maybe tell us. Senator Patrick, have you done a deal or have you haven't? Have you, have you done a written deal or have you not? Have you done a verbal deal or have you not? Because we were told that you had, and now we're being told that you haven't. So we'd quite like to know what you've done. I mean, you're about to give away $158 billion in tax cuts. No, no. What I'm, what I'm interested in knowing, what I'm interested in knowing, is what anyone is getting for this. So you're not. So there's no guarantees. There's no Order, guarantees about Senator, gas prices. You should time, think about that. Time has expired. Order. Se order. Order. I'll call Senator Patrick when there is order. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. I have heard uh, what's been said in the chamber over the last uh, uh, 10 or 15 minutes. I'll just explain to you what, uh, what has happened. Um, uh, Senator Cormann came down to Adelaide a, a few weeks ago, had a bit of a chat. Order. Had a, had a bit of a chat to us about uh, things that, would be of, that were of concern to us. We raised a number of issues, one of which was energy prices. That won't be surprising to Senator Wong. She knows that uh, uh, electricity prices in South Australia are the highest in the country. Um, Senator Cormann then invited me to come across to Western Australia to sit down with Senator Canavan, uh, which we did, and we started talking about uh, uh, ways in which uh, uh, gas prices in this country could be brought down. Now, Senator Canavan brought a whole range of things to the table that he was already working on. We talked about a number of things. Order. We talked about a number of things that uh, uh, that we thought were, would be useful. 
Uh, we've had a dialogue backwards and forwards. It turns out some of the things that we thought might be useful are not, uh, can't be implemented because it wouldn't be lawful to do so. Or uh, some of the things that we've asked to, uh, that we suggested be done, can't technically be achieved. They don't actually give you the outcome that you want. So we've had a running dialogue with the with the government over the last uh, three or four weeks, um, and uh, going backwards and forwards, having conversations about. Uh, about the details. Now, at the moment, the, the status, and I, I'm sure Senator uh, Cormann will confirm this, they have a draft outline of how they want to approach things. It's not fully developed. Uh, in, it would, and as, Pen as Senator Wong would know, uh, as Senator Wong would know, uh, having been a minister in government, uh, tabling something or, or uh, producing something that is that is uh, not completed can actually be harmful because the, the government is still working through a whole range of options uh, and they need to do a whole bunch of uh, checking off on those options. So we have an understanding of where they want to go and we also have an, invi we order. Also have an Senator, invitation— Senator Patrick, please stop the clock. Resume your seat. Point of order, Senator Wong. Point of order. I'd ask that Senator Patrick advise the Senate whether or not he has received the written guarantee. That's not a point of not, not not a point of order, Senator Wong. Senator Patrick, please continue. So, Senate, um, Senator Cormann uh, has given it order. I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. Stop into some, order. If you stop on my left, I'll order. come to it. Senator, Patrick, Senator Cormann has in invited us to continue talking with him on this policy issue, and indeed on other policy issues, and that's how uh, the crossbench can work well with with government. Uh, okay. I can tell you I do not have a document that links anything to tax cuts. It doesn't, it doesn't set a price. Uh, the price that I mentioned this morning on, on, uh, on ABC is no, what I mentioned uh, as a name Order point, on my left. As, I, as a name point, is the price that ACCC uh, Chairman Rod Sims has suggested we can get to in terms of gas pricing. Okay, there is no agreement that says if you vote for the tax cuts, we will do this. There's an, you know, the, or, order because on my we're left. now Senator quite satisfied. So we're now quite satisfied. The government is moving in a really good direction in relation to gas, gas prices. Okay, so that is that. That's that's the status of things. There is no written agreement that says we're going to. You do this, and we will support tax cuts. I can absolutely assure you of that. Uh, there is a, a dialogue that's taken place. There's been emails exchanged. There, there, there are, there's a draft policy document, but that. Uh, once again, it would be irresponsible to, to, to table something that is in draft that is not fully considered. Thank you. Senator Canavan. President, and, uh, Mr. President, just commenting on some other contributions on this uh, debate of a, a need to suspend standing orders, I, I noted that Senator Watt a number of times Mr. President, used the word confused, that he was confused about how things are going and where things are, are at. And I, I can understand. I, I think I can. I can understand uh, Senator Watt's confusion, Mr. President, because my understanding, Mr. President, of where the Australian Labor Party are with the tax cuts legislation is that their position on how they're going to vote this evening on tax cuts is going to be determined by wherever the Centre Alliance and other crossbenchers come to. So the once proud Australian Labor Party here, you would think, maybe would have a position themselves on something as important as uh, large income tax cuts to help stimulate the economy and return uh, wealth to the Australian people, you'd think they might have their own policy on that position, given the, the nature of their party and their dreams one day to, to be in government. But instead, Mr President, you have this absurd situation where they're going to hold a shadow cabinet minutes meeting this afternoon, apparently after uh, Mr Senator Patrick and uh, Senators Griff and uh, Senator Lambie and others come to a position, and then they'll determine what their position is. Now, I've got great respect, Mr President, for Senator Patrick and Senator Alliance and, and other senators in this place, Senator but I cannot what? understand, Mr President, why the once proud Australian Labor Party is outsourcing their policy development to a couple of senators in South Australia. How low has the Australian Labor Party dropped to, Mr President, that that is the state of affairs that we are now seeing, Mr President. This suspension order, this suspension motion, Mr President, has nothing 
nothing to do with policy. It has nothing to do with transparency. It has nothing to do with good government, Mr. President. This motion is just a way for the Australian Labor Party to prevent and stop Australians having tax cuts. That's what they are trying to do this afternoon. Order, they are trying Senator to delay, Wall. having to cover the position themselves, trying to delay how, how Australians getting the benefit of a tax cut, Mr. President. And that's why this suspension motion should be rejected, Mr. President, because we should deal with these matters that are important that were uh, central to the recent federal election campaign, uh, we should get back to the job of dealing with those and those substantive matters right now. Mr President, um, as I have said in the last couple of weeks, the Australian government takes seriously the need uh, to have competitive gas prices in this country and to do so in a way which continues to attract investment in gas supply. Mr President, we have, uh, in my view, in the last couple of years approached this important matter in a considered and diligent fashion. We've also done so in a collaborative way with all stakeholders, with the users of gas in this country. Many conversations and meetings with gas users, manufacturing users of Australia, uh, uh, the Energy Users Association of Australia, as well as a gas producers <coughs> as well. Uh, and that approach has led, Mr. President, to in the last two years, gas prices, wholesale gas prices, have fallen by 20 uh, per cent. We've gone from a situation two years ago where the Queensland coal seam gas industry was barely supplying gas. For a few months to the rest of Australia in, in net terms, uh, to today Queensland coal seam gas supplying 25 per cent of the East Coast market, uh, over 100 petajoules a year. It's been a very good outcome for our gas markets. It's provided a lot of gas into the system, albeit I recognise that our prices are still much higher than they were before. Mr. President. And on that front, we, 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 the two years ago, when, sorry, sorry, six years ago when, when the trains and, and Gladstone started to be built and constructed, when the Australian Labor Party were in government, no one, no one, no one looked at whether or not uh, building six trains in Gladstone and establishing a massive gas industry, a gas export industry, would have and what effect that would have on the domestic market. No one looked at this. In the, in the, in the time since uh, the Shadow Energy Minister of the Labor Party, Mark Butler, said that everybody knew at the time gas prices would go up, yet they still did nothing back in 2012 when they approved these projects. Now, Mr. President, we don't want to see that happen again. That's why we have been the first government to put in place export gas controls. We've done so in a methodical way, as I've said. We've done so in a way that will continue to make any developments in this area in that fashion. What we won't do is the kind of ad hoc response Senator the Australian Watt. Labor Party is adopting. They've had, Mr. President, in the last two weeks, the Australian Labor Party had three different positions on gas. Two weeks ago, uh, their shadow minister for resources, Joel Fitzgibbon, told Fran Kelly on Radio National that we want a bipartisan approach to this. It's too important for politics. We want to be part of the solution, not part of the problems. I've already had discussions with Matt True. Cannon on this issue, and we need to gather, work together to get it right. I agree and support those sentiments. Then today, I come into the chamber and Senator Pratt moves a motion to trigger gas export controls today. Do it today. That's not exactly bipartisan. That's completely inconsistent with your own shadow minister. You're a complete and utter rabble. And then also today, Matt Keogh. Uh, your member for Burt uh, said on Sky News when he was asked about gas triggers and gas reservation, he said, I think it's a concern. We want to see the detail of this because I don't want to see the government doing it. It creates a sovereign risk. And then his own senator comes in here from Western Australia and moves a motion to create sovereign risk. It is an absolute rabble, the Australian Labor Party, Mr. President, and that is why we should deny this motion. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, what a performance we had there from Senator Patrick. He likes to have two middle names that he's built his reputation on, transparency and accountability. Well, that has completely gone out the window here today. His performance of how he's come in here to try and justify this was completely lacklustre, absolutely lacklustre. So never again will the Labor Party be lectured to by Senator Patrick on transparency and accountability. He's the one who's done the deal and he's the one who's refusing to explain it, and we will absolutely hold him to account because there's bigger things at stake here. There's the tax cuts, which we are expected to vote on today. Uh, we know that they are worth $158 billion. So the Senate are expected to vote on that today, and we don't know what deal you've done. Uh, and this is more than just the tax cuts, because whatever deal you've done will have an impact on policy across Australia, and particularly in my home state of Queensland. So it is absolutely unacceptable that you do some sort of deal, and then you don't actually come in here and explain it. And it's absolutely reprehensible that Senator Kenavan hasn't explained it to the people of Queensland as well. Uh, because we know in Queensland that these sorts of things around gas have a significant impact. And the only state that's actually done anything about gas prices over the last couple of years has been Queensland. None of what Senator Kenavan has talked about has actually had an impact. It's been the Queensland government that's actually been delivering and ensuring that 
producers in Queensland have the gas that they need. No better example of that than Incitec Pivot. Senator Kennevan didn't have a role in that, but it was the Queensland government that was making sure that there was new gas being um, provided so that those workers could be looked after at Incitec Pivot. The Queensland Labor government, Kennevan was absolutely missing when it came to that. But we also know that when it comes to Senator Cormann, and when I got into work today, I was in a bit of a bad mood, so to get some cheering up, I put on Sky News, which always gives me a bit of a boost. And there I heard Senator Cormann uh, talking about uh, his arrangement with the crossbenchers, saying he had no deals. Uh, and I heard him talk about it in relation to Senator Lambie. I heard him talk about it in relation to the Senate Alliance. But as we know um, from previous experience, and former Prime Minister Turnbull learnt this the hard way, um, Senator Cormann is always doing things behind the scenes. And there's no doubt that he's come to an arrangement here uh, with Senator Griff. Uh, we know that there's a pretty cosy relationship between their officers, but they are not being upfront with the Australian people, and that is of a concern from, particularly for me in Queensland, because I know this does have an impact in that area. Uh, so what we need to know is the impact that this will have on Queensland, uh, what sort of arrangement they've come to, and what that will do for jobs in Queensland. Uh, I know that manufacturers across the country are crying out for a solution around gas. Yet we have seen no details, uh, no evidence about what this impact will have for those workers and for those businesses, let alone for future investment. Uh, so we know how important gas is for both uh, feedstock and also the jobs that go with that. So we've got no sense from the government, from Senator Patrick, who came in here and did not explain uh, what was going to be done. Uh, so overall, uh, this is completely unsatisfactory. That. Uh, tonight we are expected to vote on these tax cuts. Uh, we're expected to um, just let this go where uh, Senator Patrick won't, won't outline what deals have been done with the government. Uh, Senator Cormann is saying that there is no arrangement in place uh, and the Australian people are being hoodwinked. Uh, well, it is not good enough. Uh, the Australian people absolutely deserve better uh, and we will continue to hold this government to account and we'll continue to hold Senator Patrick to account. And never again will we be lectured to him on accountability or transparency ever again. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, this Labor Party, look at him, look at him. Talk about being so committed to a high taxing, high spending agenda that they will do absolutely anything to try to stand in the way of the Australian people getting the tax relief that the Australian people voted for at the election just on May the 18th just on May the 18th. And here we have a Labor Party who come into this Senate chamber and they will try to twist order. and contort Senator and Birmingham. take points Senator of Long order. On a point of order. I'm happy to withdraw my motion if you table the deal and we can get on with the debate. Order. Senator Birmingham, please continue. There is no deal. Mr President, indeed. These answers have been well addressed uh, indeed by Senator Patrick himself, by Senator Cormann, but you've got a Labor Party uh, who just want to find any justification for their hopeless inability to support tax cuts for hard-working Australians. That's what this is about. They're running around looking under rocks, desperately hoping to find some reason that justifies the fact that they can't bring themselves to vote for tax cuts for hard-working Australians. All of this could have been avoided if they just listened to the verdict of the Australian people on May the 18th. All of this could have been avoided if they just heard that the Australian people were supporting lower taxes, not higher taxes. And the reason that they got their lowest primary vote in 100 years, they got their lowest primary vote in 100 years is because of their high taxing agenda. Because you walked around places around the country and misled people. In your home state, Senator Watt, Mr Shorten stood there in front uh, of workers and said, well, I'll think about giving you a tax cut, but what his plan was was to actually Order. increase the Senator taxes Birmingham. on those workers. Um, the time for this debate has expired, pursuant to the motion uh, adopted by the Senate earlier today. Uh, we will be returning to the tax bills. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. <clears throat> I present uh, report number 93 of the Productivity Commission, a better way to support veterans. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day. Treasury laws amendment. Tax relief so working Australians can keep more of their money. Bill 2019. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator Wish Wilson. Let me summarise 
in the last few minutes that I have left that the Greens clearly and loudly reject this government's tax package, its plan, its vision for the Australian economy that gives more money to millionaires and risks the services that vulnerable Australians so desperately need into the future. These tax cuts will do nothing to help those who need our funds the most. They will do nothing to restructure Australia's economy for the 21st century. They will hamstring future governments from providing the public services, the infrastructure, the vision that will underpin a prosperous and happy Australia into the next century. They will turbocharge already growing inequality. These tax cuts are a $158 billion decision to starve future governments in favour of higher income earners having more money. The Greens believe in a different future for this country. We have a different economic plan for employing Australians, for tackling inequality, for tackling the great crises of our time. A $158 billion question. That's what we're voting on here today, all on the back of a political imperative for this government to go to an election to hang on to power. To hang on to power. We flatly, openly and loudly reject this unscrutinised legislation, this $158 billion, this attempt to bribe the Australian people to make sure the LNP can hang on to power and give more money to their rich mates. The Greens will continue to be the opposition in this place until the Labor Party decide to stand up and join us. I know that millions of people voted for the Labor Party around this country because they wanted an alternative to this government and their ideological agenda. And I know that so many of them would be disappointed out there this week in the first few days to see the Labor Party tank, to see them tank in their very first game of the season. That is absolutely crucial for this 46th parliament. We will continue to be the real opposition in this place and we will continue to push the Labor Party to stand up. Thank you, up. Senator Wish Wilson. Your time has expired. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on the government's disastrous $158 billion tax bill that is being rushed through Parliament. This is a $158 billion mistake. This is, terribly, this is a terribly irresponsible choice that the people of Australia will be forced to wear the consequences of for decades to come. How can this government look the 700,000 people barely surviving on New Start in the eye and say, you know what? We can't afford to increase New Start. We can't afford to support you, but you won't believe what we can afford to do for the very rich. Shame on you. I actually half expected you lot over there to be wearing monocles and top hats today, like some British aristocrats. Three million Australians are living in poverty, yet your first business, order of business is about helping the most rich people pay less tax. That is what is at the core of stage three of this bill. This giant bribe will turbocharge growing inequality and deliver rivers of gold to societies most well off, who need it the very least. That's the reality. The majority of the benefits of the Liberal National Plan will go to the top 20 per cent of income earners, including millionaires and billionaires, while the bottom 20 per cent receive just 3 per cent of the benefits. Let that sink in. Inequality is rising. We face terrible wage stagnation for working Australians. We know that fewer and fewer Australians are employed in secure full-time work and that young people face enormous underemployment. Homelessness and poverty are on the rise. Poverty is increasingly feminized, and women face a huge gender pay gap. 
We know that wages won't rise, jobs won't appear out of thin air, and inequality won't reduce without government planning and investing for it. A climate emergency looms large in the landscape of growing inequality. As the crisis worsens, its health and financial costs will drive a wedge between those who can afford to adapt to the destruction of our world and those who are left to bear the brunt of a total climate meltdown. So what does the government do when faced with these twin challenges of inequality and climate crisis? They lock the country into a $158 billion giveaway that will only accelerate inequality and leave us without the revenue we need to build a society that can beat climate change. And while they're at it, they will have dismantled our progressive tax system. And why the heck is Labour ditching progressive taxation? Make no mistake, these handouts to the wealthy are nothing short of an existential attack on the principal foundations of our progressive tax. If the Liberals have their way, our tax system will become less progressive than it has been at any time since the 1950s. They would have us in the absurd situation where someone earning $200,000 nearly four times the median wage, pays tax at the same rate as someone earning less than the median wage. How is this fair? Now, tax <coughs> systems might not be the most exciting thing to talk about, but we can never forget that progressive taxation is the linchpin of an egalitarian <laughs> society. There is no greater leveler than a truly progressive redistribution of wealth to ensure vulnerable people are cared for and we all share in the profits of our labor. At the World Economic Forum meeting at the start of the year, historian Rutger Bregmans put it clearly when he said ending inequality and poverty was quite simple. And this is what he said, and I quote, taxes, taxes, taxes. All the rest is bullshit in my opinion. An effective progressive system of taxation is the building block of a society that wants to be built on collective good not individual greed. A progressive tax system recognizes that wealth is more often an accident of luck and class than a measure of effort or ingenuity. It places our obligations to each other, society and the betterment of our world at the center of government. This legislation spells the sad, sorry end to that system. Debate over taxes goes right to the heart of how governments should serve the people. By choosing to pursue vast handouts to the rich, the government has abdicated its responsibility of life-making, its responsibility to give citizens the support, the services, and the safety net they need to live a good life. If we were to accept the idea, as Labour seems to have done, that we should take any opportunity to minimize the life-making work of government, and instead give handouts to the most wealthy, then we have already conceded far too much ground to the Liberals' small government trickle-down crap. The tragedy of this legislation is not just that a majority of the $158 billion will benefit the most wealthy, but that future governments will be unable to use those funds to provide services and infrastructure that benefit everyone. Instead of giving our schools and hospitals, the NDEIS, the aged care, to care for students, the sick, people with disability, and the elderly, which is what we need right now, the government is giving tax cuts to millionaires. We urgently need to lift wages, reverse cuts to penalty rates, fund domestic violence services, give raises to New Start and Youth Allowance. These are decades <coughs> overdue, but the government is giving tax cuts to millionaires. We cannot allow the government to forestall the investment and transformation we need to restructure Australia for the 21st century. We could see TAFE and university free for all, fully fund our public schools and make childcare free for all families. We could incorporate dental into Medicare and save social housing from the doldrums of underinvestment. We could work to guarantee secure work and a living wage to all Australians. 
but the government is giving tax cuts to millionaires. I have to say, I am deeply disappointed in the approach Labour has taken to these tax bills. They rightly call the third stage of this plan economically irresponsible and a joke, but then went right ahead and voted for it in the other place, and perhaps will do the same here. We need bold, united opposition to the Liberals' giant tax bribe, but instead Labour has been cowed by electoral fear. If they have begun their work in this term of Parliament, as they intend to continue, then there is much cause for despair. The Greens are fighting the government tooth and nail on this, and I sincerely wish Labour would join us instead of meekly joining the Liberals in taking a wrecking ball to our progressive taxation system and our future. I'm not sure what deals are being done behind the scenes with the crossbench to let this through, but I do know that it stinks, and it is exactly this kind of horse trading and deal doing that Australians hate. Where is the debate of ideas? Where are the principles here? Will you so easily lock Australians out of better education, of better health care, of better social security? Because if you go through with this tonight, this affects not only us, but many, many generations to come. Time and time again, Australians say that they want better services. A poll just last week showed that a strong majority, 78%, said maintaining government investments in health and education was the most important thing, and it was more important than legislating a tax cut for those on incomes of $200,000. Three quarters of the sample said people earning more than $150,000 should pay a higher rate of tax than workers earning just $40,000. Yet, here we are. This bill is part of the bigger plan to break down our concept of a society where we all look out for each other and instead stoke the idea that people should get what they can and to help with everyone else. Well, that's great if you're born into money, go to the right schools, are the right color, and have a name that isn't passed over automatically when people are looking at resumes. Please think of these people when you vote on this terrible bill today. Thank you, Senator Frukin. I just remind you it's not appropriate when quoting to use unparliamentary language. Thank you. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Slashing Government Services Bill 2019. Or should that be the Trashing Progressive Taxation Bill or the Increasing Inequality Bill? I am so angry and despairing that this bill is being proposed and absolutely horrified that Labor and most of the crossbench look like they are signing up to this attack on low- and middle-income, hard-working Australians. We've heard a lot today about low- and middle-income, hard-working Australians. And make no mistake, this bill is an attack on low- and middle-income, hard-working Australians. Because this bill puts a $158 billion hole in the 10-year revenue forecast. And this is on top of the other $167 billion hole that the 2018-19 budget tax cuts put in place. So in total, it's a $325 billion hole. $325 billion over the next 10 years that the government would rather hand out largely to high income earners than investing in services and investing in our society. I mean, imagine, imagine what we could do with that $325 billion. It's a mind-bogglingly big amount of money. Imagine what that $325 billion would do for reducing inequality and ending poverty in this country. We could invest that money in public housing, in raising New Start, in bringing dental care into Medicare and creating a world-class mental health system 
We could make free childcare available for the majority of Austra hundreds of thousands of young families, the majority of Australians who are accessing childcare. We could make TAFE and university free. We could be investing billions of dollars into our underfunded public schools. These are the political choices that we are making that are going to be made in this place today. It is a choice. It's a political choice as whether we invest in our society, invest in supporting the services for low and middle and all income Australians, or we give this massive tax hand handout to those who already have the most. I mean, how much of a dent? Could we make on the climate crisis with $325 billion, investing in solar, in wind, in pumped hydro and the electricity transmission network, in public transport and our electric vehicle charging network, in clean hydrogen exports to wean our economy off coal and gas and oil? How much could we invest in revegetating and rewilding our landscapes, increasing our carbon stocks while helping our regions cope with drought? and restoring critical habitat to help stem the extinction crisis. Or imagine the jobs and the nation-building potential of spending $325 billion extra on infrastructure. We could expand and upgrade rail services across our cities and regions. We could expand and electrify our bus services right across Australia so that all Australians has, have access to fast, frequent, clean, affordable public transport. We could build the long-awaited high-speed rail between Melbourne, Canberra, Sydney and Brisbane. Why is no one in this chamber other than the Greens asking these questions? Why is it taken as a fait accompli that this is the right way to be spending $325 billion of revenue over the next decade? I mean, we Greens accept that the economy needs a stimulus, but there are so many ways to create that stimulus and so many better ways to create that stimulus than giving tax cuts to those who already have a lot. I mean, all the measures that I've just mentioned would provide massively more stimulus than handing over billions of tax cuts to the wealthy, who are likely to sock most of it away in their bank accounts, in their shares, in overseas travel. The difference in stimulus is what happens if you give more money to low-income earners. You increase New Start. You increase youth and student allowances, you reduce health costs, you reduce childcare costs and provide new jobs in green infrastructure, and every single dollar that is spent there is going to flow back into the local economy. And plus, we can expand and increase the low-income tax offset that would put extra money in the pockets of low-income earners in a targeted way rather than splashing most of the largesse around to the wealthy, who frankly are not going to trickle this money down into the economy. The trickle-down effect is absolute bunkum, and it has been shown to be that over the last 40 years. It has shown to not exist, to be wrong. All the trickling down that is going to occur from this largesse being given to the richest in our society will be the trickling down of the final drops of the one bottle of Dom Perignon before popping open the bottle of the next. Yes, this government took this package to the election, but less than six million Australians of the over 14 and a half million who voted in the 2019 Senate election voted for this package. There is no mandate here except the fictional one that this government are claiming for this atrocity. The people of Australia elected the government into a minority in this chamber, so let us do some scrutiny. Let's give them some opposition. Let's embrace our mandate to be a check on this government. This bill is a massive failure of vision by the government by the opposition and by the crossbench. We're three days into this new parliament, and the number one priority of this chamber is giving the richest 20 per cent of income earners a great big tax cut. Frankly, it is sickening. 
The Greens will not stand for it. We need leadership in this country to tackle the challenges of our time, not business as usual. We need leadership to be tackling inequality in this country, to be tackling our climate crisis, to be tackling our extinction crisis. It is not the time for business as usual, where the rich get the spoils and the rest of Australia is left to pick up the pieces. I call on all members of this chamber to rethink their position on this legislation and to vote against what is a dagger in the heart of a fair and equal society. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, ma um, Madam Deputy President. Um, after lengthy discussions with the government to address concerns that Centre Alliance has about rising energy costs and particularly the high uh, electricity costs in South Australia, uh, Centre Alliance has decided to support the government's personal tax cuts legislation. Supporting the tax cuts will reward hard-working Australians and provide a stimulus to the economy that almost all economists have called for, including the Reserve Bank Governor. Controlling energy costs will help people on Newstart, workers, pensioners, small businesses uh, and, big, or, and big businesses, all who have been struggling with high energy costs. Centre Alliance does have a concern about Stage 3, noting there is the potential for a slowing economy, but notes that the government have steadfastly refused to split the bill. We do not want to delay uh, tax cuts and the stimulus effect they provide, and note that the parliament has the ability to react if we have a softening economy, should that occur, somewhere between now and 2024, when Stage uh, uh, 3 is due to come into effect. The gas measures developed by the government will make the, the economy more competitive and that will serve to mitigate risk of a downturn, simply because we are an open uh, trading economy uh, and we need to make sure that our energy costs are uh, competitive. Energy feeds into every sector of the economy. It doesn't matter whether you're uh, uh, cooking fish and chips for a living, whether you are uh, uh, running a, uh, a tuck shop, it doesn't matter whether you're running a chemical company. They all involve the use of energy, and if our energy costs are high, we are uncompetitive. And so it's really important that we uh, make sure that, uh, that uh, these energy costs are uh, reduced. The last thing we we'll have happen is for people to get a rebate designed to help them and to help stimulate the economy, only to find that it, that, uh, that rebate gets gobbled up by energy companies. So let me talk about gas. As I said, energy is used in every sector of the economy, and uh, if, it's, if the energy costs are high, it makes us an uncompetitive economy. Now, 51 per cent of electricity generated in South Australia is generated from gas. It is gas that sets the price in South Australia, Victoria and Tasmania. ACCC Chairman Rod Sims has forecast that gas prices will rise. and I think everyone is sort of alive to uh, that issue and would be concerned about that. And I might point out that Centre Alliance went to the last election with a uh, promise to, to commit or to uh, force a reduction in energy prices. So let me just tell you some gas facts. In 2013-14, Australians paid between three and four gigaliter, sorry, giga, three and four dollars per gigajoule of, of gas. Then what happened was. Six LNG trains were uh, developed uh, at Gladstone in Queensland to allow for the export of gas. Uh, in conjunction with that, production uh, of gas in Australia tripled. Except there was a problem. The companies uh, that were exporting the gas actually turns out they didn't quite calculate things properly and there wasn't enough gas uh, in country. Oh, sorry, in the uh, uh, reserves that they were uh, uh, planning to, uh, uh, to serve these export markets. And as a result, they turned 
to the domestic market and started uh, buying up gas that was otherwise uh, there for Australians. In, in 2017, there were South Australian companies coming to see uh, actually former uh, Xenophon, uh, Senator Xenophon and myself as his advisor, basically stating it's not the, the price that concerns us. We can't even get an offer for gas. That's how short things were in the Australian market. And unfortunately, the gas companies simply decided to uh, make sure they could fulfil their contracts with overseas entities at the expense of Australian companies. A totally unacceptable situation and one which uh, lacks uh, uh, social licence. So Senator Alliance uh, sat down with the government back in 2017. So just everyone understand, this is a long-running long discussion that Senator Alliance has been having with, with the government. Back in 2017, we sat down with the, uh, with the government and uh, uh, negotiated with them, again against concerns about people in South Australia not being able to get a gas offer. We negotiated the Australian Domestic Gas Security Mechanism. Uh, I did that with Senator Canavan. Now, that, uh, that gas mechanism allows the government to forecast supply, and if uh, there's a risk that the supply won't meet the demand in the domestic market, they can pull the trigger and, in effect, stop uh, gas exports uh, re and recommence them in a manner which ensures that uh, there is enough supply for uh, the Australian gas market. Now the interesting thing is that uh, uh, that measure uh, was interesting. The, the mechanism's never been pulled, but the gas companies know that it's there, and as a result, they have made sure there is enough supply in the Australian market now. Unfortunately, they've kept the the uh, the price tight. They've, they've only just uh, provided enough gas to meet supply, and that has kept the price tight. Okay? And, uh, you know, one of the problems we have here is there are very few gas companies here in, in Australia. There's a cartel-style operation uh, going on here, uh, mostly uh, foreign-owned uh, uh, foreign companies that are doing this. So we ended up with this, uh, with this gas mechanism, and it, uh, it did help to resolve uh, the problem. However, we now need to address price. It's clearly addressed supply but not price. Now I want to just talk to you about some of these companies, some of these companies that are here in Australia uh, exporting our gas. One of them is Shell Holding, uh, Energy Holdings Australia Limited, and I want to inform you that that company has uh, generated over the last four years, thanks to our tax transparency laws, we know this, they have generated $53 billion of revenue from 13, 14 all the way through to 16, 17. And you know how much tax they've paid? $1.1 billion in company taxes. Okay, so $53 billion of revenue and somehow across those four years only paid $1.1 billion in tax. Origin Energy Limited. It earned $51 billion over the same period and paid only $108 million in tax. ExxonMobil, Australia Limit, a Proprietary Limited, $33 billion over four years uh, they uh, took in revenue and paid zero, paid zero tax in that time frame. Now, I come from business. I understand the difference between revenue and taxable income, but I also understand the concept that companies need to make profit to survive. If you've got a company that year after year after year is not making a profit, there's something uh, untoward going on, something strange going on for, for that to occur. And the big problem I have, and we were talking about taxes and, and the Greens are talking about services and facilities and so forth, is that we find that these, these companies, in paying no tax, uh, are doing so whilst they benefit from our fantastic education system. 
where they've got educated uh, workers and trained workers, uh, where they've got workers who have uh, medical cover, unlike in other countries that they might, op might operate. They've got infrastructure that's been provided to them. They've got uh, a security provided by uh, the various different security and defence agencies in this country, and they've got the rule of law. They enjoy all of that, and yet they pay no tax. And that's a totally unacceptable uh, situation in my view. They enjoy the benefits of Australia, the, uh, Australia's civil environment, but they don't pay for any of it. These companies have lost their social licence. Last year we saw banks and financial institutions become the centre of attention for misconduct. This year it's the gas cartels. I'm calling you out. You are un-Australian. You are not contributing. You uh, are happy to fill uh, your contracts to meet your own commercial objectives at the expense of Australians who are struggling with energy prices. There are people in South Australia, elderly people, who cannot turn on their heaters during winter, cannot turn on their air conditioners during summer. A totally unacceptable situation whilst these gas companies enjoy uh, our gas to export for their profit uh, that somehow is not booked here in Australia. And, uh, you know, just as a general uh, uh, indication to uh, any company that's not paying tax, I have the tax transparency uh, uh, um, uh, spreadsheet from the ATO, and uh, I'll be using it extensively uh, throughout the next few years, naming the companies that are not paying tax. Because, uh, in my view, it's shameful. I get that some, some companies will, don't make a profit, and uh, that's okay. But when you consistently don't pay tax, you are going to get called out. <clears throat> so we've had a tripling of production, uh, yet the price of gas in Australia has also tripled. Now, how does that work? We've got, uh, we're now paying about $9 per gigajoule. Remember at the start I said we were paying $3 to $4 per gigajoule. We're, we're now paying 20 per cent more for our gas than our Asian friends are paying for our gas. How broken is that? And we're now seeing a situation where around Australia there are five import terminals being planned, being looked at to, to be developed. We are the largest exporter of gas in the world, yet we are building import terminals. And some, of them tell, some people tell me that's a solution to the problem. It's not. It's a symptom of the problem. We have to do something about our gas prices. Rod, uh, ACCC uh, Chairman Rod Sims uh, said in a release uh, about a month ago, uh, and I quote, high gas prices remain a critical issue for domestic gas users and could see more businesses move or close in the East Coast. He pointed to an announcement by Dow Chemicals that it would close its Melbourne manufacturing plant in part uh, due to high gas prices. It came after Remipac, a Sydney-based producer of uh, polystyrene coffee cups, and Claypave, a Queensland-based uh, brick and paving company, entered administration citing rising gas costs as an important contribution to the decision uh, to, to go into administration. I'm also reliably informed by industry that some, gas, uh, some, some companies are deferring investment in this country and some are simply going elsewhere because of our high energy costs. There has been a market failure here in Australia, and where there is a market failure, that is where governments intervene. Centre Alliance has worked with the government on both short and long-term actions to deal with our gas market concerns. A, a policy package will be announced. So, in terms of transparency, people are worried about uh, you know, something secret that's happened. The government has assured us that over the next few months they will announce their policies as they become fully developed. Uh, I've indicated some of the things that are likely to be in that policy. Okay? I've talked about publicly changes to the ADGSM uh, to deal with the current uh, lack of supply. As I said, there is supply but not sufficient supply to drive prices down. 
Uh, market transparency measures, measures to deal with uh, um, the monopoly nature of East Coast, uh, East Coast gas pipelines. Now, I'm not letting away any secrets there. Go and have a look at the ACCC's East Coast gas market report. It talks about it in there. Nothing wrong with the monopoly pricing, they say. Um, there's nothing unlawful about it. But we do have a monopoly situation on the East Coast gas market, and the government is looking at, uh, is looking at that. And we've, we've heard Matt Canavan uh, uh, talking on, uh, sorry, Senator Canavan, I apologise, uh, talking about uh, longer-term uh, measures uh, to ensure um, that projects uh, deliver a surplus uh, supply to the Australian gas market. Okay, so th there's some of the things that uh, Senator Alliance has talked to the government about, and we will continue talking to the government uh, about it. We started back in 2017 talking about not just the ADGSM, uh, we, we talked about use it or lose it gas policies uh, uh, on, uh, on retention leases. There are a number of things we talked about uh, back in 2017, and there's been a continuum of discussion with the government about this. So, whilst the Labor Party have been in their cabinet room working out tactics to, to play things out in this chamber, uh, we've been working with the government on sensible policies moving forward. And so, uh, you know, turning to Labor's criticism of what, of what Centre Alliance have done, uh, and, and of course, all we've done is ensure that workers will get a tax cut, and we're ensuring that gas and electric, electricity prices will fall. Let me read from the advertiser's editorial. Uh, on Labor's position on this bill, and I quote, Labor, however, dealt itself out of the equation by muddled strategy, uh, appearing confused about whether or not to support tax cuts. And I don't think we'll know until later tonight whether they do or don't support tax cuts. And once again, to the question of transparency raised in the, de the debate associated with the suspension of uh, standing orders, uh, a draft policy suite has been developed. Uh, it's been developed sufficiently uh, enough, far enough to understand its effect, but not the implementation of it. Okay? Uh, so it's not finalised, and the Labor Party ought to know that it is not appropriate to, to release half, um, uh, you know, half described policies that don't go to the implementation. That could also affect the market, actually. So. Uh, that's, you know, I, I've been given an assurance by the finance minister, uh, Senator Cormann, that, uh, uh, that he will, or the government will at some stage, announce these policies. And, uh, and it's not too far off. They just have to properly uh, uh, bed them down in terms of their implementation. So we are uh, quite confident that it will produce results that will complement the tax cuts, lower taxes and lower energy prices. Full stop. Finally, we are mindful of the uncertainty in the economy. Perhaps the, the economy will turn in a southerly direction, but equally so, it could turn in a northerly direction. If you look at the budget papers, the assumptions used for, 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 for um, iron ore prices is $55 a tonne, and it's currently above 100. So you know, the, bud the budget papers are relatively conservative. We took briefings from Treasury, from uh, 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 the Reserve Bank Governor, from uh, the ACCC Chairman, from a whole range of people looking at uh, whether or not we should trust what was in the budget papers. Um, but even if it turns southerly, it is the role of a parliament to deal with uh, that southerly change. And, uh, uh, if indeed the Labor Party are of the view that there is a southerly change coming and that these tax cuts are not um, are the right solution, they can embark on a campaign. They can embark on a campaign of, of coming out and telling people that at the next election we intend to raise taxes. That's what they can do. If you think that's the solution, you're quite welcome to do that. You can get out there and campaign to increase taxes if you really think this is the, uh, the wrong outcome. We, we on balance, thinks, think that this is the right uh, uh, direction to go. Uh, we recognise that uh, in future there can be further changes. We recognise that the government uh, will continue to listen to us on gas. There's no conspiracy here, just good policy development, good working 
working between the crossbench uh, and the government on this particular issue. So uh, we're quite satisfied that this is, on balance, the right thing to do, and Centre Alliance will be supporting uh, the legislation as it uh, currently stands. Thank you. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. For the majority of workers across Australia, tax is the necessary evil our nation has been built on. It's also the lubricant that keeps a large portion of our society from falling between the cracks. Let's face it, none of us like pain any more than we have to. And as Kerry Packer famously said, of course I am minimising my tax. And if anybody in this country doesn't minimise their tax, they want their heads red. Because as, as government, I can tell you, you're not spending it that well that we should be donating extra. And Kerry Packer was right. This government, like the last, haven't done a great job spending your money. They've managed to double the debt left by Labor in 2013, leaving Australians with a total government debt edging closer to $600 billion by the day. It's important this parliament had this debate over personal tax cuts. And let me say from the outset, Australian workers deserve a tax cut. I'll say it again. Australian workers deserve a tax cut. The misconception reported by media that I don't support tax cuts is completely false. And, uh, and overnight, I wrote to the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, to re reiterate my support for stages one and two of the bill. I've got no doubt that the people from my home state of Queensland and those right across the nation have been left confused by the government's proposal. So for their sake and the sake of correcting the record, I'd like to break this down. In the previous parliament, One Nation supported the Treasury Laws Amendment known as the Personal Income Tax Plan that was legislated and announced in the 2018-19 budget. These new proposals that this government are here to legislate today are in three stages. And I, as I have said to the government and the media, I support the first two stages, but cannot support the third stage which isn't due to take effect for five years or two further elections. Stage one, which will come into effect immediately, will increase the low and middle income tax offset and provide a maximum of $1,080 back in the pocket of everyday Australian workers within an income bracket of between $48,000 and $90,000 per annum. I'm happy with that. Stage two will kick in from the 1st of July 2022 and replace the low and middle income tax offset by increasing the low income tax offset to $700 and lift the marginal tax rate of 19 cents in the dollar from $41,000 to $45,000. Stage three is planned to take effect five years from now or two elections away on July 1, 2024 and will reduce the marginal tax rate from 32.5 cents in the dollar to 30 cents and apply to those people earning up to $200,000 a year. These three stages of personal tax cuts will cost the government a total of $158 billion and not a single member of the government can guarantee me that our economy will be capable of sustaining the full tax cuts over the next half a decade. It's stage three that's got me most concerned. Concerned because yesterday the national um, cash rate dropped to 1 per cent. Australia has never had a cash rate of 1 per cent. Australia is quite literally on the cusp of a recession and this government are hell-bent on the idea of surrendering $158 billion in tax cuts. If you were to ask me, much of regional Australia has been in an unofficial recession, but most of you in the Senate haven't bothered to visit regional Australia. Over the past three years, I've watched this Senate destroy Australian jobs with ever-increasing power prices that have either shut down far too many manufacturing businesses or forced others to move their operations offshore. 
These power costs are also crippling everyday households, including vulnerable pensioners and the unemployed. According to the Australian Energy Regulator, my home state of Queensland recently recorded the highest number of residential electricity customers disconnected in their annual report on compliance and performance of the retail energy market. That's 27,910 Queenslanders left in the dark due to ever-increasing electricity prices across the country. Try telling the more than 72,000 people in this country that had their electricity cut off across Queensland, New South Wales, South Australia, the ACT and Tasmania that the third stage of tax cuts are good for them. Maybe Senator Lambie should have been more concerned about the 6,664 people in her state who have had their power cut off over the last six years instead of passing stage three of the tax cuts. Maybe Senators Griff and Patrick should have given consideration to the 22,826 people in South Australia who have had their power cut off instead of passing stage three in these tax cuts. This government have deceived the people of Australia by saying they're bringing down power prices, when the truth is that over the past 10 years power prices have risen 117 per cent. That's the truth. Power prices have risen 117 per cent across Australia. But rather than quarantine the third stage of tax cuts for the purpose of building more coal-fired power stations and drought-proofing water projects like the hybrid Bradford Water Scheme, this government have ignored the desperate pleas of everyday Australians and will give further tax cuts to those on up to 200000 a year in five years' time. Is there any wonder why so many hard-working Australians are doing it tough, trying to make ends meet with the ever-increasing cost of living? I watch my own children struggle to pay their mortgages, electricity bills and put food on the table. My concern with passing third stage is a matter of future economic stability of, for our nation. I didn't create and run four successful businesses before entering politics without having an idea on how to manage money. And all I've asked is that this government shelve the third stage in lieu of building much needed infrastructure. By Treasury's own advice to my office and Senator Roberts, they agreed that the economy can be stimulated by quality infrastructure projects like those I've suggested in power and water. This third stage will cost the government $95 billion in tax revenue, could be used to fund new coal-fired power stations giving the nation cheap, affordable and reliable power that is needed to keep our nation competitive and viable on the global stage. But no, this money will likely be spent on white goods and TVs manufactured in China and the rest eaten up by the forever rising cost of living. Anyone would think these tax cuts were tied to the Chinese Free Trade Agreement because, let's face it, it's China who will ultimately benefit from the third stage of these tax cuts because conservative, consecutive governments have helped to destroy our manufacturing industry. This government might get, and it looks like they will, their three stages. Tax cut package through today by paying off the debt of the Tasmanian Liberal State Government or by making further false promises on bringing gas prices down in South Australia, but I have another three years in this place to convince you to bring down power prices by building coal-fired power stations and to drought-proof the country by building the hybrid Bradfield scheme. My calling for these infrastructure projects is that they will be there for the long term. Tax cuts that, you can, that may be passed today in this, in this parliament can easily be taken away from the people by the same government or a new government in time to come. But if we build the infrastructure now in waterproofing Australia and giving cheaper power by putting in coal-fired power stations, that's infrastructure that can never be taken away by the people and giving us what we need. 
How many millions of dollars have been spent by this government when drought affects our country? When we see farmers on their knees because they don't have the water? And we hear of, uh, of pensioners now who are actually dying because they can't have the power or they can't afford the power to keep them warm. This is absolutely disgraceful what's happening in this country. Like I said, I'm all for power cut, for tax cuts, and we should, because I think we are overtaxed in this nation. But I think that the Australian people would forgo their tax cuts if they knew the money was going to be put into infrastructure projects that will give them the long-term relief of being able to run their businesses, their farms, their households and support our pensioners and those who can least afford um, to pay their bills. Only God knows where the money will be to pay for these infrastructure projects in the future, but it won't stop me from persisting with my argument and standing up for the ignored people of this nation. And I just want to... Um, Senator Patrick was talking about the gas. One Nation has been talking about gas for over two years now, and especially that from the northwest shelf. We export approximately at the moment about $54 billion worth of gas to overseas, and he's correct. Japan is getting the gas cheaper than what Australia is. Out of that gas that we export, we bring in about $400 million in taxes. $400 million out of $54 billion um, export. It's disgraceful. The retention leases, which I've spoken to the government about constantly, they keep renewing the retention leases and some of the gas companies have had them up to 30 years and done absolutely nothing with them. Senator Canavan spoke today about the brows up there, how wonderful it is and, the, and what we're going to make out of the resources. Well, the Browse then have just built a pipeline of 900 kilometres to take it into the Northern Territory because if it went into um, Western Australia, they'd have to give a 15 per cent domestic gas supply. Oh, Western Australia is smart to actually get that domestic gas supply, unlike the rest of the country. What about the floating platforms? How do we know what gas they're taking out? There's, we're getting no money from that. And yet Japan charges, makes about $3 billion in excise on our gas that goes into their country. They make more out of our gas than what we do selling it. And Senator Patrick is right. We're building um, terminals here to bring gas from overseas from America. And we're one of the most gas richest, rich countries in the world. Yet no one wants to listen. It was one nation that started this discussion with Senator Canavan that we brought to his attention a lot of these issues with the retention leases, with the gas, what's happening up there, and things that he had no idea about. And since we brought it to the attention of the, of the parliament here, I'm pleased to see that the Greens have taken that up as well. And it's pleasing to hear now, now that Central Alliance have actually starting to talk about it. If we don't start addressing the energy costs in this nation, we are going to lose that many more businesses. You won't have to worry about you, you getting your tax because, well, you will, because the jobs won't be here. And there's another thing to consider. I have a company that's up in Rockhampton. They actually export to 50 countries and they employ 55 people. They actually have a third generation. Their electricity bill is going from $350,000 up to $550,000 in a year, but they've also have put $1.2 million worth of uh, panels on their roof, and yet their bill is going to increase. Are they going to stay here in Australia? Will they shut down? Are they viable? This is only one company, one business, and I hear it constantly all the time. I don't think you really grasp how important it is that we actually must do something about the energy costs in this country. That we are looking on the cusp of losing so much in industries and manufacturing and jobs unless we do address this. 
You've been led by the rest of the world to sign up to a Paris Agreement that is, is different in every country. And we've been demonised because we have coal, yet in the UK and Europe, we are act, they can actually burn municipal waste and wood chip, which is more uh, harmful to, to the environment, yet they, they are not condemned for it. Yet we, burning coal, doesn't put out as much as what they're burning, and yet we're demonised for it, and you're headed down this path. I will keep persisting with this matter in this chamber and to inform the Australian people what is happening. Because, it, as I said before, I travel this country quite extensively and I talk to people. They are doing it bloody tough, extremely tough. Is there job security? Is there a future for their kids? And it all comes down to energy prices. If we can actually really reduce the energy prices in this country, it will make a hell of a difference to a lot of people. These tax cuts are for the workers. Where's the relief for people who are on pensions or those self-funded retirees or those people who are you know, supported by the government? Where's the relief for them? The only relief that we can give them is by reducing power costs, reducing their bills to give them quality of life and, and let them feel that you know, someone is really listening to them, rather than we've turned a blind eye to our own people and we are more interested in being told what to do and how to run our country by, by the United Nations and other countries. So it's, um, my job here is to try and represent the people. I've had my say, and uh, as I said, I support the government's first and second stage. I cannot support the third stage, and I don't believe it is um, economically viable for our country. You can give me all your, your promises and your, your, the stability. No one can promise that we're going to have a stable economy five to six years down the track that we can afford it. That's not how I run my household, and that's not what I'm going to tell the Australian people how this parliament should be running their country. Senator Griff. Yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy <laughs> President. This bill is all about giving the economy the boost it very much needs and recognising that the 10 million Australian workers deserve a financial break. The Reserve Bank's decision to cut interest rates to an historic low of 1 per cent this week shows just how sluggish our economy is. The Reserve Bank's aim is to boost spending, which ultimately helps grow jobs, to further avoid stagnation. Putting, us, sorry, putting up to $1,080 in the pockets of those earning up to $90,000 as the immediate stage of tax cuts will do, will also help invigorate spending. Stage two of the tax cuts will come into effect from July 2022, and they'll lift the income threshold for people on the 19 per cent tax bracket from 41,000 to 45,000, which under our progressive tax system will put a little bit extra into the pockets of most taxpayers. It will also slightly lift the low income tax offset amount, and these changes will be welcome by low to middle income earners in particular, and are worthy of backing, even if they are three years away. We are less enthusiastic about stage three of the tax cuts, which don't come into effect until July 2024. No one can say with certainty what the economy will be like in 2024 and beyond. Although I note the government is at this stage predicting a surplus in the years leading up to it. If those surpluses disappear, any future government worth its salt will have an opportunity to modify stage three, if it needs to be modified, before the flattened tax brackets come into effect and potentially eat into government's revenue. Interestingly, this is an option, of course, that Labor has left open, which I believe is the fiscally responsible thing to do. We see that Labor is intent on introducing amendments to the bill, but this will be a fruitless exercise given the government has steadfastly refused to entertain any changes. We saw this in the last parliament when the Senate sought to amend the Treasury Laws Amendment Personal Income Tax Plan, which was passed in June last year. 
We tested the government's resolve, but it rejected the amendments and handballed the bill back to the Senate to pass it unchanged. An amended bill will not get through the lower house, and so ping-ponging this bill between chambers is totally pointless. What is more important is getting these tax cuts through to Australians who need them, and to give the economy the stimulus it very much desperately needs. I note that Senator Wish Wilson has also an amendment that will lift the starting amount for the low income tax offset to 1080. I actually think that that is a good idea. It will do what we need to do, which is to put more stimulus into the economy and more into the hands of those who need it most. But again, this proposition will be rejected by the government and has no prospect of success today. Of course, of equal importance to us is that money given in one hand isn't taken away by the other. So it's important for us that government implement a plan to deal with ever-rising energy costs which dramatically impact the public and business. To us, it's mainly about gas, which is something we have a lot of in this building, and it is being available and correctly priced so industry can be competitive and electricity generation can be more economical. Australia is the largest producer of gas in the world, but we are currently paying three to four times what we used to pay for gas before we started heavily exporting it in 2014-15. Just five years ago, we paid three to four dollars a gigajoule for domestic gas. Now, prices hit a crazy $21 in 2017, and they have since come down, but we are still paying anywhere in the region of between $8 and $12 per gigajoule. Now, that's a crazy situation that smacks of cartel-like activity, in my view. Reforms we have discussed with government in relation to the gas market will be developed further over the coming weeks and months and cover ways to enhance the Australian domestic gas security mechanism, which was negotiated by Central Alliance, or then NXT, back in 2017, and deals with the amount of gas available to the domestic market through to providing greater transparency on wholesale pricing and more. The likely policy package will be a combination of short-term and long-term measures that will ensure energy security and lower costs to businesses and industry and significantly reduce the cost of electricity generation. This is a very important bill. It will boost the economy and give 10 million Australian workers a welcome financial boost, something we are very happy to support today. Is anyone seeking the call? Senator Lambie? Mr President, these tax, cut, these tax cuts put money back into people's pockets. That's what it comes down to. It's not perfect. It's not a total shocker either. It's going to help, but it's not going to help everyone. I've spoken to the government and I've told them my concerns about this bill. I've told them that tax cuts don't help people who aren't able to find a job in the first place and people who are sleeping in their cars or in their tents in Tasmania. I've told them that if you really care about taking the foot off the throat of people who are doing it tough, you can't ignore those people doing it toughest of all. Tasmanians have a higher proportion of historical public housing debt than anywhere else, and we have thousands of people who need housing. The list is growing every year, and every year we get a cheque to start to chip away at that <coughs> list of people who need our help. And instead of putting that money to good use, we split it and send half of it straight back to Canberra. Half our social ho housing budget is sent back to Canberra. We've got a housing crisis in Tasmania and we're fighting it with one hand behind our backs. It's not good enough. It's so unfair. It's time we call time on this debt. People raise their eyebrows at the budget cost of these tax cuts. Tell me what you think about the human cost of telling a homeless single mum that she has nowhere to sleep tonight because Canberra needed that housing money more than what she did. I'm not saying everything about this bill is perfect, and I'm not saying that it's going to fix every problem people are experiencing. I'm just saying that if you ask me to choose between helping someone and helping nobody, then I know what I'm going to choose every single time, just as sure as day follows night. 
the tax cuts we're dealing with should be dealt with on their own merits, not on the deals or sweeteners that come attached to it. I'm not going to vote away my integrity for anything because it's all I've got in this place. So I'm voting with the government on this bill for what it does because on balance we need something more than what we're seeing out there. I didn't rush into making this decision. I heard the arguments from all sides. I've heard the argument that this tax cut will mean cuts to services. Let's remember that every tax cut reduces the amount of money available to be spent by governments, not just the ones you don't like. And just about everybody in parliament is in favour of the two of the three stages of the tax cuts, except the Greens, who apparently think people earning $1,000 a week should be paying more tax, not less. But when I follow the logic, if everyone here agrees, we should have some, we should have some service cuts to go along with our tax cuts. What we're really debating is how deep those cuts should go. I don't believe that's what we're debating, though. And I reckon nobody else here thinks that either, which shows that there's something broken about that logic. But in the meantime, the economy is really struggling. Tasmanian small businesses are practically dragging customers off the streets into their stores. Those customers don't have money in their pockets either because there aren't the jobs there. So I don't have to imagine what $1,000 would do for those struggling businesses and those struggling families. And I don't have to imagine what a struggling economy would look like six years from now. Because where I'm from, from where I'm looking, the economy is struggling now. Come see my neck of the woods in Tasmania and I'll show you why this bill matters so much. People need this tax cut out there and they need it yesterday. I've been told that we shouldn't lock in tax cuts years from now because we don't know what the economy will look like then. Can I just say that I hear, that all, that I hear all the time that people hate the way that politicians never do anything or have vision about the long-term future of this country. Now we've got a chance to do something beyond the short term. And everyone's saying that. Because we don't know what the world will be like in five years' time, we shouldn't do anything until we get there. If the economy gets worse between now and then, as this has, it takes a week to change the tax rates. If the economy can't handle a huge tax cut in six years, then people expect their politicians to say so, be upfront and be honest. And if the risk is too big to justify it, people will understand rolling it back or putting it on hold for the time being. The only way you can think that the worst bits of this tax bill are permanent is if you believe that nobody in this place can do the right thing and the responsible thing. I'm not, pre I'm not prepared to give up on the possibility that Parliament can show a little bit of guts and do the right thing when the time is right. I'm not prepared to walk away from tax cuts for low-income workers starting next week simply because we don't know if we'll be able to afford tax cuts for everybody else five years from now. If we can't afford it then, we don't go ahead. It is that simple. But I'll tell you what we can't afford to do either. We can't afford to leave people out to dry by blocking every part of this tax cut. People in Tasmania need this money to make ends meet. And while all this bill is being voted on today, not all of it is coming into effect today. In reality, it's more like something now or nothing now. Something for those people struggling on low incomes who are staring down another year without a pay rise for the blue collar worker. And that's something that makes a huge difference to me, I can assure you. Senator Steele John. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I was born on the 14th of October 1994. And that year, 24 years ago, uh, was the last time that the payment currently called New Star uh, was actually increased. In that same time, I can't even imagine how much the rates of pay for those of us in this place have gone up. In that time, the cost of living has soared. The cost of power has soared. 
The cost of simply existing has shot through the roof. And vulnerable people across this nation have cried out and looked to this place to do something about it. To help people who need it. And for 24 years, this place has done nothing. It has left the most vulnerable people in this country below the poverty line. To the point at which that community is screaming for assistance. And yet, this government's first order of business has been to tip $158 billion worth of taxpayer money to some of the richest people in our society. Now, in my time in this place, I've learned that politics is ultimately about choices. It is about the decisions that you make. This bill is about choices. This government is choosing to give over hundreds of billions of public funds to an economic project with no academic basis. There is not a shred of evidence that these tax projects will have a singular beneficial effect upon the Australian economy or upon our society. It is policy done by a wing and a prayer, and it is so much less than what the Australian people deserve from this place. People tonight are looking to this chamber, to their Senate, and they are deeply frustrated that as our first act we have chosen to act in this way. To give the chamber some idea of the colossal size of these messages for the same amount of money we could give dental care to all. We could create thousands of new aged care places. We could raise New Start and fund public education. For God's sake, for the same price we could make university free again. And yet we are choosing tonight to take this money and throw it to the wind. It is a complete sham. Now, as a young person who didn't spend their entire political life crawling up somebody's neck to end up in this place, I have often found what happens in this chamber to be somewhere between perplexing and more than a little bit sickening, and I have said so on many occasions. But I got to say, this is the polished turd to rule them all. There is not a single economist in this country, nor a credible one in the world, who would tell you that in the current economic context, it is a wise thing to spend this money in this way. And what really gets me is so many people during the course of this debate have used the vulnerability of our community members as an excuse for their support of this legislation. Well, tonight I call crap on that. Senator I Steele am from... Senator Steele John, order. Let's keep our language parliamentary, please. I shall endeavour. I am from a vulnerable community. I have lived that life. And let me tell you, let me tell you 
When you need the doctor, when you need a roof over your head, when you are wondering where your next meal comes from, it ain't the couple of bucks in your back pocket that comes from these tax cuts that helps you out. You can't take your hundred bucks down to Bunnings, buy a hip replacement and bang it in yourself. You need to go to the doctor. And that is what is enabled with the collective pooling of public funds. Taxation, public contribution, these <coughs> are the legislative embodiment of the Australian belief that when you are in trouble, when times are tough, we come together and help out. And if you are better off, you pay a little bit more, and if you are worse off, you pay a little bit less. And that is fair. And for decades, that has been the basis of the Australian tax and contribution system. And that fundamental tenant is being murdered tonight. You are seeking with this legislation to transform our society into a US style economy, a savage predator style capitalist state, which will drive millions of our most vulnerable people into the most crushing forms of economic equality and poverty. This is not a joke, folks. You come down to Rockingham. You come down and you meet with those people who are right now living in the bush next to grain silos on contaminated land because they can't find a single place to call their own and pay for it with the amount of money that you are given through New Start and rent assistance. That is their reality. You are making a conscious decision tonight in the face of all the evidence to the contrary not to help those people. Well, shame on this chamber. Shame on this chamber. There is nothing more shameful than walking past somebody in need and deciding not to help. But to be honest with you, for one side of this chamber, that isn't surprising. It's why you guys exist, to sell the Australian public the idea that your personal greed and your desire to maintain your ownership of property is somehow in the national interest. That's your guiding political principle. Hats off to you. You're doing a terrible job. But this side of the chamber was brought into existence for something better. You exist. You Australian Labour Party. You were created to do better. And you have been re-elected to this chamber in the role of the opposition. The role of which traditionally is to oppose things, to stare down a government agenda and say no. What we have seen so far, however, is nothing more or less than a urine soaked rollover. From Senator the Steele John, Senator Steele John, order. Uh, not with, that there's nothing the unparliamentary comment. about urine, surely. Withdraw the comment, Senator Steele. I withdraw the comment. A water soaked rollover. A damp rollover. An Albanese backflip. Your supporters are so disappointed in you tonight. They've been contacting my office all day. My Twitter inbox is full of people.
doing some variant of I have supported the Labour Party for all of my life. I was kicked in the guts by this election, but at least I hoped that there would be some kind of fight in the opposition. And you have, at their lowest moment, sent them the message that you're just going to let these guys get on with it. This intellectually vacant swill that have congealed themselves together into a government, you're just going to let them get on with it. Because it's too hard. It's too hard and you're too sad. Oh, you'd got the curtains cut for the windows. You were going to be this minister and that minister. It was all going to go as you'd planned and it didn't. And you're so sad. It's such a shame. And while you're having your little pity party, you're letting these folks get away with the largest bank robbery that's ever been perpetrated on the public purse. It is shameful. The best you could do today during question time was ask these guys whether they'd produce a letter. I mean, for God's sake, why don't you just give up and go home? It is utterly disgraceful. Folks are so disappointed and they are rightly disappointed. They are rightly disappointed. Now, my generation are staring down the barrel of a climate crisis. The reality that was shouted at you from the gallery upon the opening of Parliament, that is our lived reality. We are the generation which will live with the result of your inaction, of your craven political cowardice and your disgusting greed. You are gifting to us an unequal and polluted world, and we will not forgive nor forget your betrayal. This is the moment when the sides are being picked. History records our actions here, and it will look upon neither of you favourably. It is not too late tonight. It is not too late. You could join with the Greens, vote down this damned package and fight for a better Australia. You still can. You still can do that now. You can join with ACOS. You can join with the social sector. You can join with goddamn John Howard, who advocates an increase in Newstar. I never thought I would see the day. I never thought I would see the day when John Howard was a better advocate for people on Newstar than the Australian Labour Party. What a world we live in. What a brave new political context. You wonder why you didn't win? Well, today and tonight, this is exactly why. People want vision. They want hope. They want something to believe in. And they damn well expect us here to fight for them like our lives depended on it, because their lives do. Their lives do. As this miserable measure makes its way through the parliament tonight, none of you can say you do not know exactly what you are doing. When we come back to this place, in 12 months' time, in two years' time, in three years' time, desperately grappling with the reality that our economy and our environment is in free fall and we don't seem to be able to find enough money to do anything about it, it will be this moment 
that began the dissent. When you have folks coming up to you and saying, why the hell isn't our parliament fighting for us? This is the moment. You could represent your community. You could do what is right. You could fight for a better Australia. And you are choosing tonight. You lazy, greedy rump to put your own interests and the interests of your corporate donors ahead of the interests of the Australian people. This is the moment, let me say this very, very clearly, this is the moment when the mantle of leadership, the moment where the mantle of opposition passes from that sad smoking husk once known as the Australian Labor Party, on to the shoulders of the Australian Greens. Ours is now the role of keeping that light upon the hill burning, folks, because you sure as hell aren't in any state to do it. You sure as hell are not. We shall continue our work in this place. People will always have a voice in the Australian Parliament while we are here. We shall fight for our planet and our communities, and together we will win and restore some semblance of what the Australian people deserve to the actions of this chamber. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. It's a matter of um, some pride to me, having heard that ball-tearingly good speech from Senator Steele John, that uh, I'm a colleague of his in this place and also a good friend of his. He's been extremely articulate in placing the question before all senators tonight and in uh, explaining uh, very succinctly and at times somewhat graphically uh, the nature of the capitulation from the Labor Party. I mean, can we see the light on the hill from here? No. Me neither. Me neither. And there'd be Labor luminaries, past and present, rolling over, rolling over at the moment in horror at what the Labor Party is doing. Make no mistake, make no mistake, these tax cuts, take the axe, take the axe to the progressive system in Australia, the progressive tax system in Australia. And I'll take that interjection from Senator Gallagher saying they're the government we lost and we should be focusing on the government. Actually, that's your job. You're the opposition. You're supposed to oppose and hold the government to account, not roll over in a craven attempt to drag your bloody beaten carcass over the line at the next election. It's your job. But you know what? We'll stand up proudly here today, and we are standing proudly here today, doing your job for you and fighting to defend the progressive nature of the tax system in this country that was actually built by the Labor Party in times gone by when there was still a flicker left in the light on the hill. You see, you know when the volume goes up, don't you, uh, Acting Deputy President, that you're hitting some kind of a nerve in this place. Now, this, these tax cuts, these three tranches of tax cuts, make no mistake, are not made up of free money. There is no magic pudding here. These are going to come at a cost. And let me tell you about some of the costs of these tax cuts. These come at the cost of having any hope of getting a decent raise in Newstart any time soon. These are going to come at the cost, the opportunity cost, of funding public hospitals, health care, public schools in our education system, disability support services, public transport. Public, those public services that people expect their governments to deliver. This is not free money. It's not free money. There are horrendous costs 
to these tax cuts and people who need the support of public services to have any kind of a crack at a decent life in this country are being shafted well and truly today by the Liberal Nationals in here, by the Australian Labor Party in here, by Senator Bernardi, by Senator Alliance and by Senator Lambie. You all ought to be ashamed of yourself. Tax cuts for the millionaires and the billionaires at the expense of people doing it tough on pensions and new start. And in my state in Tasmania, where the benefits will be felt less than any other state of these tax cuts, that is a tragedy for our health system, for our public school system, for our transport systems, for our public housing systems. These, this decision is worse for my state of Tasmania than for any other state in the country. We have two electorates, Braddon and Lyons, in the four electorates that will benefit least from these tax cuts. Braddon benefits the second least out of any electorate in the country, and Lyons benefits fourth least out of any electorate in the country. What people in Braddon and Lyons need, and people doing it tough right through this country need, is an increase in the minimum wage. What we need is an increase in New Start. What we need is significant extra funding going into public education and into our public health system. And those are the costs of the decisions that people are making in this chamber today. Well, the Greens are going to hold firm. We're going to vote no to these tax cuts because we are unashamedly a party of increasing the scope and the quality of public services in this country. And in fact, we're not just unashamedly that party, we are proud to be that party, the only party left in this place that believes in significant increases into public services in this country. Now, I've heard all the arguments about some of these tax cuts being an off in the never never and after the next election, but they are going to be, in the words of one of the Labor luminaries, who I reckon will be pretty disappointed in this decision from the ROP, Paul Keating, L A W law. That's what these tax cuts are going to be, L A W law. And can anyone, even with the most fertile imagination in this place, imagine the Labor Party taking tax increases to the next election? Ha! It's not going to happen. I'll tell you now, it's not going to happen. And I'll take that interjection from Senator Cormann, who just agreed with me and said, that's right. And he knows, look at the smile on his face, he knows today he's locking the Labor Party in all the way through for the next couple of electoral cycles, at least to supporting these tax cuts. That's why Senator Cormann has got a beam on his face as we sit here in this chamber. And that's why, that's why Labor members are hanging their heads, because they know that I am right. They are never going to take a tax increase to the next election, because the mythology that's developed in the Labor Party over the last few weeks since the election we've just had is that their um, uh, somewhat marginally progressive agenda that they took to the last election was what cost them government. Actually, that's not, not what cost you government at all. It's not what cost you government at all. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what cost you government. Thanks for listening, Senator Gallagher. I'll tell you what cost you government. A failure to sell your policies, a failure to actually stand up for significant action on climate change. That's what cost you. The election, your failure to back in a proper rewrite of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, and your complete disconnect to younger people in this country. And you've just heard from the youngest senator in this place, a fantastic representative of young people in Australia, about how we are engaged in intergenerational theft by passing these tax cuts. Intergenerational theft. We are stealing the future of young people because we are bequeathing to them a climate that is breaking down, that is almost, if not already, past the point of no return. 
We are bequeathing ecosystems that are collapsing before our very eyes. We are bequeathing them a future where most of them can have no opportunity even to buy their own homes. Because, of course, the Labor Party won't take reform policies on capital gains tax and ne negative gearing to the next election either, because they will be too fearful to do it. So we are smashing up, and this needs to be on the record, we are smashing up the progressive tax system in this country today. Now I want to talk a little bit about the deals that have been done, because there is an unacceptable opacity around these deals. We understand there's been a letter written by someone in government to Centre Alliance around some uh, gas policy, but we haven't seen it. It hasn't been tabled in this Senate. It should be tabled because the Australian people have got a right to know what deals Senator Cormann has stitched up to get the numbers to get this over the line. And we also need to know uh, what deal Senator Lamb has done with the government. Now, I want to talk fractionally here briefly about the public housing debt in Tasmania. Now, the, the Greens in Tasmania, and I sat in the Tasmanian parliament for a long time, had the honour and the privilege of leading the Tasmanian Greens in the state parliament for many years. We were campaigning to have the debt forgiven uh, well before Senator Lambie came along. And I agree with Senator Lambie. I agree with her. That debt should be forgiven. It should be forgiven. There is no doubt about that. But I want to know, has Senator Lambie got a deal to get that debt forgiven? And if so, what is the nature of that agreement with the government? And I asked Senator Cormann to address those two points in his closing um, response once I've finished this speech. And if he doesn't do that, I'll put it to him again in the committee stages of this legislation. So these taxes are going to hamstring the capacity of not only this government but of future governments to deliver the public services that so many Australian people rely on. Now, in my home state of Tasmania, I want to put it on the record. The number of people in all of Tasmania earning over $180,000 a year is less than the number of people in just the Prime Minister's seat of Cook that own over $180,000 a year. I'll say that again. There are fewer people in Tasmania earning over 180 k per annum than there are in the seat of Cook that the Prime Minister represents in the other place. And in the Treasurer's electorate, there are over twice as many people earning over $180,000 per annum than there are in the whole of my home state of Tasmania. So senators voting for this deal, Tasmanian senators, and that will be every Tasmanian senator except me and Senator Wish Wilson, are selling our state down the river. Because you are making it harder, you are making it harder for future federal governments to help Tasmania's health system, to help Tasmania's public education system and to help uh, support uh, people, for example, on New Start who are obviously overrepresented in Tasmania compared to the rest of the country. So any time any senator for Tasmania in the future calls for an increase in New Start, calls for more money to go into the Tasmanian education system or the Tasmanian health system, I will be reminding them, you destroyed the chances of that today. You destroyed the chances of that today. And I'm very disappointed that this has occurred. And I'm proud, and I will be proud, when the division bells go at the end of this debate to sit on the no side of this chamber with my friend and colleague Senator Wish Wilson and my colleagues in the Australian Greens, proudly a party that calls for increases in public services, proudly a party 
that says now is no time for these rampant tax breaks, the overwhelming majority of which will flow to the very well off and the super wealthy in this country. Collectively, colleagues, we are making one of the biggest mistakes that I have seen in my 17 years in politics. And believe me, I have seen a few catastrophic stuff-ups by parliaments in my time, but I've rarely, if ever, seen a stuff-up as bad and as damaging to the fabric of our society, the fabric of our community and the Australian people who most need the help of this parliament and this government as the stuff-up that we are about to commit in this parliament. Those senators supporting these tax cuts are making a $158 billion choice to starve future governments of the revenues that they will need to support our most vulnerable people. And I can only agree with Senator Steele John's political analysis. To be frank, I expected nothing better from the LNP. The party of the elites, the party of the big corporates, the party who deliberately designed a social security system to punish vulnerable people, who put in place the robo-debt system that has cost lives in this country, people taking their own lives because the government has falsely accused them of owing a debt that they in fact did not owe. I expected nothing better from the LNP, and I've learned that consistently over my time in politics. But you know what? Like many Australians, I do expect better from the Australian Labor Party. I genuinely do. But I think I'm going to have to reevaluate my expectations in that space. Because they are walking away from vulnerable Australians today. Remember, the ALP didn't even take a policy of raising New Start <coughs> to the recent election. They had a mealy mouthed review that they were actually going to take 18 months to do if they'd formed government. This is, this is yet more confirmation, if anyone needed it, that the neoliberals have an overwhelming majority in this place. That ideology, the neoliberal ideology, the trickle-down ideology, which holds that if you pump up the top end so they can get their new model Porsche or BMW, that that wealth will somehow magically trickle down to the people at the bottom in, f in the face of every piece of evidence you would ever want to see over decades, where we've seen people at the bottom waiting for this trickle-down magic, holding their hands out, waiting for just a drop, just one drop of the trickle-down magic for decades, and they've still got dry hands. Because it's just not trickling down. Trickling down economics does not work. And these tax cuts are a living, breathing embodiment of trickle-down economics. They hold that if you look after the top, the bottom will get looked after. But it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So, Minister, in the short time that I've got left, so I know you were taking advice, and fair enough too, at some stages during my speech. I do ask you to address um, what agreements you have made with Senator Alliance and Senator Lambie. Um, I ask you to table any documents, uh, letters or any other information you might have about those agreements, or at least place on the record what those agreements are. I specifically have interest in any agreement around um, the housing debt that the State of Tasmania owes the Commonwealth and whether there has been any commitment to relieve part or all of that debt as a result of your negotiations with Senator Lambie. And if we don't get that um, from you in your response shortly, 
um, Minister, I put you on notice that I'll be, refer I'll be raising it in uh, the committee stages of this bill. Because while the housing debt to Tasmania's housing debt to the Commonwealth absolutely ought to be abolished, even if that is the deal, that is still a dud deal for Tasmania. Senator Lambie's got three years to leverage her position in this parliament. Three years. Plenty of opportunities. Plenty of opportunities. And she should not have made this deal to do over Tasmanians' public services in the way that she has. So, so despite the mutterings from the Labor Party, I stand by the Australian Greens' commitment to actually play the role of an opposition in this place. Remember, remember when the motion was put earlier today for these bills to be referred off to an inquiry so that we could understand the true costs, that was voted down, not just by the government but by the Australian Labor Party. They don't even want to know the full story here. This is a political decision made by the ALP. It is not a decision in the best interests of the people they purport to represent in this place. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, I thank all senators who have contributed to this uh, debate. Um, the legislation we're dealing with, uh, of course, uh, seeks to implement uh, one of our most central uh, commitments that we made in the election campaign, and that is to provide income tax relief to all working Australians. And uh, we're doing it in a way which prioritises uh, low and middle income earners, but which also seeks to take the bracket uh, creep monkey off people's back. Uh, because if we leave bracket creep uh, unaddressed over time, uh, it will undermine aspiration and it will weaken our economy. And a weaker economy is very, very bad for low and middle income earners in particular wanting to get ahead. And I mean, there's a reason why the low income areas of Australia voted for us very strongly in this election. And that is because aspirational Australians, working families around Australia, actually understand this truth that it is aspiration and hard work that drives their opportunity to get ahead, that drives the opportunity of all Australians uh, to, to, to get ahead. And we're doing this in a way that is fiscally responsible. We are seeking to boost funding for schools and hospitals and infrastructure. Uh, we are seeking to ensure that the budget returns to surplus and remains in surplus uh, all the way through, which is, of course, why we are prioritising uh, tax relief for uh, low- and middle-income earners in the first instance before phasing in more structural reforms over the medium term. If the Senate supports this legislation uh, today, it will mean that by the end of next week, millions of Australians can start to receive up to $1,080 uh, in, in tax refunds in their bank accounts. Now, Senator McKim talks about trickle-down economics. That is not trickle-down economics. That is leaving yeah. working Australians to keep more of yep. their money, the money that they work for. That is, that is actually the government making a decision that we take less money out of people's pockets, exactly. that we take less yeah. money out of the pockets of hard-working Australians. There is nothing trickle-down about this. Now, you know, I mean, look, I, I, understand, I understand some of the ideology around behind, McKim, you heard some of the, behind some of the rhetoric around top end of town. Uh, but, I mean, honestly, Australia does best when everybody is encouraged to be the best they can be. If we hold any Australian back from being the best they can be, we hold every Australian back. And this view that somehow uh, you know, there is this nasty sector, segment in the population called the top end of town, we've just got to move away from. I mean, it is, it is destructive and it, it would weaken our country and our economy if we persist uh, with, with that sort of language and that sort of approach. Look, I mean, it's, it's, been, it's been a long debate during the campaign uh, and also, of course, uh, you know, in, in this chamber today. And let me just address uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, question that, Ms. that Senator McKim raised towards the end. The government is extremely grateful uh, to Senators uh, Lambie, uh, Patrick uh, and Griff, uh, who have joined Senator Bernardi in supporting 
uh, the government's plan for lower income taxes for all working Australians. And we have very much appreciated, and Senator Lambie in particular was very clear in her remarks to the Chamber. She has made the decision to support income tax relief on its own merits, on its own merits. Us has uh, Senator uh, Patrick and Senator Griff made that same point. But the government has also made the point, and we've been quite candid and transparent about this, that of course, as a government, we are absolutely prepared to work uh, with um, crossbench senators in relation to policy issues of concern to them and of concern to their constituents. Of course we'll engage uh, with the crossbench in good faith and work through issues. And let me say, uh, Senator Lambie, who was referenced by, uh, by Senator McKim, is a fierce advocate for uh, Tasmania, has, has provided very strong advocacy around an issue that she's uh, you know, publicly raised yesterday. And the government has agreed that we will work with uh, Senator Lambie through these issues. But I just refer you back, I just refer you back to Senator Lambie's comments. Senator Lambie made a decision, which we appreciate, to support our income tax relief plan on its own merits. Now, in, in relation to Senators um, Patrick and Griff, uh, yes, of course, it's a matter of public record. We've been uh, talking to Centre Alliance about our plans uh, to deliver uh, lower electricity prices and lower gas prices and to boost uh, supply of gas into the domestic uh, market for some weeks. Uh, and yes, I mean, as uh, Senator uh, Patrick rightly uh, expressed in his remarks earlier, uh, you know, he's put a series of uh, ideas and views and propositions to the government on what he thinks and what Senator Lyons thinks uh, could and should be done to achieve our common objective, a common objective of driving electricity prices down further. We haven't reached a final landing point in relation to these matters, but what we have agreed is we have agreed on some uh, on, on some processes to explore these issues further. And that will be done in an open and transparent and public way. Because in the end, you know, we want the right decisions, decisions in the public interest, decisions that will be effective and appropriate uh, in uh, continuing our, our long-standing efforts uh, to drive electricity prices down uh, and to uh, boost the uh, supply of uh, gas into the domestic market. There is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with that. Now, that is not uh, you know, trading of horses, uh, that is not uh, you know, doing special deals, that is engaging in good faith on public policy matters in the public interest on behalf of the Australian people. That is what we're here to do and that is what the government is doing. But let me just say and in closing, uh, the, the government very much appreciates uh, that you know, after having considered these matters carefully, and I appreciate that you know, Senator Lambie um, referenced this in her speech too, she very carefully considered the arguments uh, in relation to the uh, you know, uh, pros and cons of our overall plan, um, and you know, she made a decision which we appreciate to support our plan. Same with Senator Lyons. I mean, that's, you know, we obviously welcome that. But I would say to the Labour Party, as Senator McKim said to the Labour Party, if you don't agree with our plan to deliver income tax relief to all working Australians, given the final stage of our plan does not come into effect until 2024-25, be our guests. Go to the next election arguing to roll those tax cuts back. Just go to the next election making the case that higher income taxes is what the economy needs. Because I've got to tell you, the thing that completely and utterly confused me is that having spent five weeks during the campaign arguing that the economy needed $387 billion in higher taxes, over the last couple of weeks, we've heard the argument that the economy needed lower taxes sooner, even though that would uh, undermine, of course, uh, you know, the uh, return uh, to surplus and maintaining the budget in surplus. So, I mean, the government has got a plan uh, which is economically necessary and fiscally responsible. The government has got a plan which will put more money into workers' pockets from the end of next week. The government has got a plan which will help uh, create more jobs on the back of the economic stimulus created uh, by uh, the uh, income tax relief plan that is before the uh, chamber now. And the government has got a plan to provide, to implement, and the plan before the chamber today, implement structural reform to our tax system that continues to support aspiration, that provides incentive and reward for effort for hardworking Australians so that our, our economy continues to grow and that all Australians, all Australians have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. And the stronger economy, of course, is going to be central to our capacity to continue to provide, sustainably provide 
uh, increased funding for all of the essential services Australians rely on. That is another reason why we need to uh, pass this, uh, this uh, legislation in full. So with those few words, I commend the bill to the Chamber. Thank you, Senator Cormann. The first matter to deal with is to deal with the second reading amendment moved by Senator Gallagher. The first question is that the amendment, second reading amendment moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. 
The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Ciccone, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Dean Smith, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 26, noes 44. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator C, what you had foreshadowed a second reading amendment. Do you want to move that now? Yes, please. I'd like to um, move my second reader amendment um, that at the end of the motion add, but the Senate notes that the bill does nothing to assist people receiving new state allowance or youth allowance and calls upon the government to introduce legislation to amend the Social Security Act of 1991 to increase the maximum single rates of new start allowance and youth allowance by $150 per fortnight. The question is that second reading amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Ciccone, tell her for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 11, noes 57. The matter is resolved in the negative. The question is now that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McGrath, teller for the ayes, and Senator Seawatt, teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 60, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Clark. A bill Order. for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. But, oh, I beg your pardon, Senator McKim. I, I just had a, a question for the minister. Um, minister, in um, your uh, summation speech, uh, you indicated that uh, the commitment that uh, the government had given Senator Lambie was to work through the issue of uh, the Tasmanian uh, government's housing debt to the Commonwealth. Uh, is that the full extent of your commitment to Senator Lambie? Minister. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, well, indeed, we will be working this issue through uh, with Senator Lambie and indeed with the Hodgman government in Tasmania. I mean, these are obviously these are matters that have already been the subject of discussions in recent times uh, between our government and the uh, Hodgman uh, government. Um, you know, as uh, Senator Lambie has indicated, uh, she has uh, made a judgment which we appreciate and, uh, and are grateful for to support uh, our income tax relief uh, package. Um, on its own merits, because she recognises that it's important for the economy and for uh, hard-working Australians, in particular low-income earners, who uh, will, of course, start receiving uh, tax refunds from the end of next week. Uh, in, she has also very strongly and very passionately advocated uh, on behalf of uh, her home state of Tasmania in relation to this issue, uh, and we have agreed that over the next, uh, you know, few weeks and over the next six to eight weeks or thereabouts, we'll work this issue through and uh, we'll make uh, relevant judgments. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Minister. And um, that, that those words confirmed um, and, and reflected the words that you used in, uh, in your closing speech. Uh, but just to be clear, that is the extent of the commitment that you have given to Senator Lambie and there are no further commitments you have given other than your willingness to, quote, work this issue through, unquote. Minister. Well, when we have more to say, because the issue has been properly worked through, we'll make relevant announcements at that time. Senator McKim. I'm happy to stay all night if we need to, um, Minister. So um, I'll just put it again, um, just so that the Senate can be totally clear. Is that the extent of the commitment that you have given to Senator Lambie? In other words, is there any other commitment uh, you have given to her further than the commitment that you are prepared to work this issue through? Minister. Well, I mean, again, I, mean, I can't be any clearer than this. As I've indicated, this also involves a state government, in, you know, and so there are some conversations to be had uh, with uh, the uh, state government in Tasmania. And uh, as we've indicated uh, to Senator Lambie, as she made a very uh, you know, strong and uh, uh, passionate representations in relation to this issue, and I think all the Tasmanians and all Australians would have seen the passion with which Senator Lambie uh, put this issue forward yesterday in her uh, Facebook post. I saw that and I could see uh, the passion. I've indicated to Senator Lambie that we uh, would be prepared to work this issue through, and uh, when all of the uh, issues have been properly considered and on their own merits, uh, we uh, will be making further announcements at the right time, and we will be working in good faith over the next uh, six to eight weeks uh, to uh, work this issue through. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you again, Minister, for, for repeating uh, words you just used. Um, but my, my question is actually very clear. Is there any commitment you've given to Senator Lambie further to the commitment to, quote, work this issue through? Yes or no? Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, like, uh, Madam Chair. I've uh, very clearly articulated the commitment I've given. I'm not in a position to say more at this point in time because there is uh, obviously there are some more discussions to be had, and including with the state government in Tasmania, and uh, that will happen over the next uh, six to eight weeks. Uh, and when we are in a position uh, to uh, make uh, further announcements in relation to these matters, we will. Senator McKean. 
Well, thank you again, uh, Minister, for repeating words um, that you'd already used. Perhaps if I'll just frame uh, my interrogation of you slightly differently, I'll, I'll say to you here very clearly that my understanding from what you've said and the implication in your words is that you have given no further commitment to Senator Lambie other than to work this issue through. If I'm wrong about that in my understanding, I invite you to correct me. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Well, I stand by the comments that I've made. Uh, you know, the government, uh, as we've indicated on a number of occasions now, uh, is always prepared to engage with uh, non-government senators in relation to issues of uh, concern to them and their constituents. On occasion, we've had these sorts of conversations uh, with the Australian Greens. Now, in, in relation to uh, the issue raised with us by uh, Senator uh, Lambie, uh, we uh, have agreed to work this issue through in good faith, uh, and uh, this is incidentally, as Senator Lambie herself indicated, not the reason she decided to uh, back our income tax plan today. I mean, as, well, as, I, as I heard uh, Senator Lambie uh, in giving her speech today, she made a judgment on balance, having considered all of the arguments, to back our income tax plan today on its own merits. Uh, but uh, you know, we will work this issue uh, through. Uh, over the next six to eight weeks. There are obviously uh, you know, some matters to be uh, considered and some matters to be explored with the uh, state government in Tasmania when all of these things have happened. Uh, and if it's consistent, you know, then we will obviously uh, we will, uh, we will make relevant announcements at that point in time. I'm not in a position uh, to tell you any more at this point in time because these processes have not yet taken place. Senator Wish Wilson. Just on the same issue, uh, Acting Deputy President, um, Senator Abetz has been uh, on the public record on the radio at least three times on this issue in the last three weeks. Senator Cormann, did you uh, have a chat to Senator Abetz about this? Did you bring him into the tent on this uh, dodgy deal that you were uh, signing with Senator Lambie? Minister. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, firstly, I reject the premise of the question. I reject the characterisation of what you've just uh, put uh, before, before the Senate. Uh, millions of Australians, millions of Australians tonight are grateful uh, to Senator Lambie for having decided to back in uh, the uh, legislation to deliver lower income taxes for all working Australians that the Australian people voted for, because it will mean uh, up to $1,080 into uh, the yeah. bank accounts uh, of uh, millions of Australians from, next, from the end of next week. Um, and you know, so I, I completely reject the characterisation of what you've said. Uh, have I had conversations with uh, Senator Abetz in relation to these matters? Uh, yes, I have. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, De Deputy President. Uh, I move uh, Green's Amendment uh, 8689, um, and I'm just going to talk to that to talk to that briefly. This Green's Amendment strips the tax cuts from this bill. Uh, it increases the size of the low income tax offset, the LITO, from the current $445 level beyond the $700 level proposed by the government to $1,080. The amendment also brings about this increase to LITO immediately, rather than in 2022 as proposed by the government. The net result is that people earning anything up to $37,000 per annum would immediately and permanently be $115 better off under the Greens amendment. Wage earners uh, well, people earning a wage anything up to $67,000, uh, which is the current cap or very close to the current cap for the LITO, no, uh, would also receive an immediate and permanent increased tax offset under our amendment. The benefit of the Greens proposal, as opposed to this government's tax cuts, is that it puts more money into the pockets of those wage earners who would most benefit and who most need it. It wouldn't be providing nearly half the value of the entire package to the most wealthy Australians. For the hardheads in this chamber and any out there who may be listening to this debate who have no sympathy for those who are truly struggling in this country, this is not just about the personal welfare of those who would receive an extra benefit. People with less money, it's an accepted fact, people with less money who are, who are battlers and are doing it tough tend to spend any extra money they're given. And economists call this a marginal propensity to consume. They have a higher 
marginal propensity to consume, which of course makes intuitive sense because they don't have a lot of money uh, and they have many things indeed they need to spend that money on. Versus wealthy individuals who do have money, who are wealthy with high wealth functions, they tend to save money and of course put those funds into investments such as their second, third or fourth investment house. So a bigger tax offset for lower income earners is better for the economy than a tax cut for millionaires. Just to remind the chamber, 50 per cent of the benefit, the value of these tax cuts, will go to the top 20 per cent of Australian income earners. How is that fair? How is that fair? It totally guts the progressive tax system and the fundamental principle of fairness that those who earn more, such as every one of us in this chamber, those who earn more pay more. That's what this country was set up on the back of. That's how we funded our social safety net, our infrastructure and our nation for nearly 100 years. Uh, the Greens believe this is the best way to use the personal income tax system to stimulate the economy and look after those battlers and the most vulnerable in this country. It's the best way to tackle inequality and I urge the chamber to support our amendment. So just before I give you the call, Ministers, just so that we're clear, Senator Wish Wilson, you're moving only number one on sheet eight six eight nine. I I'll, I'll move them together. So, um, all right. So, you're seeking leave to move uh, number one and number two on sheet eight six eight nine. Correct. Okay. Thank Deputy you. Deputy President. I'm assuming leave is granted. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. The government will oppose uh, these amendments. Uh, you know, uh, under our plan, once fully implemented, uh, those who earn uh, more will continue to pay uh, more. Uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, at the end of uh, the seven-year phasing period of our income tax relief plan by 24-25, uh, the top 1 per cent of income earners will pay slightly more as, you know, in terms of the proportion of overall income tax revenue generated. The top 5 per cent uh, you know, will uh, pay about the same. Uh, uh, the top 20 per cent will continue to pay about 60 per cent of all income tax generated. They're paying about 60 per cent of all income tax generated now. They'll pay about 60 per cent of all income tax generated in 2024-25. If we don't do this, essentially bracket creep, uh, we'll push more and more middle income earners into the higher tax brackets, leaving them worse off. Uh, that is what you call uh, you know, a bracket creep, which is a drag on the economy, which weakens the economy over time, uh, which is uh, essentially what undermines aspiration if left unaddressed. That is why uh, we need to ensure that this legislation is passed in full. So I'm going to put um, those separately. So I'll put uh, number one on uh, sheet 8689 that that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. No. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring, ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So we're dealing with um, Amendment 1 on sheet 8689, and at the conclusion of this count, we will deal with Schedule 2. Uh, so, um, so the question is that the amendment be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chairs, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seward for the ayes and Senator Urquhart for the noes. Senator Canavan, no, Sen Senator Canavan, could you sit back? We just can't see the can't count. See. Thanks. Okay. So it's um, ready. There being nine ayes and 57 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. So the question is that uh, Schedule 2 on sheet 8689 be agreed that as stand as printed. Um, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Um, are you seeking? Oh. Senator. Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President, or are you, are you chair of committees at the moment? Um, I seek leave to move amendments one and two on sheet 8684 together. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. 
Uh, thank you very much. I thank the Senate. Uh, this amendment seeks to bring forward uh, one element of stage two of the government's tax package. I have spoken in the second reading speech um, about this, but in, in briefly, uh, it recognises that the economy needs a boost now. Um, so it's, it supports stage one of the tax cuts. It ensures that it, there is a tax cut for every worker. Um, just, just a moment, Senator Gallo. If you're not participating in the debate in the Committee of the Whole, could you please leave the chamber? And um, if you can keep the noise down, thank you. Thanks, Senator Gallagher. It ensures that there is a tax cut for every worker in this parliamentary term, and it is responsible in the sense that, yes, it will cost uh, more in the short term. Um, we are aware the government is forecasting a surplus of uh, just over seven billion dollars, uh, bringing forward the and um, bringing forward the uh, lifting of the tax bracket from 90 to 120 thousand. This financial year would have uh, a budget impact in the order of 3.6 billion dollars, uh, but it would cer certainly, based on the current projections of the government and the Treasury, ensure that there was a surplus maintained. So it is being responsible. It ensures that there is a tax cut for every worker in this parliamentary term, which at the moment, if this amendment doesn't get up, we will only see um, those on low and middle income. Uh, on low and middle income earners through the tax offset getting an actual tax cut. The rest of working uh, people in Australia will have to wait till 2022 for this change, 2022-23, to come into effect uh, and, of course, then uh, longer for those um, outside stage two. So we would urge those who do care about the economy, who do recognise that the economy needs uh, stimulus now that this amendment would uh, assist on that front and it would ensure there is a tax cut for every worker. And for those that aren't going to support this, they will be voting against a tax cut for every worker in Australia if they do not support this amendment by the opposition. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. The government will be opposing this amendment for the reasons that I've extensively canvassed in the uh, second reading speech. Our plan uh, provides income tax relief to all working Australians, but in a way that is fiscally responsible. Our plan is economically necessary and fiscally responsible. Uh, the Labor Party went to the election arguing for higher taxes as the pathway to a stronger economy, and now is saying that they've rediscovered uh, the virtue of uh, lower taxes sooner by more. Uh, it just doesn't uh, hang together. Our plan is uh, economically and fiscally responsible, and we will be opposing this amendment. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, De Deputy President. Uh, as the Greens just uh, flagged in here, uh, we do want to see an increase in the low income tax offset uh, for genuine low income uh, workers in this country. Uh, stage two uh, does increase the maximum low income tax offset from $645 to $700, but what it mostly does, what it mostly does, uh, is convert the low middle income tax offset, the LOMITO, into a tax cut by increasing the upper threshold of the 19 per cent tax bracket. So this locks in tax cuts for all Australians, including the most wealthy Australians. The Greens have been very clear uh, in the last parliament when the last tax package uh, was implemented, and we've been consistent and clear again that we support increasing the low income uh, tax offset but we do not support changing the tax thresholds. That will give a tax cut that will mostly benefit, substantially benefit, uh, the most wealthy Australians. I also want to make this very clear to anyone listening to this debate. This stage two of the government's plan, uh, as legislated in this bill, gives a full benefit of the Lamito to everyone earning over $90,000 in Australia. And if you think, uh, if you think that's not high income earners in Australia, up to 180,000, 200,000, 300,000 millionaires, then I think you've got rocks in your head. Stage two destroys the progressive nature of the low middle income tax offset. So Labor, with this amendment 
not only supports giving everyone in this country over $90,000, in other words, high income earners, including those earning a million dollars or $200,000, an extra $540 each year, on top of the extra $540 that they've already been given, but they want to give this tax cut away quicker by bringing it forward. So, in Labor's book, reading from this amendment, the government is, is not giving tax cuts to the top 10 per cent of Australians or the top 20 per cent of Australians quick enough they want it brought forward. The Greens will not support an assault on the progressive tax system in this country. That's why we've made it very clear tonight we'll support giving more money to low-income uh, Australians who are working hard and, and battling, but we will not change the system and make it regressive. So the question is that um, Schedule 1 and 2 on Sheet 8 I beg your pardon, amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 8684 uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. So. I'll put it again. I only heard actually from your side one voice. Yeah, well, um, I'll put it again. So, uh, amendments one and two on sheet 8684 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that amendments one and two on sheet 8684 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Smith as uh, teller for the noes. Sorry. Twenty-two. Order. There being twenty-two ayes and forty-three noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Oh, thank you. Sorry, everyone. Um, thank you. I seek. Do I need leave for this one? Yeah, I seek leave to move amendments on sheet eight six eight seven, um, standing my name. So you're seeking leave together. to move them together? Yes. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, thank you very much. I thank the Senate. Now, this uh, this amendment essentially carves out stage three um, from the government's tax package. I spoke at length in the uh, second reading speech about this. Um, we think it's frankly it's irresponsible to ask the Senate, <clears throat> the Parliament, to sign up now, five years ahead uh, from the date of effect, uh, without having any idea what state the budget or the economy will be in at that time. The amount of money that the government is seeking to allocate to this element of the tax package is $95 billion over the medium term. We've got five years till they come into effect, and uh, as we've said and consistently said in both houses, we think it's irresponsible to uh, sign up to that element of the tax package. We had, uh, in an effort to cooperate and conciliate an outcome that was in the interests of all Australians, which was to facilitate uh, the tax cuts uh, flowing as soon as possible to the, through the um, Lamito. We had asked the government to consider taking out stage three from this package. The government arrogantly refused to even consider it. We have attempted to convince the crossbench, um, as, it, as we now know, the, we have been unable to convince uh, the crossbench of the merits of this approach. But we do remain 
extremely concerned about the effect of signing up to this sort of expenditure um, five years out and as that expenditure grows over the median term to 29-30, uh, that the budget will be forced to find $19 billion that's currently unaccounted for um, and the effect that that will have in terms of savings required, uh, the cuts to government programs that will be required to fund that element of the tax package. The government has consistently failed to answer how they will be funded. We know the economic parameters or the fiscal parameters they have put in their um, pre-election budget um, outlook, which had growth in government spending extremely low for, on historical terms at 1.3 per cent. We know they're forecasting bigger surpluses, uh, and we can't see and greater expenditure in terms of tax cuts, plus a limit on uh, a tax cap uh, put in the budget. So when you're capping your tax growth, you're capping you're, you're reducing your government uh, expenditure growth to 1.3 per cent, you're forecasting bigger surpluses and you're having to fund $19 billion. We don't get how that adds up, and the government has failed at every opportunity to explain exactly how that will be done. So um, We are putting this amendment. We believe it's important. Uh, we, uh, we wish the government had agreed with us to take this stage out and bring it back as a separate package. Uh, but we strongly believe that this, is, this amendment delivers the right outcome, which would be not to require the parliament to sign up to um, tax cuts that have no explanation about how they're being afforded, that don't come in for five years' time uh, and that um, have no impact this parliamentary term. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Firstly, the government will oppose these amendments. I make, in, in doing so, I make the point that there is nothing arrogant about keeping faith uh, with the verdict of the Australian people at the most recent election. There's nothing arrogant about uh, acting and delivering uh, on the promises uh, that we made as a government lead up to the election. That is what the Australian people expect us to do. Uh, this was a central part of the argument. This was a central part of the policy contest in the lead up to the last election. Uh, we were absolutely explicitly arguing for the need to have income tax relief for all working Australians, not to turn Australian against Australian, not to pursue the politics of envy, but to pursue income tax relief for all working Australians, prioritising low and middle income earners, but also providing a structural reform to take the bracket creep monkey off uh, all working Australians for the right inset to ensure that we continue to support aspiration. Uh, because if, if bracket creep remains unaddressed, it weakens the economy over time. Now, in relation to the argument that this doesn't come into effect until 2024 20, 25, as Senator Lambie quite rightly pointed out, uh, Australians actually want to see long term vision. They, want, they don't want governments to just look over the next three years. And what we've done is we've phased in a comprehensive plan for income tax relief in a way that is uh, fiscally responsible as well as economically necessary. And as I've said previously, if the Labor Party is so committed to rolling it back, if the Labor Party is so committed to increasing taxes in the future, given that there is another election, as they observe, they can take a policy to the next election seeking to persuade the Australian people to increase uh, income taxes again. I reject the assertions that were made about you know, that this supposedly is not funded. Uh, the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook is released independently by the secretaries of Treasury and Finance, not by the government. It, not by the government. Not by the, well, that is completely false. That is completely and utterly false. What the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook shows is that after we have accommodated the increased expenditure, the record funding for hospitals, schools, infrastructure, and all of the other essential services Australians rely on, after we've accommodated all of that increased expenditure over the medium term, after we've accommodated the cost of our phased in income tax relief plan. Our budget uh, is in surplus from 2019-20 onwards. It remains in surplus all the way over the forward estimates and over the medium term. And that is what you call having paid for the cost of your policy decisions. I mean, that is what the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook independently certified. But like the final point, the final point is, this amendment is the Labor Party persisting uh, with a pre-election argument that was absolutely emphatically rejected by the Australian people. The Australian people voted in favour of income tax relief for all working Australians. They voted against Labor's high-taxing politics of envy agenda, and that is why, in keeping faith with the verdict of the Australian people, we will vote against this amendment. Senator Wong. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Chair. I rise to uh, speak on. Oh, sorry, Chair. <laughs> 
I rise to speak on this amendment, and I want to make a few comments so people might have wish to. Those who don't wish to stay, feel free not to stay. Um, <laughs> because I'm sure Senator Cormann will stay and he'll be very pleased to listen to what I have to say about why stage three is a problem. So we've outlined both here and the other state uh, place Labor's position on these tax bills, which has been framed by three principles. The Australian economy needs help now, not in three or five years' term, five years time. Every worker needs a tax cut this term, not in three or five years' time, and that it is irresponsible to sign up to $95 billion worth of expenditure in 2024-25 without knowing how the budget will look then. Labor's highest priority has been to get tap money into the hands of workers and circulating through a, a weak economy. The reality is, under this government, under this government, the economy has deteriorated markedly, even since the last election. You know what the government's priority has been? A $95 billion, $95 billion worth of tax cuts in five years that they don't want to say how they'll pay for, that they won't say what they'll, how they'll pay for it. Now, I just want to return to this issue of where the economy is, because it is relevant to the decisions that Labor has taken and the, uh, uh, the decisions that we have outlined and the principled economic position we have taken. The, frankly, the Australian economy needs a boost now, not in 2022 or in 2025. Now, lesser authority than the RBA has made it clear that the two, with two interest rate cuts in two months to the lowest official cash rate in our history, we're at 1 per cent. GFC, global financial crisis, what was it 3.25? So less than a third. We've got the slowest economic growth in a decade. This is from the great economic managers of the coalition. Slowest economic growth in a decade, the longest per capita recession since the 82 recession, wages barely moving, new car sales have dried up, building approvals have plummeted, retail sales barely moving, and ANZ job vacancies down for the first time in three years. What a great economic management. And that's why we were prepared to support stages one and two. But what we're actually arguing about here is stage three, what happens in five years' time. And we think it is irresponsible to sign up to $95 billion worth of expenditure from the budget now, five years before they start, with absolutely no means to pay for them. $95 billion over six years, $12.5 billion per annum in 2024-25, which grows to nearly $19 billion per annum by 2930. You know, in the first year of these tax cuts that the crossbench have signed up for, apart from Senator Hanson and uh, Senator Roberts, the first year alone is more than what the government will spend on government schools. Which $8.3 billion more than the government spends on universities or the childcare subsidy. And the amount that this, these tax cuts cost in 2930 is today close to the entire Commonwealth spend on public hospitals. These are massive numbers with far reaching, reaching consequences for health, for education, but actually for the sort of society we want for Australia. And we have absolutely no way, and the government has no way of forecasting in 2019 how it can play for $95 billion worth of tax cuts in 2024-25. And the reality is the government is actually locking in tax cuts without identifying the spending cuts which are required to fund them. That's the hard reality. They're locking in tax cuts without identifying the spending cuts uh, which they uh, will have to, have to identify in order to pay for them. Now, the government talks a lot about mandate. Well, I'll tell you what it has absolutely no mandate for. It has no mandate for spending cuts to pay for these income tax cuts because they won't tell Australians what they are. In fact, they're denying that they exist. They're denying that they exist. The Treasurer said in his budget speech, uh, the Treasurer said during the election uh, that uh, uh, he made clear that there were no spending cuts. Uh, when the Grattan Institute pointed out that there were 40, it was 40, uh, $40 billion a year in terms of the gap between the government's tax promises and its spending promises, the Labor states 
and Territory, State and Treasury tre Treasurers demanded that the Treasurer guarantee no further funding cuts to hospital, schools, infrastructure and other essential services. Well, Mr Frydenberg blithely dismissed their concerns. He wrote to them. He said, PFO, make sure it's all clear and that there are no spending cuts. Well, you know what? Their budget assumes spending cuts. Their budget assumes spending cuts. The assumptions are that government spending will magically fall from 24.6 per cent of GDP to this year to 23.6 per cent. And under your government, under your government, government spending has actually averaged at 25 per cent of GDP over the last five years. So you actually have to reduce. Oh, it's all grow the economy. You're doing really well on that front, mate. You're doing really well on that front. Where is growth? Where are interest rates? This is his answer. We're just going to grow the economy and then we'll reduce how much government is spending because the pie is bigger. Yeah, I've heard that before. Uh, we've heard that before. Magically, the pie becomes bigger. 23.6 months. You've locked in spending cuts in your budget, and the only way you can avoid that conclusion is, is the interjection you just made, Senator Cormann, is that the economy is going to be bigger. Well, that's going really well on your watch at the moment. You've got an ailing economy. In fact, the Grattan Institute has calculated in order to get to these projected spending levels, real spending growth would need to average about 1.3 per cent per annum over the decade, 1.8 per cent uh, the, uh, if the economy performs better. Either way, this is substantially lower than any previous government has achieved. Substantially lower than any government has achieved. So what this government is locking in is, in fact, a, uh, in real terms, a fall in spending on things like dental health, tertiary education, family payments, social housing, potentially defence, veterans. But they won't tell us where it is. Let's just talk about health for a minute. Health expenditure grows faster than the economy. Uh, and ha health expenditure grows faster than inflation. Uh, and whilst it's not as high as it was in you know, sort of five or ten years ago, it's still, I think, on the last, in the last year was at 4.5 per cent per annum. According to these budget figures, guess what health expenditure grows at? 0.7 per cent. So currently growing at 4.5 per cent, you're going to make sure it grows at 0.7 per cent as the population ages and more health expenditure is required. And you say that isn't going to require cuts to public hospitals or cuts to Medicare? Of course it will. It's, it is the inexorable logic of numbers. 4.5 per cent declining to 0.7 per cent at the same time the population ages. There is only one way you fund that, is that, and that is through expenditure cuts. When was the last time anybody's private health insurance bill only, only increased by 0.7 per cent? This government is locking in with this stage three and refusing to be upfront about it, cuts to health, cuts to education, cuts across the board, and you have a mandate for none of it. You have a mandate for none of it. So I, I commend this uh, amendment to the chamber. Uh, I am, uh, it is disappointing that Senators Patrick and Griff and Senator Lambie uh, have fallen for the hostage trick, where a government is holding tax cuts today, which everybody, I think, in this chamber agrees with, hostage to what is actually an ideological argument about what happens in five years' time. But there is an opportunity for the chamber to uh, require the government of the day to actually be upfront about how they're going to pay for their tax cuts rather than locking in a permanent reduction uh, in government expenditure, a permanent reduction in health expenditure as a consequence uh, in five years' time as a consequence of this tax cut. Minister. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I can't uh, leave uh, these uh, statements unanswered. Uh, the uh, 2019 P4, independently released by the Secretaries of Treasury and Finance, completely destroys any claims about supposed hidden spending cuts uh, in our budget. Uh, they are ridiculous claims, and they've been exposed as just another lie during the campaign. There are no assumed, undisclosed future spending cuts in the government's medium-term projections. In contrast, though, when LIBOR was last in government, what did LIBOR do? 
they, they assumed that the spending growth would be able to be uh, contained to 2% in real terms year on year. Indeed, the 2013 P4 exposed that Leibard biked secret undisclosed, in fact, then undecided future spending cuts into their medium-term projections in their 2013-14 budget. The 2013 P4 reported that real payments growth was expected to average 3.5% per year over the medium term, which was ignored by the then Labour government. They ignored that fiscal reality in front of them. Instead of doing the hard yards on savings decisions, their spending projections were artificially based on an imposed forecasting assumption that real spending growth would be kept below 2% on average per year until the budget was in surplus of 1% as a share of GDP. Neither Labour strike record of actual real spending growth of 4% on average per year during their time in office, nor their own underlying spending growth projections of 3.5% beyond, the then, um, beyond the then forward estimates Order. supported that forecasting Order. assumption of 2%. Imposing that 2% cap on real expenditure growth on their medium-term uh, expenditure projections, irrespective of what was actually expected to happen at the time, effectively locked in $175 billion of secret, undisclosed, in fact, then undecided future spending cuts over that uh, medium-term period into their budget. Now, uh, under, in our budget, I say it again, uh, the uh, Secretaries of Finance and Treasury made very clear that there are no assumed uh, future uh, spending cuts uh, in uh, our medium-term projections. The medium-term projections are based uh, on an assumption of no policy change. No policy change. That includes an assumption of no policy change to reduce expenditure. Senator Wong. Well, I can't let that pass either. You're still, you're still not being upfront, are you? Your current government spending under you is around 25 per cent of GDP. It's currently 24.6 per cent, I think 25 per cent on average over the last number of years. You're projecting it will fall to 23.6 per cent of GDP. And your only answer to that is, oh, we're going to grow the economy. Where are the cut? Where, where, oh, right. Okay. So the economy is going to grow when interest rates are one percent, and growth, growth is where it is. You, you're, you're presiding over a struggling economy. That is the reality, and that is why we are prepared to support the tax cuts in stage one and stage two. Your answer on stage three is, oh, the economy will, will be bigger. You are forecasting a reduction in government spending as a proportion of the economy, and you won't tell Australians where that's coming from. Senator Wish Wilson. It's good to see some debate between uh, the opposition and the government, uh, their deputy president. So late in proceedings, but it is it is good to see. Um, the Greens don't support stage two of these tax cuts for the simple reason that they gut the progressive tax system. We certainly won't be, keep, keep keep it up. It's good to hear. We certainly won't be supporting stage three that reduces the uh, tax bracket from 32.5 per cent down to 30 per cent. A $95 billion effective tax cut for mostly wealthy Australians. Um, Senator Cormann's right about one thing tonight in his uh, his exchange with Senator Wong that I think we should all be we should all be very conscious of, and that is uh, if Labor oppose these stage three tax cuts here today in the Senate, will they take this to the next election? Will they commit? To repealing stage three, if they get elected to government in Australia, I think that would be transparency. That would be fair. Will you commit? Will you commit? Will you commit to repealing stage three Order. if you get elected to government? Order. That would be. That's what I would like to know, and I think that's what a lot of your voters Order. and a lot of your supporters would like to know. Will you go to the next election with a commitment to repeal? Stage three of these tax cuts. It's fine to put up an amendment in here. You know is going to go down, uh, but nevertheless, I suspect very soon you're going to be supporting the entire tax package. Um, I do want to point out uh, that stage three, a 90 billion dollar tax cut, five years down the track. Five years down the track. Why are we voting on that here tonight? Uh, We've all spoken about uh, the headwinds the economy's sailing into at the moment. No one's denying that. Five years in any, any economic cycle is way beyond anyone's predictive capacity to get right. There's considerable uncertainty trying to forecast even five months out, let alone five years out. Don't forget the political imperative of this legislation. Don't forget that this legislation was brought in by the coalition just weeks before the election. This was a budget election. This is budget 
legislation. It is a in political imperative to get this passed tonight for the coalition. Why five years out? That's a really good question to ask. Um, the only conclusion that I can come to, especially considering the risks, especially considering it's been pointed out by numerous experts, the impost on any future government of having to find $158 billion in difficult times. There's been no detail as to where that money is going to come from. The government's still sticking to this magic pudding economics that it's going to have surpluses at the same time it has to find $158 billion in expenditure. The only reason, in my opinion, the government's locking this in now is for its base. It's locking this in now so that its base, the Liberal National Party voters, know they're going to get their tax cuts in five years and they want the Labor Party to run the gauntlet and step up and say whether they will or won't oppose these tax cuts. I dare you. That's what this is. This is the government clearly saying to its base, we'll legislate this, and it would be a very brave opposition, a very brave opposition that would repeal tax cuts once they've been legislated. This is all about securing the votes of your base, making sure you don't lose any votes to the Labor Party in the future. That's what this is about. There is no economic rationale to committing this country to $90 billion of tax cuts that predominantly flow to high-income earners in five years' time. The Grattan Institute, as I mentioned in my second reader today, said it's extraordinary. Indeed, it's unprecedented. So we will be uh, supporting this amendment of the Labor Party tonight to knock out stage three, and we urge the Labor Party to vote against the entire package. So the question is that uh, amendments one and two on sheet uh, uh, that items two and four, beg your pardon, on schedule two stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. The ayes have it. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. Order. So the question is that items two and four of schedule two stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator Urker as teller for the noes. Order. There being 34 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, Labor has uh, moved a number of amendments tonight to reflect the position that we've taken on uh, this tax bill. Um, those amendments, unfortunately, have not won the support of this chamber, uh, despite the fact that they are all responsible and sensible changes uh, to ensure that the economy gets a boost now, every Australian worker gets a tax cut, but that this chamber and the parliament isn't asked to uh, support $95 billion worth of expenditure in five years' time without knowing what the budget or the economy will look like at that time. However, our priority through the debate has always been to get more money into the hands of more workers sooner uh, and to boost the economy, which is certainly struggling under this Liberal government. We took bigger, fairer tax cuts to the election for people on low and middle incomes. And after the election, we proposed amendments which were all about passing the first two stages, bringing forward parts of stage two, but removing stage three from the bill. We fought hard for these amendments. We fought hard for these amendments in the House, and we have fought hard for them in the Senate. We have lobbied the government and we have lobbied the crossbench, but ultimately we have not won the support for these amendments to pass uh, tonight. Today, this afternoon, for the second time, uh, the government voted against their own tax cuts being delivered sooner. And by doing so, they have refused a tax cut for every worker in Australia this parliamentary term. They have said, we don't care about you. We want you to wait three years, five years down the track. When it became impossible to get everything we wanted, we did have to prioritise what matters most. We wanted to make sure that Australians re receive their tax cut now and that those benefits that will come from the first stage start flowing through the economy and that they aren't further delayed. Of course, the first promise broken by this government was that these tax cuts would be in place by July 1, uh, but we believe they shouldn't be delayed any further. Now, the government's highest priority was to commit $95 billion tax cut in five years' time without revealing what they will cut to pay for it or knowing what the budget and economy will look like at that point. And we had 
the finance minister accept that they are reducing government spending uh, in the medium term? Uh, that's right. As a share of the economy, because the pie is growing, but the government spending, as a proportion of that, is declining. And we know what that means. That means smaller governments, smaller services, less money going into key services like health, like uh, aged care, like childcare, like education, like veterans' health. Uh, all of these issues, all of these important areas of government expenditure, will be under attack by this government. Make no doubt about it. We have argued that it is irresponsible to commit to stage three five years out, that remains our view. But ultimately, we have not won that debate tonight and we have not been able to defer uh, stage three uh, from this bill. We will review stage three closer to the next election and, of course, like every political party in this place, propose our own policies which will take into account the economic and budget conditions at that time. But we will not put us in the position that uh, uh, the Greens are in, and that we've ha been under consistent attack uh, from them uh, this afternoon. We will not refuse tax cuts to those on low and middle income Australians just because we have failed to get our amendments up today. We think that would be irresponsible. We think it would be irresponsible in the short term. It's not what the econo economy needs. Uh, and we have to accept that stage one needs to get through. We failed in asking the government to defer stage three. When they failed to do it, we moved amendments to do it. When that amendment didn't get up, we are left with a decision about what to do. And our decision has been that we need to allow those tax cuts that are due in this parliamentary term to flow to those that need it the most. We cannot stand in the way of those, and we will not and that means we will support the passage of this bill tonight. Uh, Senator Di Natale. Dark day in Australian politics. What a dark, dark day in Australian politics. You know, tonight there are people deciding whether they're going to pay the rent or put food on the table. There are parents tonight who are deciding whether they can afford to buy school books for their kids or send their kids to school camp. There are people deciding whether they can afford to pay for medicines or fix up their car. And today the Liberal Party has decided to give $90 billion to politicians, to millionaires, to CEOs and to bankers. That's what's happened today. The Liberal Party call themselves a party of responsible economic management. There is nothing responsible about ripping $90 billion from our budget and lining the pockets of the wealthiest Australians. You call yourself responsible economic managers and you say this won't impact on services. Well, what crap! What utter crap! $90 billion, money uh, that should be spent on Senator new Senator Di Natale, Senator Di Natale uh, you've used some parliamentary well, language. Well, what rubbish, what utter uh, rubbish, Senator Di Natale, what nonsense, what bunker. Senator Di Natale, please resume your seat. I hadn't finished. I'm asking you to withdraw that unparliamentary language, please. I withdraw crap and replace it with uh, rubbish, Senator with Di Natale, nonsense. please resume your seat. I think on many occasions I've requested that senators not repeat the unparliamentary language as you just did. So please just withdraw and continue. I'll withdraw. Thank it's you. It's utter nonsense. It's rubbish. It's garbage. It is an untruth. You cannot take $90 billion from the budget and not have an impact on services, on our schools, on our hospitals, on New Start on all of the things that we know are the foundations of a decent society. You call yourself responsible economic managers. You're not. You're just continuing on the failed trickle-down economics that has led us to this mess, that has entrenched economic inequality in this country. And the Labor Party rightly campaigned against economic inequality in the last election. They showed some courage. They, they recognised that the tax system was a powerful tool to ensure that the rich don't keep getting richer and the poor get screwed. They made sure in that election campaign they offered a choice, and it was the right choice. And what are you doing today? 
your first real test. You're capitulating. You're caving in. You're basically saying we're waving the white flag because we aren't going to take it up to you. What a disgrace. What a disgrace. The Labor Party, who for 100 years has supported progressive taxation, are now saying we are with the neoliberals. We are with the Tories. We are with a party that wants to take Australia down the path of Trump's America. Well, show some courage. Toughen up. Be in opposition. Take the fight up to them. There are so many Australians in this country who are crying out for leadership, and you've caved. You've crumbled. You've given in at the first sign of pressure. People held high hopes for Anthony Albanese, and if this is a sign of where the modern Labor Party are going, well, frankly, we're stuffed. It is the Greens today, almost single-handedly, who have shown ourselves to be the real opposition in this parliament, and we will fight at the next election to make sure these tax cuts are repealed. And we call on you to join us, to work with us, to make sure that the tax system is used to address inequality, not entrench it, not continue the divide that exists in Australia, where if you've got the means, we'll look after you, and if you haven't, well, tough luck. That's not the Australia I know. It's not the Australia I believe in. It's not the Australia that I think most Australians want for themselves and for their children. And make no mistake, we will unequivocally put the spotlight on you to make sure you repeal this vile piece of legislation at the next election. So the question is that the bill. Sorry, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is to Senator Cormann, but before doing so, before putting that question, I must say how appalled I am at that outburst from Senator Di Natale, because there is nothing, nothing more regressive than the imposts on energy that the Greens Party has put on the poor in this country. Nothing more regressive. Senator Cormann, I express my appreciation to you for uh, the advice from Treasury, making the staff available. They were very helpful. One of the questions I put to them was that uh, could they explain the impact where the money would go in the economy, and they said to me they couldn't. So I would like to know how the Treasury has modelled the impact of these tax cuts in terms of economic growth. Senator Cormann. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, well, uh, Chair. Firstly, uh, it's, what we've got to remember is that this is not the government's money, it's the people's money. And the government uh, is, through this legislation, we are asking the Senate to support uh, our legislation, which would help ensure that uh, working Australians, uh, on the terms as outlined in the bill, will get to keep more of their own money. You ask where in the economy that money will go, well it will go where individual Australians decide to spend it. And, and of course the uh, income tax relief prioritises low and middle income earners in the first instance, uh, which will help them deal with cost of living pressures. It will help them deal with cost of living pressures. And then, after, and then of course over, over a period we're phasing in further reforms uh, which are designed to ensure that bracket creep does not continue to run rampant, uh, unabated. Like, if we, if we don't take the bracket creep monkey off people's back, if we don't address bracket creep, uh, more and more middle income earners will be pushed into the higher income uh, tax brackets. Uh, that undermines aspiration and over time weakens the economy. I mean, that is, uh, if, we, if we did nothing, hardworking Australians would actually go backwards because middle income earners would be pushed into higher income tax brackets. I mean, that has been the core part of this debate. Uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, individual Australians, we believe, we trust individual Australians to make the judgment where they, should, where, where they uh, want to spend their money, where they best uh, spend their money on their personal priorities and the pro priorities of their families. Senator Roberts. Uh, Chair, through you, a question to Senator Cormann. You haven't identified where the money will be spent. Will it be spent on imports? Will it be spent on domestic products? Will it be spent on disposable income or will it be spent on essentials? And that's what we need to know to, the, to assess the impact on the economy. So that's what I was after. Senator Cormann. Well, and, and I've answered that as best I can by saying that that comes down to the choices of individual Australians, uh, of uh, individual Australians in terms of where, where they want to spend 
their money. Uh, I mean, it is not the government uh, is not sort of having some does not have some sort of process uh, where we prescribe where people can spend their own money. What we're saying here is that we are making a decision as a parliament uh, to leave people with more of their own money, more of their own money, and they can spend it on their priorities, on their individual priorities, on the priorities of their families, uh, how they want to spend it. Senator Roberts. I accept that uh, through you, Chair. I accept that, Senator Cormann. We are in favour of individuals keeping more of their money rather than having the government dictate how it's spent. But you're now releasing some of that money and you're saying you don't know where it will be spent. So how can you assess the impact on the economic growth? You, you can say that individuals will get more money. We, we can see that. But will they spend it on imports? Will they spend it on exports? And until you answer that question accurately, you don't know the impact on economic growth. Senator Cormann. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. What we do know is uh, that, uh, you know, as, as is projected, $158 billion in uh, money that people will no longer have to hand over to the government uh, will be spent in the economy. Will be spent in the economy uh, by uh, working families around Australia, and that will, uh, you know, obviously, be because of the way the package is designed, it will provide uh, much-needed uh, cost of living pressure relief for, uh, to low- and middle-income earners in the first instance. But it will also ensure uh, that all working Australians continue to have the right incentive and reward for effort, uh, which uh, will help uh, us ensure that the economy remains strong and indeed grows stronger into the future. Senator Roberts, through you, Chair, again. Uh, I'm not going to ask the question again because I've just learned three different ways of saying the same thing, which means nothing. Senator Cormann, I remind you of a question that I put to you informally just next door here, and not long after I joined the Senate in 2016. I said, when will we ever face real tax reform in this country? And you said, no, it's too difficult. So I accept the comments about bracket creep. But why don't we get rid of bracket creep altogether? Would you be willing to explore that at some time? Senator uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. This is real tax reform, and I commend it to the Senate. Mm -hmm. So the question is that the bill stand as printed. Does that opinion say aye? aye yes. To the contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Does that opinion say aye? aye. To the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Thank you. The committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment tax relief so working Australians keep more of their money bill 2019 and agreed to it without amendments. I call the Minister. Uh, Mr President, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The eyes have it. Minister. I move that this uh, bill be now read a third time. The question is the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells. Burma. I thought you'd find this funny.
Lock the doors. The question is the bill will be read a third time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes. Senator Seawitt, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 56, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. <laughs> Senators, oh, I'll call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Senators, pursuant to order agreed to earlier today, the Senate will now adjourn without debate. The Senate will meet again on Monday, the 22nd of July.